Good morning. I declare open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will begin its examination of the budget estimates for 2021-2022 for the parliamentary departments, the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio, the finance portfolio and the cross-portfolio Indigenous matters. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the budget estimates 2021-2022 hearings are conducted in a COVID-safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. The committee has before it a program listing agencies and outcomes relating to matters for which senators have given notice. The committee's proceedings today will begin with the parliamentary departments, followed by agencies of the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio as listed on today's program. Tomorrow, the committee will examine the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. On Wednesday and Thursday, the committee will examine the department and agencies of the finance portfolio. Finally, the committee will examine the National Indigenous Australians Agency, other Indigenous agencies and the Department of Health on Friday at the Cross Portfolio Indigenous Matters hearing. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. The committee would appreciate if senators could please provide any written questions on notice to the Secretariat by Friday the 25th of June 2021. However, reminds all senators as well as departments and agencies that written questions on notice can be provided at any time prior to the tabling of the budget estimates report on the 13th of July. The committee has fixed Friday the 16th of July 2021 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. Privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009 specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a department or of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone and other devices or turn them to silent. Officers are requested to keep opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into Hansard. Finally, the committee has allowed, agreed to allow media into the hearing room. In doing so, the committee reminds the media that they must follow the directions of the committee and the secretariat and remain within those areas clearly marked for the media. In addition, recording must not occur from behind the committee or between the committee and the witnesses, and computer screens and documents belonging to senators must not be filmed, photographed or recorded. Witnesses are reminded that they can object to being recorded at any time. The committee thanks the media in advance for maintaining a COVID-safe approach while in the hearing room. It being shortly after 9am, I welcome the President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan, the Clerk of the Senate, Mr Richard Pye, and officers of the Department of the Senate. I thank the Department for providing updated information on Senate committee activity which has been circulated to the committee. Mr President, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, not for this section. Senator. Thank you. Clark, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Pye. 
I will open the uh, questioning and Senator Ayres, you will have the call. Thanks, Chair. Welcome to President and Clark and all your colleagues. Um, Mr Pai, uh, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about um, advice that you, you, you have given the President in relation to the uh, alleged sexual assault in um, Minister Reynolds' office. Um, in March, and I think it was in the context of questions um, about the alleged rape in the ministerial wing, you told the committee that you, haven't, that you hadn't provided any advice to the President about the possibility of prejudice to law enforcement investigation on public interest immunity grounds, and that you'd, I think you said that you'd simply drawn his attention to Odgers. Has that changed since you gave that evidence? Is, have you had occasion to give um, the President specific advice? Um, I, I don't believe that it, it has, Senator, but um, when I give Senators advice in relation to um, proceedings of the Senate, in relation to uh, the operations of committees, um, as I have done with several of the senators in this room now, um, mm. I give that advice on the basis that uh, it's confidential and it's for the recipient of the advice to decide if and when to um, uh, pub publish that advice or, or advert to it in answers to questions. I'm certainly not asking about the content of the advice. I think you said in March, uh, in response to a question from Senator Gallagher, she says, Mr Pye, you provided evidence to the President, obviously, is his statement based on your advice? And, and you said, no, Senator, the President's statement is based on advice that's in Odgers, um, which I did draw to his attention. But uh, she then goes on to say, so you didn't specifically provide adv advice before this hearing, and you said about this investigation, no. Um, is, that, is that still the case? I believe it is. Thank so. you. So you didn't provide any advice to the President during the prepara preparation of the President's statement that was received by this committee on the 1st of April? Um, no, I didn't provide advice on, on that statement. Uh, have you given any advice to the President about the making of a public interest immunity claim about the alleged rape in the ministerial wing? Um, I'm not sure whether I have, um, Mr President. I think it's Except possibly Senator, in the context of... I've had, um, in my capacity in particular, I have lots of discussions with the clerk, range across a range of issues. I think the clerk has indicated that the advice he provides to senators, I'm not privy to advice he provides to other senators, mm. um, is provided to them for their use. I've had discussions with the clerk around a range of matters, but I have not sought specific advice, and the statements I have tabled have been things that I have written. Ultimately, it's a matter for this committee, isn't it? What questions it asks and, it's a matter and, for and where it insists upon answers. It's a matter for senators as to what questions they asked, ask, which I think I specifically mentioned last time. It's a matter for the committee to determine in the first instance and the Senate itself to determine matters in the final instance as to whether um, claims that are made are upheld or otherwise. Mr Pye, when and how did you become aware of the alleged rape in Senator Reynolds' ministerial office? Um, on the 8th of April in uh, 2019, there was a request being considered by the presiding officers from the AFP to quarantine some uh, video uh, footage from the CCTV system. Uh, the president sought my advice as to whether privilege might play a role in relation to the CCTV footage. As you know, Senator, there's a, um, there's a policy about the use of the CCTV system that requires um, uh, that if um, the footage in question might possibly engage privilege, um, then uh, the, the question of whether a claim of privilege might be made by somebody should be entertained. Um, my advice at the time was that um, if the footage that they were seeking was footage involving um, access to a minister's suite, then um, 
the, uh, the, the policy would suggest that um, the occupant of the suite should be given an opportunity to consider whether a claim of privilege might be appropriate in those circumstances. Uh, there was nothing from the sketch of the facts that I was aware of, uh, made aware of in, when that request was made to suggest to me that privilege would be an issue in that case. Um, and my advice to the president at the time was, nevertheless, make sure that the occupant of the suite is aware of the uh, request and given the opportunity to make a claim of privilege if there was a basis for doing so. And is that what happened, President? I table the statement here following the last estimates. I think this committee will have a copy of it, mm. um, which outlines both the nature of the concerns, uh, the formal claim was not made, as you would be aware, Senator Ayres, um, about going into specific details of the events at the time. Um, what I can confirm, I think, safely, is that on all occasions when it is possible that a privilege issue may be claimed, and it is a very low threshold, it's not in my judgment that it is, uh, and information is requested by an outside agency, um, the relevant senator, or in the case of the other place, a member of the House, would be informed that it was the intention of the presiding officers to provide information to the authority, and if they wish to assert a claim, they had a route to do that. Uh, it's not so much a question, it's more uh, an, a provision of information and a course of action we plan to undertake. I have followed that in all circumstances, um, that I have been asked for information by outside agencies. So Without you, commenting on this specific one, I've followed it in all cases. So you sought the, that advice on the 8th of April, which is when the secretary, the, the, um, the clerk became aware of the alleged rape? Um, I'll take the, I don't have the specific date, but that, reflecting on the statement I made to... And, and did you take, stake, t take steps on that day to ascertain whether a claim of privilege would be made by Minister um, Reynolds? I don't necessarily undertake, ascertain whether a statement will be made. In all cases where information is being provided to outside agencies, um, I inform the relevant senator or member that that information is it is our intention to be provided, for that information to be provided, and if someone wishes to make a claim, that they can. I didn't. I don't ascertain that. I inform them that information is to be provided. Is the a yes, fair way to characterise it? I see. Yes. I can also say that in my time as president, at no point when I have been asked for information to be provided to an outside agency for the purposes of. Um, law enforcement or a related matter, at no point am I aware that a claim of privilege has, or well, I have not been informed of any claim of privilege being made over such information. Mr President, in the, the statement that we were just talking about, in March you were asked if you had discussions about all of this with the clerk. I think you took the question on notice, saying our regular discussions with the clerk, but I'll come back to you. Um, your answer to the question on notice, question number seven, refers the committee to the 1 April statement, which which doesn't reference discussions with the clerk. Is there a reason that you haven't answered that question? Well, Senator Ayres, I think there were discussions held with um, people regarding the estimates hearings and information that would be provided. Um, I provided that by the deadline. Um, I thought it comprehensive. I haven't had any follow-up to it. Um, but I, mean, I did, as I said before, have discussions with the clerk around a number of matters. And it's fair to say, as the clerk's outlined, it included this matter. But I discussed a lot of matters with the clerk. Um, and particularly when I receive requests for the provision of information to external agencies to double check my thinking. There sorry, is a, public, sorry, sorry, finish. There's a great deal of sensitivity in this building and particularly from senators about the provision of external information. 
uh, the access to the you know, various electronic security systems we have in this building. So I take a very, very strict approach and ensure that um, there is deliberation and consideration at every step before um, information is provided externally. But the, 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 these questions are, of course, about the public interest immunity claim that you and other... Um, Senator Ayres, I understand you were aware that um, there was no PII claim being made following that hearing, and that statement, I add, does not formally assert one. That there was, in the course of the hearing, and um, questions weren't answered in the course uh, on of the, the basis hearing, that there was an AFP investigation. Absolutely, and in the course of the hearing, I think I said that I would go away and determine whether or not a PII claim was to be made. The statement... And you made, haven't sought advice from the clerk specifically about that? I question. have discussions with the clerk. Whether, when you say, have I sought advice, do I, do, have I had, do I specifically request a written brief of advice on these matters? No, I do not. Do I have discussions with the clerk mm -hmm. about a range of matters regarding to it, Senate procedure? Of course I do on a very regular basis. But I think, Senator Ayres, um, that statement that I tabled on the 1st of April does not formally assert a PII claim, and I, um, under, I understood that was um, not going to be a surprise. It, um, it's certainly what the, um, what the government relied upon in the last, um, in the last estimates. Well, no, this, oh. was, this, was, sorry, this was tabled after estimates. Yes. No, I yeah, understand that point. I'm just trying to understand what, on, on what basis uh, the government's made that claim then. Um, I, I can't speak on behalf of the government. No, but it's a very similar uh, set of answers. Mr Pye, can I ask some questions about the COVID vaccinations for staff? Has, has the department organised any, um, any, any COVID vaccinations for staff? Um, nothing beyond the normal program for the ACT, Senator. So if staff make an appointment with their GP or, or what the arrangements are in the yeah, ACT, the there's no program? There, there was, as I understand it, there was some consideration of um, using Parliament House as a, um, a, as a, a site for um, vaccinations, possibly later on in the, uh, in, in the rollout program, but I'm not aware that anything came of that suggestion. So that was a suggestion, but you haven't heard any more about that? That's right, Senator. I think, Chair, that Senator Kitching has some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, happy to pass the call to Senator Kitching. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Um, Mr Pye, thank you. And could I read from your uh, memorandum? From the, it's from the clerk, May 2021, which I do enjoy reading. I'm pleased that someone <laughs> reads it, Senator. Um, so you, you say a couple of things to mention as we round the corner into the budget sittings. Can I echo again, if not assage, your frustrations at the continued need for ICT workarounds, particularly in the committee office? Committee activity has continued apace, and I know that recent high workloads, both expected and unexpected, have been demanding enough in their own right, without also having to step through additional processes. This was particularly the case when parts of the system were suddenly unavailable over the Anzac weekend. We continue to raise these concerns at every opportunity, and once again I thank you for your forbearance. I am sure that in time we will find ways to enhance communication and collaboration with our ICT colleagues to mitigate these problems. Um, I am aware of the Committee Secretariat's level of frustration mm because my understanding is that the new system that was put in by DPS did not take into account the report writing software. Yeah, the, the committee report builder um, program is not compatible with the uh, new suite of uh, Microsoft Office products that were mm -hmm. rolled out um, a, a, a little bit earlier than anybody, I think, <laughs> on, our, uh, on our side of the, How the much building earlier? we're expecting. Um, by a, a number of months at least, um, mm -hmm. Senator. But uh, r regardless of that, I mean, my view is that insufficient work was done to identify the um, interdependencies between our system that we've been using for, um, for many years now and the um, 
intended upgrade to the parliamentary computing network. So not enough work, preparatory work was being done anyway. And the fact that suddenly we had to switch over over the course of just a couple of weeks in around uh, October last year has um, really exacerbated, I think, the difficulty that, uh, that our staff have using the system. Who has responsibility for working out the interdependencies? Would that uh, be the ICT colleagues in DPS? Yeah. So DPS didn't do sufficient work to ensure that systems which people use daily that's, a that's, lot. That's my view, Senator. Yeah. Yes. Can I add, I, I have had discussions with the clerk about this and in the last month or two, particularly the last month, um, I have personally pressed DPS on the critical nature of this for the Senate. Um, and I have done so on a number of occasions because Senate, this particular um, availability is, in my view, more critical for the Senate than it is for the House. And I have pressed mm -hmm. DPS on this. And what does DPS respond to you? It is being prioritised and it has been given the highest priority. As you'll be aware, and I'm sure we'll cover in the next session, there were some uh, issues over the last six weeks that led to um, resources being directed elsewhere. Um, but it is of the highest priority. I don't have a timeline yet, um, but it has been impressed upon DPS that this is critical for the functionality um, of Senate and Senate staff. When do you expect to get a timeline? Um, well, to a certain extent, um, I, I, I can't answer that question. Um, is that it, because DPS doesn't know? No, it's know a matter it? that's being pursued, um, and it's a matter that I'll pursue again this week at my weekly meeting with the Speaker and DPS. Um, as I said, I think everyone has experienced over the last six weeks, particularly over the Easter weekend in late March and early yes. April, um, where significant resources, which I'll outline later, had to be deployed elsewhere. Thank you. Mr Pye, in, your, in the statement I just read out, um, you talk about workarounds um, for the ICT, ICT workarounds mm -hmm. you talk about. Um, what, what were the workarounds to which you're referring in that communique? I, I, I'll try not to pretend to have more technical <laughs> knowledge of this than I, than, than I do. Um, but uh, I understand that what's been established is a virtual desktop that allows uh, committee staff, I could look around the room, they could nod for me if I get it right or wrong, but a, a virtual desktop that allows access to the locations which allow the um, committee report builder to um, compile all of the information it needs to compile. But that sits aside from the usual desktop environment that people are using. So you're logging in and out of different systems in order to... Um, and, and on the question that you, you asked the President before about the timelines, um, the, how long it's going to take to build a satisfactory replacement is going to depend on some work that's being done at the moment to try to identify whether um, we need to start from scratch or whether we can build on top of the system that um, we are used to using. So um, the um, work they're doing at the moment will identify how long the project will have to be to, uh, to, to um, is remediate. It, is it proprietary software or you, is it being bought? You can take it on notice. If <laughs> I mean, is someone build um, the, the 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 committee report builder software that we use at the moment was was built in house um, some right. years ago. Um, it's it it has come to the end of its um, usable life, um, but I think the assumption was that it could be more easily ported over to the new network than has proved to be um, the case. So who and made who made that misjudgment? Um, I, I think that it was part of the inadequate um, preparation that yeah. I talked about at the beginning of this section, Senator. Um, has D have you been provided an explanation as to the system unavailability over the ANZAC weekend? Um, in in a general sense, Senator, but um, I, I don't have uh, I don't have the specific details on that. But I can take that on notice okay, if that would be you. helpful. Um, 
On the 27th of April this year, there were at least four Senate committee inquiry hearings conducted in Parliament House. Obviously, that there's an enormous amount of work that goes into arranging hearings by Senate committees. Um, they usually start in, you know, about right, around about nine o'clock. At what time did DPS alert the department to the systems outage? Well, I think the systems outage had occurred earlier on um, than that. I think it was over the I uh, over the weekend. I think we we were aware. Um, our secretariat staff were, were, were aware on the Saturday, um, Saturday so possibly the Friday or Saturday. My, I, understand I, my understanding was that the, uh, the problem occurred um, at, at 4.30 or 5 o'clock on the, on the Friday night and certainly our staff were aware there was a problem on, on the Saturday when they were preparing for um, those, those hearings uh, later in the, in the week. And, um, there was also a lockdown in Perth all of a sudden, so we were rescheduling what had mm. been intended to be a, a in, in person person. hearing in Perth to become a virtual hearing. So my understanding is that DPS didn't notify the Department of the Senate, and the first communication was when DPS sent a generic circular to all network users at approximately 9.43. I, I think that that's probably right in terms of the formal notification, um, mm -hmm. but my staff were aware were aware from their conversations with the help desk on the Saturday. That, that's I, my understanding. Yeah. If, if, if I'm not right, I'll correct that so on notice. Is there an arrangement where DPS notifies you? Uh, this certainly is meant to be, Senator. But it's not acted on? It didn't occur on that weekend. Mm. Um, have any of can I have any of the staff of the Senate been affected just by the additional workload, by stress? Um, I, I don't know that um, that I would say they've been affected. Uh, mm. They certainly have had to do additional work in order to um, to complete the uh, tasks that they they need to do, um, and uh, you know it's it's a little bit frustrating because the. Yes whole point of the new Microsoft suite that uh, has been adopted through the building is to enable people to share information and collaborate more easily and we've had an experience over the last six months where the reverse has been the case. Yes, so um, do you think there should be improved communication from DPS to the department? I, I think that that would be useful in this, um, in this instance, mm. Senator. I'll leave it there, Chair. I mean, I think many people at this table had significant issues with the changeover of the system, mm. but I'll go through that with DPS. But I know I, that this I, is I a particular was... part of the problem yeah. that the committees have been... I mean, our, our committee staff have probably been most affected out of the, the, the Senate mm. Department staff. We've also had the circumstance more recently where um, the, uh, the, the mobile device platform had to change. Um, DPS had done what I thought was some really good, useful, thoughtful planning in relation to that, but then suddenly had to um, cut over more yeah. easily, um, more quickly because of a, um, a, an outage in the system a little while ago, a few yes. March it must have been. Um, so it, it's a case there of um, it, it's now starting to deliver the promise that um, that, that was uh, that was held out for it, and that's a that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Kitching. Any other senators seeking the call for Department of the Senate? No. I am just wary that the Greens. Uh, requested them as well, but they don't appear to be here. So, there being no other senators requesting the call, I might dismiss the Department of the Senate with my thanks for appearing here today and for your testimony, and we will call the Parliamentary Budget Office. Thank you, Chair.
it was so by actual combat. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, my kid combo kind of yeah, actually exposed it. Exactly. It would have been greater risk. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no, no. Sorry. He only has questions for DPS. Apps and devices, yeah. and we've we we can start to add stuff back in. Is that kind of a news memo taking out? Like I can't open the PDF, you know. We might have Yep. Um, we might just suspend for five minutes to see if the senators that we're going to ask questions of the PBO are intending on coming to ask those questions. Um, so just sit tight for a moment and the committee will suspend briefly. Thanks, the committee will reconvene at 9.51am and I welcome Mr Robert Stefanik, Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services, Dr Diane Herriot, the Parliamentary Librarian and Officers of the Department. I thank the Department of Parliamentary Services providing, for providing information pursuant to the committee's recommendations in the 2015 DPS inquiry, which has been circulated to the committee. And I thank you for coming along a little earlier than anticipated and for your flexibility. Mr Stefanik, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Dr Harriet, do you wish to make an opening statement? She's no, not at the you. front <laughs> desk, but we will say that no, she does not. Mr President, would you like to make thank an opening you. statement? Chair, thank you. I don't think it would surprise anyone that I would. Uh, first, I'd like to provide some background to the committee about the work undertaken to rectify the IT outage that occurred for mobile devices between 27 March and 5 April. What I can say about the attack is the following. On the 26th of March 2021, DPS was the subject of malicious cyber activity. A malicious actor sought to access the DPS network accounts through mobile iron devices using unsophisticated brute, brute force tradecraft. The malicious activity lasted just under 24 hours. It was unsuccessful and DPS networks were not compromised. Appropriate network controls were implemented, which ensured that accounts were locked down, preventing compromise. Those controls were successful in blocking the malicious actor, but also impacted legitimate users' ability to access DPS networks for several days, while even more rigorous IT security arrangements were implemented. DPS has been and will remain an attractive target for malicious cyber activity, which is increasing in frequency and sophistication. I want to highlight that while the outage did cause significant inconvenience, the Department of Parliamentary Services put significant effort into implementing a new mobile device management system in a very short period of time. This migration had been planned well before the incident, but it was to be implemented over a three month period. DPS staff migrated most email data to new services over the course of just three days between 27 and 31 March. Contrary to media coverage, the complexity of the migration did not extend the outage. 14 technical staff across different IT disciplines worked over the Easter long weekend to ensure the remaining migration to provide support to parliamentarians and other users that needed assistance. I want to place on record my sincere thanks to the IT staff who worked very long and irregular hours to both protect our system and bring functionality back online as quickly as possible. I also want to acknowledge and thank the patience of senators, members and staff across their network for their patience and understanding. The next topic I'd like to address is retail licences at Parliament House. On the 27th of February 2017, my predecessor Stephen Parry informed senators of the ANAO performance order of DPS which focused on managing assets and contracts at Parliament House. This included an examination of retail licences managed by DPS. The ANIO identified the need to strengthen the management of retail licences, develop a retail strategy and achieve value for money. Work was first required to fix legacy issues related to the administration of licence agreements. This process is now complete. A strategy to enhance retail offerings to all building occupants has now been developed with the ANIO recommendations at its core. DPS will test the market for retail services through expressions of interest and seek to attract a range of services that meets the needs and desires of building occupants. This process will be staged and be open, fair, equitable and conducted with transparency and integrity. First, DPS will be seeking expressions of interest for health and wellbeing services. This includes general practitioner, physiotherapy, hairdressing and beautician services to complement the services provided through the Health and Recreation Centre. This process will begin in July 2021 and be completed by January 2022. Market testing will then occur for hospitality services. This will involve a mix of casual dining, takeaway food and beverage and general store services. This approach to market will be broad to enable innovative service proposals. It will not include further DPS offerings. 
It is anticipated this process will begin in February next year and be completed by July 2022. All existing licensees have been advised of this process and are advised to, uh, invited to submit expressions of interest. DPS will not be submitting expressions of interest to deliver any of these services with the aim of achieving diversity and competition in retail supply in APH, which we feel is important for delivering high quality support for people who work here. The third matter I'd like to address is the phasing out of rent relief to retail and press gallery licensees in Parliament House. Senators may be aware that retail and press gallery licensees in Parliament House have had 100 per cent rent relief since March last year when COVID-19 restrictions were initiated. Since then, for the last 14 months, no tenant has had to pay rent. With the easing of COVID-19 restrictions and various state Commonwealth measures related to eco economic support, it is timely to progressively reintroduce licence fees for Parliament House licensees. Rents will be phased back in over the next three quarters in consideration that some licensees are facing COVID-related difficulties unrelated to this building. Fourth, I'd like to address mobile phone reception. I hope senators and all building occupants have noticed a significant improvement in mobile phone coverage and reception in Parliament House. Mobile phone users will now find enhanced coverage across the building, including areas which have never previously had reception, such as the car parks. I'm pleased to confirm DPS completed the project-related construction phase in October. Telstra was responsible for the installation of new cabling antennas within Parliament House for this upgrade, and this was completed in December. The Telstra and Optus upgrades were fully operational in December, with their customers getting experiencing the enhanced mobile reception at that time. Vodafone, Vodafone came online in February 2021. Minor rectifications and tuning works are currently underway and are expected to continue to have little impact on the service experienced by mobile phone users in the building. This was a large-scale project. The new mobile antenna system is one of the largest ever installed in a building in Australia, comprising 1,096 new antennas, coax cabling, nine kilometres of fibre optic cabling and the construction of the new base transceiver station. As I outlined previously, the new infrastructure has been designed to enable 5G technology as it becomes available. Telstra has confirmed the first steps to enabling 5G system performance have commenced. The fifth matter I'd like to advise the committee is about the completion of an audit of all Commonwealth Government pass holders to Parliament House. Last year, the presiding officers asked DPS to undertake this audit to determine the number of pass holders and ensure that only current authorised pass holders with a genuine need to be here have access to the private areas of the building. DPS determined there were 3,497 active pass holders across 109 government agencies. Each agency was responsible for confirming if access should be retained or removed for these. The outcome of this order identified and removed 461 passes, which were no longer needed, which equates to a 13 per cent reduction in this type of pass. We will continue to conduct these audits periodically to ensure access to the private areas is limited to people who have a genuine ongoing need to attend. The final matter I would like to address relates to, um, and correct, relates to recent media coverage of the media contact policy of DPS as there was extensive consultation about, uh, to, uh, about it prior to its adoption. First, this media comment policy is consistent with others across the Australian Public Service. In June last year, drafting of the media comment policy commenced. In December last year, the CPSU was notified of various policies to be released and consultation, and consultation was taken in early 2021, including the media contact policies. These were social media for staff, recruitment and merit selection, working from home and media contact policies. On the 5th of February, CPSU, United Voice, CFMEU and AMWU were sent via email all four draft policies for comment as part of the two-week consultation period. On the same day, DPS emailed all staff to consult on the revised and new policies. Specifically, the background provided for the media contact policy was, and I quote, DPS media contact policy. This policy has been developed to ensure staff have clear direction about their obligations and responsibilities in relation to media inquiries and to ensure DPS employees are aware of the process to follow if they, approach, if they are approached to provide a comment. On the 19th of February, the consultation period had closed. No comments were received from the CPSU, although some staff provided feedback. Later that day, while DPS had a routine telephone meeting with the CPSU official, during this discussion, DPS agreed to a CPSU request for an extension to provide feedback on the working from home policy until the 23rd of February. No request was made for an extension to provide feedback on the media contact policy and no feedback was provided on that policy. On the 10th of March, the DPS consultative forum meeting was held and attended by a CPSU official. The CPSU official raised a number of matters at that meeting, 
none of which related to the media contact policy. At no time were concerns, did the CPSU raise concerns or comment on the policy. On the 17th of March, the four policies were released and came into effect. There were subsequent discussions where no, no, no um, comments were raised on the 25th of March, 26th of April, 26th of March and the 1st of April. The first DPS became aware of any concerns was when DPS was contacted by media asking questions about the media contact policy. However, I want to emphasise that DPS is of the view that there is a strong and good working relationship and a clearly established line of communication with the CPSU official or officials involved. That is my opening statement, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm wondering, Mr President, whether we could... There was a lot in that... Um, yeah, I've got copies. I did table. verbally yeah, change it. Yeah, could you table it? Can, can it? can it sort of be used but not tabled? I did change a few of the things as I read it out. OK. But feel free to use it and refer to it, but not have it as a tabled document, because I did change... I just want to read OK. Yeah, it's subtly different. There's a few subtle differences to what I said. Mm. Intriguing. No, Thank nothing you. nothing substantive. But <laughs> okay. If you're going to have a tabled statement, it should be the same as Hansard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thank think you, there's Mr. eight copies there. I'm sorry I underestimated it. Thank you. thank you very much, because there is a lot in that, and I know we'll have questions on it. Yep. Can I um, begin by going, uh, Mr President, to the statement you made, um, or you made following some questions that were asked of you at additional estimates yep. concerning the alleged sexual assault in the ministerial wing in March 2019? Yep. Can I begin by asking, who was involved in the preparation of this statement? Well, I wrote it myself. Mm -hmm. um, as I said previously, I consult the clerk on a number of matters. Um, yep. And I did have discussions with um, uh, following estimates, but not, I don't think, um, specifically about the words that were used, because there were discussions after estimates about the nature of questions on notice with me explaining the point I was making in that statement about the provision of information that may complicate an investigation or subsequent actions. So you had some discussions with DPS, is that right? On um, I, I would, I may have. Um, there was a, we have always have discussions after estimates, but I did discuss it with, um, I will say I probably discussed it with the secretary, but um, I discussed it, I'm almost certain I did, I discussed it with the clerk and I discussed it with some of the members of this committee who were asking questions and mm. seeking answers. Yep. Mr Stefanik, did you? Just, did, the, did the president consult you in putting together this statement or was it more after the statement had been made? Um, no, I, don't, I certainly don't. Uh, Rob Stefanik, Secretary, Department of Parliamentary Services. Um, I certainly don't recall a specific conversation um, regarding consultation for his statement. Um, certainly, um, obviously, as this was a matter of high public interest, we've had a number of conversations regarding the, the investigation and the content itself. OK, sure. Um, Mr President, your statement says, um, while the timing of interactions and discussions and advice can be confirmed, um, you then go on to say the content of these may constitute a fact in issue and should not be disclosed. So I'm going to try and restrict my questions to the timing of interactions and discussions and advice as per your statement. And I should say, Senator, that, that, that's, that they are words that I was authorised to state following consultation with the AFP yep. after. Yeah. Um, and so perhaps if I start with that, in your statement you say you and the Speaker consulted the AFP Commissioner and the Head of ACT Policing after the hearing on the 22nd of March. Can you just confirm for us on what date that was? I believe that was the afternoon after the hearing. So after the on the 22nd yeah. of March. Um, it may have been, I think it could have also been the following morning. Yeah. Okay. On the 23rd. But we did act on it relatively quickly after the hearing. Have you had any further contact with the AFP since that discussion? Um, I have not had any personal contact with the AFP about this matter. DPS has. Um, and um, as I indicated in past statements, the um, DPS and the is cooperating with requests for information from the AFP, so they have come through the DPS channels. They don't come directly to the presiding officers. Okay. So, um, Mr uh, Stefanik, can you perhaps say, um, just tell us the, the nature of the contact you've had with the AFP since we last met as additional estimates? Um, yes, Senator. Um, 
obviously since the investigation uh, commenced, the police have been interested in um, gathering whatever evidence or information we have to assist them with, with their investigation. Um, and we have been um, coordinated by my office. Um, we've been assisting with um, those inquiries and, and requests for information. Okay. And so just in terms of the mechanics from your side, you're coordinating, you are in basically the point person for DPS for this police investigation, is that correct? That's correct. Do you have a team around you? Have you pulled together a specific team within DPS on uh, it? No, uh, Senator, my executive officer assists uh, in that. So that's it. So you, you get, um, everything comes through you, you are the, the point person, but it's dealt with across the agency as per as the requests for information come in? That, that's correct. So if um, some of the information pertains to security branch, um, then the information will be um, sought from there. Um, if the information sought by the AFP uh, potentially intersects with privilege matters uh, or the CCTV code of practice or the EAX code of practice, um, the security branch will prepare a brief for the presiding officers, uh, which I will then um, endorse. Uh, it'll also be endorsed by the, uh, the usher uh, and the sergeant, uh, and then goes to the presiding officers for their uh, approval. Okay. Um, in... Um and so can you tell us uh, any more information about the requests from the AFP? Are they, or is, is that... Can I say at this point, content? Senator Gallagher, I think I mean, I, what I can say is that every request that's come to the presiding officers has been approved. Yeah. Um, I don't think it is appropriate for me to go to the nature of what information we might provide to the AFP is appropriate to disclose in a public forum. Okay. But... Um, they have made a number of requests for information. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, in the part of the statement where it's you're responding to specific questions, mm. do you have that statement yes. there? You say DPS advised finance of access to the minister's suite on the morning of Saturday, the 23rd of March, 2019. Does can you tell the committee what? time that advice was provided and who gave the advice and who received the advice. So where did the advice go? Well, that specificity we can take on notice to the extent that we can provide it, but yeah, I mean, it was... Um, Mr. Yeah. Stefanik, would you know that the answers to that? Um, no, no, not off the top of my head, Senator. But would you have a brief on it? I mean, I presume you were briefed ready for questions on this oh, matter. Oh, no, we've got... There are, um, as you'll be aware, Senator, we've gone, there are multiple forums in which some of this can be addressed and we tried to address it when asked. Um, I think the, the Secretary's allowed to take very specific questions about dates, times and people on notice. Yeah, no, I understand that. I just would have thought that, um, you know, there would have, people would have understood we would have follow-up questions um, from this. It's hard to anticipate all the questions, Senator Gallagher. Really, on this matter? Like what, the, to what time the advice was provided and who it went to? Because I, I do have a series of questions, that's all. Like, sure. I'm just... So, can I just say, I'm mean, just... I appreciate, and we did give, as you can tell from the statement, Senator Gallagher, a lot of thought. The, when, I, when it says here the timing of interactions and discussions and advice can be confirmed, the content of these shouldn't be disclosed. Yeah. I, just, I do need to consider that very carefully. Um, mm. What you've asked, if I'm correct, is what time and from whom and to whom was the advice about access to the minister's suite, I think is the phrase you used, yeah. provided on Saturday the 23rd of March. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the secretary to take that on notice and we're going to check 
um, because that is a question that could be answered quickly, um, whether or not the provision of that in the public information goes to content, because it's actually, you're, asking, you're actually asking about advice in relation to specific content. Mm. So I agree, uh, in my view, we could probably answer that question, but I will check it. Okay, I mean, in, in response to that, I understand you've, you're able to do that um, where you've been provided with information that it was, that was done on the 23rd, surely you, as part of putting together that series of information, mm. you would have been advised, or it would have existed what that, time on the 23rd? That information, it I'm confident, exists. You've mm. asked for specific times and names. I'm going to check whether or not that specificity crosses the line in terms of um, the con constituting content. But your statement again, the timing of interactions, discussions and advice can be confirmed. Yeah, the timing. Um, and so I, I'm, yeah. I think we probably could, but I'm going to check and ask the Secretary to check before we provide that information in a public okay. forum. Was there any contact with the Minister's office on Saturday the 23rd of March 2019 from DPS? Uh, no, Senator. And did DPS make contact in relation to the events of the 23rd of March with Mr Hawke's office? Um, no, Senator. We've had no communication with, Senator, uh, with uh, Mr Hawke's office. He was Special Minister of State at the time. So you, you haven't at, a, at any stage? Not at any stage. Okay. Um, can you outline the interactions that led to Senator Reynolds' office being cleaned on the weekend of the alleged sexual assault and who was involved in the decision to clean the suite and who was informed that the suite would be cleaned? Um, but I think, um, Senator, for the same reason that the President articulated with the, the previous question, um, that they might relate to facts in evidence. Um, I really? certainly would this take This is about that. a decision to clean a suite, not, not relating to the facts and, and that are under investigation, but who made well, the decision to clean well, the suite I, on the weekend? Yeah. Um, and again, I will... Again, that... The provision of, um, of names is one issue. Um, we generally... Okay, well, I'm just yeah. a title or... Yeah, if, that's OK. Yeah. Um, I understand that. Can I um, ask again, that information is available. Can I ask that the Secretary and myself be able to check whether or not the provision of that information crosses the line? Because we cannot be aware of all the facts that are relevant to this investigation. I cannot be aware of what I put on the public record and what and its potential complicating nature. That could go to issues of disputed fact. It could go to issues of people um, who may be assisting or otherwise. I, I'm just going to ask the secretary if we can provide that. We will do it quickly. Okay. Um, I mean, it seems to me it was a decision made by DPS outside of matters that the police would be interested in, but you're saying... I can't that determine what the police are interested in or not. What I can say, as I said before, is, you know, it would be... No, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I, OK. Have... All right. On what date was the first contact between DPS and AFP in relation to the events of the 23rd of March, and who initiated that contact? Did the AFP come to you or did DPS go to the AFP? Um, my understanding, Senator, is that the AFP came to us. Right. Um, I believe it was the 2nd of April, Senator. Um, and that was when uh, the AFP informally um, uh, advised one of our staff uh, that they wanted to view CCTV footage. Okay. So between the 23rd of March and the 2nd of April, there had been no red flags raised from your, 
from within DPS about the events of that night? I think, to be fair, Senator, that's a, we need to be very specific. I mean, what do you mean by you're asking officials here to make judgments about facts that may or may not be relevant? I mean, I'm wondering what you mean by red flags, to be fair to the officials. Mm. Well, um, you know, two people entering the building after midnight, one, you know, one leaving, another one staying, a young woman. Um, people working within DPS, I think, being doing welfare checks. Like, it's, it's not a normal night in the house, no. I wouldn't have thought. Like, it just strikes me as unusual that there's, you know, a 10-day period where DPS seemingly isn't concerned about what happened that night. I, um, you've made a number of assertions there. I'm not going to... I, I restrain myself from addressing a number of assertions that um, have been stated and reported about this out of respect for the investigation and processes that may follow that. Um, so I'm, all I'm suggesting is that questions around this need to be very specific. Well, I am trying to be specific, and you're taking them all on notice. So I am, I am trying to find no, a path that, through I'm... this. But so far, pretty much, at least half of the questions have been taken on notice, and they are specific questions. Um, why wasn't the president informed until the evening of Wednesday, the 27th of March? And why was the president told on this day? Um, was Senator, that a red flag or? Uh, no, Senator. Um, so through um, my communications with the Department of Finance, um, I was um, advised that the, um, the Minister Reynolds uh, was interested in uh, obtaining any uh, incident reports that may have been generated uh, on that evening. Uh, Minister Reynolds' office was interested, is that right? Uh, that's correct. So by the 27th of April, of March? Of March. Um, it was uh, in the afternoon, uh, as I recall, on the 27th of March that I uh, hand-delivered the um, uh, the report, um, what, what we call an executive summary report, to the minister's office, to the minister and minister's office. So you handed the, you hand delivered the report. So perhaps if I go back a bit, what was the interaction between Senator Reynolds' office between Saturday the twenty third of March and Wednesday the twenty seventh of March? From the uh, incident occurring to the point where you handed that over, what what happened in between there? Um, there? There was no interaction with the minister's office up until that point. Um, the coordination was um, through the Department of Finance, uh, and um, so Department of Finance contacted you. Is that right? Uh, well, we had discussions going in both directions, um, but Department of Finance. Um, conveyed to me that the minister was interested in um, any incident reports that had been generated. Okay. So you'd been in, um, in communication with Department of Finance since the weekend, um, I think. That's right, isn't that's, it? That's correct. So you said there'd been to and fro between the Department of Finance, but at some point you were advised by the Department of Finance that the minister's office was interested in any incident report. Was that on Wednesday the 27th of March? Did you hand deliver a report the same day? Um, my notes suggest that my um, first discussion regarding... Yeah, we should, we should stay what... The, we should yeah. avoid what any discussion is regarding. Again, we can go interactions but not the content of the interactions so my understanding is that that an incident report was asked for on the 26th of March okay so on the 26th of March Department of Finance made it clear to you that the minister's office would like any incident again, report again senator we're going to content of interactions 
No. That no, is the, I'm, that, just, that, I'm trying to do a timeline. No, you're doing a I'm timeline, not... but you're, you're inserting content of what was what those interactions were about. No, it, Mr. Um, Stefanik said he hand delivered. I know, and I'm trying and to. And I'm trying to. And he used the word incident report. I know, and Senator Gallagher, I am trying to do my best for the committee here and not cross the line that I have been asked not to cross by the police investigating this. Yeah. And that goes to the content of interactions. So. I'm just reminding senators that I, my okay. view, the secret, secretary is limited in what he can say, he, yeah. and senators need to be careful not to assume something in a follow-up question. So, you, Mr. Stephanie, you hand delivered the report, um, which was you 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 referred to it as an executive report. Yeah, was an that, executive was that summary. Was that created an executive summary? Was that created? specifically for that purpose? Uh, no, it was not. Right, so it was perhaps a report that had been provided to you over the weekend and you've... Uh, no, it, it hadn't. I'd, I'd only received it a short time um, prior to handing it to the Minister. Um, normally, if something unusual uh, occurs in the building, um, some reports would uh, be generated um, as a matter of record, uh, yeah. if required. So it, it was just one of those reports, one of the ones that it would normally be generated? Correct. Right. And you, I think you've referred in your evidence that you handed it to the minister herself? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. So it wasn't a document you were going to leave at the front desk? Uh, no, well, I didn't, I didn't want to email it. Um, um, Why is that, Mr Stephanie? Um, well, given the... Um, I guess given that there may be uh, any number of people that may have access to the email system, um, I thought it was important that uh, I thought it was important um, that it be provided directly to the minister, uh, to the minister's chief of staff and the minister. So to both the minister's chief of staff and the minister. That's correct. And did you have a meeting about it, or did you just hand uh, it, it over? It was a very, it was a very brief meeting. Okay. Um, and are there protocols for this? I mean, could I could I ask for any any incident report that's been, you know, if I was here on the weekend and I saw something, could I ring up and ask you to give me an incident report? What's uh, the protocol around that? Um, if if it concerned your office, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, but outside of that, so there is a standard operating procedure about management of of sensitive information. Uh, yes, uh, obviously any. Um, any information that relates to a, min, uh, to a member of parliament, uh, to senators and members, um, we consider to be their information. So if they have some concerns about access to their um, suites, um, that certainly would be something that we would assist with. Okay, so the minister had the incident report given to her directly by you on the 27th of March. Had you, was this prior to, or did you brief the president after that? Because he found out on the same day. Uh, so I, um, it, was after. It, was, uh, it was after, yes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to um, compose a, a time frame. So the ministerial wing presents an interesting jurisdictional issue for DPS, um, given it is administered by the Department of Finance. Um, so there are protocols that are observed in terms of interaction, um, so, which is why my um, communication with the minister was facilitated through the Department of Finance. Um, at that point, I had not had any communication with the president about this, uh, nor the speaker. Um, because the minister was a senator, um, I sought uh, her agreement to brief uh, the president um, in his capacity as President of the Senate. Just going back to Senator Gallagher's question about the cleaning, did you interact with the Department of Finance about the cleaning? I didn't interact with the Department Did Ms Saunders? Uh, Ms Saunders? Ms Saunders didn't. Kate Saunders, Deputy Secretary, I did not have any direct communication with Department of Finance in relation to the cleaning. Would it be finance who would normally do the cleaning in the ministerial wing? 
or have control of the cleaning in the ministerial wing? Um, as, as a routine, um, as a routine activity, um, the cleaning which is um, done by a contractor on behalf of DPS um, would not require um, uh, any particular approval, obviously because it is a routine activity. Uh, but if there was any additional uh, clean required, um, the Department of Finance uh, Department of Finance's approval would be sought uh, for permission to access uh, the suite uh, and uh, a clean wouldn't be initiated uh, unless requested. Requested by whom? Department of Finance. But so did the Department of Finance order the cleaning on we're the going Saturday morning? We're going to content again here. Um, Not really. I'm asking who on the Saturday the 23rd of March and asked for the Senator, cleaning to be done. Was it DPS? or the Department Senator, of Finance? Senator That's Kitchen. a very simple question. Yep. It's not a content question. It is a factual question. Um, and facts, um, as the advice I've tabled, which um, I was given by the AFP, anything that constitutes, quote, a fact in issue should not be disclosed. So it would be a lot easier if um, I could answer a lot of questions. But at the risk of prejudicing an investigation and any subsequent or potential action, uh, by putting stuff on a public record of this nature, I am not willing to do. So, with respect, you are actually asking about the content of interaction between DPS and finance. And I'm asking whether on that Saturday morning, who asked for the cleaning? You are, and that goes to content, and um, that is not, in my view, the words that I'm issued with are, are clear around what you assert are facts. Can I go back um, to, the, um, the Reynolds, handing over the incident report to Senator Reynolds. So, Mr Stefanik, your evidence is that without her express permission, essentially, you were not able to brief the President. Is that correct? Um, it, it's a grey area, Senator. Um, there's no clear... Um, there's no mm. clear documented protocol about this. Um, uh, I was essentially following, uh, I guess, a memorandum of understanding that was signed back in 1988 um, that um, uh, is an agreement between the presiding officers uh, and what was then the minister for, I think it was administrative services, um, which uh, provided carriage of the ministerial wing um, to that minister. Um, so essentially my uh, my. Uh, my discussions in that regard and my seeking the minister's agreement uh, was following that. Okay, so the, and that was the brief, the nature of the brief meeting with Senator Reynolds. You sought that permission and then you went and briefed the president. That's correct. So, okay, so that occurred at that meeting. Um, why then was the speaker not informed until the 8th of April and then what, what prompted that notification to him? Okay, so I was informed in the evening of the 27th, 27th yeah. um, not by way of excuse, but by way of explanation, I was on medical leave, having had surgery the 10 days earlier. Yeah. Um, it was not, um, the speaker was informed on the 8th of April because of the, well, my recollection is because of the request to view or quarantine CCTV footage. Right. which requires the agreement of both presiding officers. OK, so he only was advised at the point, um, you know, for a, well, not routine, but under the access of the CCTV protocol. That's my recollection, yes. OK. Um, and what date following the presiding officers meeting with DPS on the 8th of April was the AFP application to access CCTV footage approved? Um, it was, I think, the next day. The brief came through, the formal brief came through, I think, on the 8th, and it was signed on the 11th. Okay. And approved on the 11th, um, in written form, verbally approved beforehand. Verbally approved before the 11th, but signed off on the 11th. I think, yes. I'll so when you say on. verbally approved, that, that, is that enough to it was, grant access? It, it, it's enough to 
pass on, and this happens on more than one occasion, if I could talk in general terms, to indicate, yes, make your arrangements, we'll get the paperwork done to ensure it, but so that it can actually expedite a process by telling someone that they've got, they're going to have authority, um, and then the paperwork flows through the official channels. Okay. And can I just ask what date the uh, AFP sought access to the CCTV footage? Do you have that available? No, that, I think you're asking what, date, what, what was the application date? Yeah, it was the application. Um, so the, the actual formal written request uh, was received on the 9th, on the 9th of April. Okay. So let's let's go back. How, you got it on the 9th of April, but then there was a meeting on the 8th of April, which to consider the AFP, AFP's application to access the CCTV footage. So what that was done informally too, and then formalised on the 9th. That's correct. Did you say that you that DPS had um, sorry that the AFP sought access on the second of April? Uh, oh, you told no. me you had contact with the AFP no. on the second of April. That's correct. But at that point, they didn't ask. Well, again, I, I, I'm doing my CCTV best to footage. I'm doing my best to assist the committee yeah. and a provision of um, a, a very generous interpretation, in my view, of the timing of interactions and discussion. Um, actual discussions between officials and the AFP could go to the nature of facts and issue. So I'm not going to ask, I don't think it's appropriate that they answer that. I am being, I'm being... About when the footage was resort? Oh, I, we've an, answered that. Okay. Um, you're asking about oh. the content of discussions between the DPS okay. and the AFP on I'll the 2nd of April. I'll ask a different way. So you had initial contact on the 2nd of April but it wasn't until the 9th of April that there was a formal request for CCTV footage, which was informally approved a day before the formal request was These, made. Well, hang on. I don't want people to mischaracterise. We get requests for, and again, I'm talking I'm in general terms. I'm not mischaracterising. I'm just for, going on and, the and evidence these, given these, today. These, these discussions happen and then processes are formalised and nothing actually happens until the process is formalised. But I think it is fair to say that we would want... Um, this building and relevant agencies on a whole range of security related matters to be able to have discussions prior to just waiting for paperwork to turn up. So, Mr President, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to understand how um, certain, how and when decisions were made. I've and given you the dates. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't think it was unfair. You met on the 8th of April to approve an application that wasn't formally made till the next day is what the evidence we've learned uh, today. I'm sorry, Senator, can I, um, can I correct um, right. a statement I made earlier? Um, the actual request by the AFP to view the footage was received on the 3rd of April. On the 3rd of April. The f that was a formal request? Uh, yes. yes, that's correct. Okay, so for the timeline, D uh, the AFP reached out to DPS for the first time in relation to this matter on the 2nd of April. They made a formal request for CCTV footage on the 3rd of April. There was then a meeting with the presiding officers on the 8th of April, and it was agreed to on the 11th of April. The application for CCTV footage was agreed on the 11th, formally. So, uh, so the the, the process that occurs, Senator, when there is a request for the footage is a, a brief is prepared um, by Security Branch, uh, which outlines the code of practice um, and the conditions in which um, CCTV footage can be viewed or released. Um, so it's not until that brief is formally prepared for submission to the presiding officers that they formally approve it. So that brief, um, with the AFP's request uh, wasn't provided until the to the presiding officers until the 9th of April. Okay. So in that, in that window of time between the 3rd and the 8th, you're pulling together a brief for the presiding officers? That's correct. Okay. Um, 
I think if you you might want to have back, have a look back at the hand because I, I I think at the on original earlier this morning you said on the second of April they reached out made contact requesting the CCTV footage. Uh, yes, they they con contacted one of uh, DPS's officers um, to um, request um, to view it. Okay, and then the formal request came the next day. Is uh, that right? The formal request to view came the se the next day. Yes. Okay. okay. Have any DPS officials viewed the CCTV footage? Um, a number of. Um, DPS officials, I hasten to add, not myself and not the speaker, have not seen it. A number of DPS officials, I think, viewed it in the course of quarantining and assisting other people viewing it, um, the AFP. Um, but we wouldn't normally provide the names of all no. the DPS staff in that sense. Okay. So um, the people in the security branch? Uh, correct. Officers? Yeah, correct. So, it'd be do a you know small... how many people have viewed it um, in DPS? I imagine there might may, may have been perhaps two people within security branch that work in the systems area um, that will have um, seen the footage for the purposes of quarantining, um, because it would have required going through a number of um, CCTV records to establish yep. what what we had, and then. And then up the chain from there, does anyone else get to, to view it before it's released? Um, to, to my knowledge, um, uh, uh, I am the only uh, officer of DPS that's... So you, you viewed the footage, Correct. but no one else in your executive team? Uh, uh, not to my recollection, Senator. And why do you view it? Um, you, you, do you view it on the... As you'll, a matter of course, do you well, view all the... You'll be aware um, there was also, as I've informed other committees, and I think I've alluded to in this committee, an independent inquiry into mm. uh, the actions of DPS. Um, and I believe the secretary had to view it in that context on the um, instruction of the speaker and I. Mm -hmm. the, Tom, the Tom review. And, and would the, inve the investigator would have yes. also had a look at it? Okay. Okay, I've just got a couple more questions in this and then I've finished. Um, just in relation to some uh, questions I've asked on notice, I don't know if you bring those with you, but it's question on notice 116 and I've also got a couple of questions on question on notice 115. Um, was the discovery of Ms Higgins in Senator Reynolds' office on the morning of the 23rd of March reported to more senior officers in the Department of Parliamentary Services? I'm going to ask the Secretary again, only because I think this is entirely reasonable to assert is a matter that may be of specific relevance to the police, that in this public forum, um, that constitutes a fact and issue. Senators will be aware that there are two other fora where these matters can be canvassed and have been canvassed, which are not on the public record, which all senators are entitled to attend, which some senators here have attended, and those matters can be more fully explored at that forum without the risk of prejudicing any police investigation or potentially doing so or any action that may follow. Mm. We're not, um, and I'm certainly not trying to, oh, no, no to jeopardise is. any yep. investigation, but I a, also I, I, believe that, you know, accountability and transparency around matters of who knew what when, not going to the facts of the matter, are well, of who, interest who, and relevance and um, who, and, 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 to the national interest. And they are, and senators will be aware I have disclosed a great deal of information mm. into other non-public fora where yep. committees can take evidence in a more discreet way. Yeah. And that I don't think, Senator Gallagher, um, that one can assert what you just did is not a fact and issue. What I will again do is I'll ask the Secretary to take that on notice to seek advice as to whether the provision of that information is inappropriate or appropriate. Okay. Or is inappropriate, I should say. If it's not inappropriate, then... All right. Well, I've got a, a number of others, like how was the Assistant Secretary of the Security Branch informed, if so, when and how? 
sure, we'll, we'll, I'll treat that the same way. Okay. And uh, when was the Deputy Secretary informed? If so, when and how? And when was the Secretary first informed? And I'll treat that all the same way. In my view, my interpretation from my discussions is that that goes into um, what could constitute facts and issue. Uh, and I know no one here wants to you know, jeopardise investigation. And no. I'd like to think, Senator, that in a number of fora, I have been particularly open about this. And there are, there's, this is a unique forum where everything goes on the public record. Yep and has a unique risk, potentially, to a police investigation or any legal action that may follow. Can I ask, have, Mr. Stephanie, have any of your executive team received legal advice and is that being paid for by the department? Can I ask, so can we just rephrase that question? Mr. Stefanich is not in position to uh, answer whether his well, legal team, have, you know, whether his department has paid for legal advice for his team is a question, not whether they've received legal advice. He doesn't. No, he can't legal advice as to their own situation. Well, he can't be aware of whether they've sorted well, it out. Well, he will be if the department's paying for it. My, that's my point. So the question is, has the department paid for legal advice for any or of these Or organised any legal advice? Um, that's the, I'm, I'm just trying to be specific Mr. about Stephanie? the question. Uh, no, Senator. No legal advice for any of your executive team? No. Any former employees? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Mr President, again, just to make the point, I am trying, and I did craft my questions in trying to be in line with your, your statement, particularly that line, the timing of interactions and discussion and advice can be confirmed. So, I mean, my, my questions really are the timing of of when people were advised, not what they were advised or what no, then flowed from there, but we want to make sure that, you know, we have an understanding of how that flowed through the department on that I day. I understand that, Senator, and I will do my best um, to fulfil my duties in answering such questions. I think with respect it is some of the questions you have asked do go to the content of advice, um, as well, opposed I'm not, to... I'm not asking, I'm just saying who, who, when, when were when, people informed? Yeah, and so I will, I will do my best, as I have in this forum and two others, at extensive length, to answer questions that senators have. Um, in relation to question on notice 116, I asked the department, has anything changed in the way the department responds to incidents at APH since March 2019? And the answer given is there have been no changes to these policies. Is that the case, Mr Stephanie? Um, that's correct, Senator. So knowing what we know now, are you seriously suggesting that there's nothing that needs to change in DPS's response to incidents? Well, can I answer, uh, start by answering this question? Firstly, we have asked DPS to explore whether or not we should start recording people who come into the building after hours. Sorry, if we can what? Record. And record. record people coming into the building after hours and protect whether it's the system is capable of providing a regular report to senators and members if they wish about who accessed their office, which of their staff came into a building. Senators and members can set their own rules and we believe that they could be enforced so that if, for example, I said, no, anyone that comes into my office after nine o'clock on a weeknight or on a weekend, I want to know about it. Now, we might not be able to do it in real time. We may be able to do it in a reporting way. Access to this building is actually set by senators and members. Senators and members all have the capacity to set rules for their own staff. And we're looking at whether or not we can have a reporting mechanism around that. Now, I expect, given my experience with the EAX and CCTV, that I'll actually get some concerns expressed to me about such data being collated and distributed to senators and members. But it should be recalled that senators and members can set the rules for access to their own office. What we do, and if I unilaterally announced that people couldn't come into the building at a particular hour, I think I would get pushback because I already get pushback from senators and members when their staff are told, well, you can't go there, you haven't got the correct pass, or your pass has expired. So with respect to DPS, they enforce policies that are set by senators and members. And we all have the capacity to set rules for our own staff. 
But they run the security in this building, and I, I wasn't necessarily mm. talking about refusing people access. A young woman was allegedly raped in this building a couple of years ago, and I'm hearing from you guys that there is no changes that need to happen to the way that this building is is managed I or don't. security is provided or well, you know red flags are watched or whatever you're saying to me no, I'm nothing not saying, needs do, to do, change do, do, no Hank do not put words in my mouth well Senator that Gallagher. is what that no. is what the answer to the question on notice no, say Sen and that's what Mr no. Stefanik said and you, you just had a go at me saying that I was basically trying to kick people out of the building I no, wasn't I didn't say that at all I'm saying if I did that I think I didn't mention you or anyone in this room but I know I get pushback from senators and that speaker does from members when security is applied strictly I don't want to go into the examples I have of people being, in my view, very rude to security staff trying to do their job, but it happens. And the security guards here work the... I, I don't think it is fair that we ask them to set rules that the security... DPS, I don't think it's up to... D, DPS would be accepted if it started to change the rules around access to this building or policing of officers. Now, I'm not dismissing at all what happened, Senator Gallagher, and I, Senator Gallagher, and I know you are not, but I think we need to be realistic about um, what authority we have as senators and members to set rules for access to our own offices after hours, because you, you, you specifically referred to people coming in very late in the evening or in early one morning. And I don't think, with respect, it's within the remit of DPS to change the rules around access to this building or necessarily the policing of individual officers, I think that is something we need to consider. As I said, it is something I've asked DPS with the Speaker to look at whether or not we should set up a regular reporting regime so senators and members know who's coming into their offices late at night. We haven't got a report on that yet. That is one idea that has occurred to me. And mm -hmm. it is one idea I will filter through the relevant chamber committee if it is, if it is feasible to test whether that is an option that senators and members would like. Mm -hmm. But my question wasn't about access to the building, and I, I've gone back. It, my question was, and I put it on notice, was has anything changed in the way the department responds to incidents such as these, as we know of now, since March 2019? And the answer is no. I think the answer was no. There have policies. been no changes to these policies, and I am saying, is that good enough? Like, I accept that, you know, we can be a difficult group to manage, for sure. Like, I am not pretending that. but. I think there's also an expectation that when you've got security in a building 24-7 that you would review matters like this to make sure you were doing everything that you could to keep people safe, particularly as it turns out vulnerable people who might be in this building well, I'm not uh, at times when there isn't a lot of people around. And those matters, as I've indicated, we have had discussions around that matter. The Secretary said in his answer that there's been no change to policy. Yeah. I have honestly said, not, I don't have an easy answer. I don't want to comment on the events of that evening for the reasons I've stated, morning, because for the reasons yeah, I've sure. stated before. But wouldn't DPS but, do a review of your own internal things and oh, after an incident like this? Surely that would be, you know, just standard good poli practice. Policies are regularly reviewed and there have been discussions at the highest levels but then myself. nothing changes. There have been no changes to these policies. So if the situation occurred when Miss a repeat, God forbid, of March 2019, DPS would handle it I'm exactly not gonna, the same actually, way. I'm would not they? Gonna, no, 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 well, no. That's, Senator Gallagher, but, you are putting words. On numerous occasions, the officials and myself have restrained ourselves from making statements providing information that are facts and issue, and that occasionally might be uh, disagreeing with an assertion that a questioner might make. I'm not going to have the secretary answer an open-ended question like that, which by its nature and the way it is phrased and what is in the public domain comes to a conclusion about the events of that night. Well, something failed that night. Something I, failed. Well, did, no one, I, no one disagrees with that, Senator Gallagher. Yeah. But no one also disagrees with the fact that the most important thing that needs to happen in the first instance is that a police investigation be allowed to happen and any subsequent legal action happen unimpeded by any inadvertent, and I appreciate it would be inadvertent, information put out in a domain like this. I agree. I, I, I agree we need to let that run, but 
that doesn't prevent an agency like DPS having a look at what happened and whether the policies and procedures are good enough, knowing that that's what happened. And as I've said, there have been discussions. And I changes don't... made. Well, I get the answer I've been given is there are no changes to these policies. So that implies so you, you, that no, no. Mr no, Stefanik is no happy with what... No, it doesn't. It well, implies it does. No changes. Otherwise, what, why wouldn't you change them? It says that no changes have been made. I've told you repeatedly that discussions about uh, how to handle um, challenging circumstances of safety have happened and are continuing to happen. You are taking the words that there has been no change to policy, um, which was tabled on or about 31st of March, within seven weeks. Okay, of the so matter have, have policies changed since then? Since that, no, no. Since that question on notice was tabled, no. have there been changes? No. Right, okay. Are you looking at it? Will you look at it? Will you do a review of how DPS responded to the matter of the 23rd of March 2019 and the weeks following to see whether there was anything you could have done better? Um, there, there are a number of processes that we have underway that are looking uh, at what we can do administratively. Um, obviously, as the President has identified, um, some of those changes would require the agreement of Senators and members. Um, uh, because it would be an imposition in how their offices uh, and access to their offices is also managed. Um, it, it, is, it is a complex um, situation. Um, what I am really um, what I'm really concerned is that we are placing a massive onus on security officers um, to yeah. Um, who already are required to use their professional judgment yeah. uh, in real time based on the situation presented to them, um, uh, applying processes which uh, would be uh, unreasonable, would pose an unreasonable burden on them. Mm. I, I, look, and I think the security staff in this building do an incredible job considering the nature of the work and, and the people in this building. I have the utmost respect for them. And in a sense, some of the policy review would be about making sure that they were protected as well. Um, you know, it comes, there's two sides to, or two reasons why you, you would look at it from, from both the side of someone in the building and the security staff themselves. Um, but, so I'm not actually making the point in a criticism of of DPS. I'm actually just trying to understand whether you have looked at it and whether there are matters which have been highlighted by the incident which would, you know, cause you to review policies or change policies or put in place another way of managing. There's, there can't be that many, you know, particularly through the night where, you know, incidents where you're going to be faced with a similar set of circumstances as Ms Higgins? Mm. Um, I, I acknowledge, mm. Senator, um, and uh, um, you have my assurance that there are processes underway and we are looking at it. Um, it's just that we have not implemented any actual change to right. process okay. or policy at this stage. All right. Yes. Firstly, before I get on to another matter, but did you um, did you discuss with the AFP because both DPS staff and the AFP were in the security in the security room with the cameras, with you know you're, you can see the video feeds. Did you have a discussion with the AFP at that since the incident about changing processes in that you have people on site as does the AFP? Did you discuss with them maybe when? You know, there's a vulnerable person in the building that they are that you know attention is paid to that mm. because obviously your staff saw that happening again what I'll ask the secretary to answer is yeah. the issue around have there been discussions with the AFP given the shared space mm. about yes. without reference to the incident though because again, and, I'm, happy, yeah, and yeah. I'm fine with that because obviously it's post the incident and I presume, for example, that the first response of DPS is no longer going to be that you no, clean not, no, a potential I'm, crime Senator, scene, Senator Kitching, which is I'm what not, happened. Senator Kitching, I'm, that was your first, I'm, the first I'm, reaction. Do, do, not, do not say that. Do the first assert. reaction. You Senator, had cleaning Senator crews. Kitching. You are just, just attention-grabbing. You have no, no basis not. on which to assert that. 
and you are making assertions me. to Senator officials. Senator Kitchen, allow the witness to answer the question. You are making assertions to officials. It astonishes me. That Senator you are Ryan. making assertions to officials Come on, we that don't all know have that the that capacity, wasn't great. that do not have the capacity to fairly anyway, respond. Around the AFP, because we're going to run out of time. Yeah, so um, there haven't been any specific um, discussions in that regard. No discussions with the AFP in that regard, really. Um, we're, we're not talking about the active monitoring um, of, of a situation, um, Senator. It's. Um, the the issue would be more of a response once um, uh, once it's become clear that there is an incident. Um, have you had discussions? And I hate to think the answer is going to be no. Have you had discussions with finance, given that they administer? And I think that was your word at the last estimates in March that they had administrative control of the ministerial wing. Have you had discussions with finance in regard to changes of policies and procedures? No. No, of course. Um, just a couple more on question 115. Um, my question was, is the Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services satisfied his department did all it could to have maintained a safe place for work for Ms Brittany Higgins, and the answer was workplace safety matters for ministerial staff employed under the members of the Parliamentary Staff Act are the responsibility of the Department of Finance. So am I to take from that that DPS sees that they have no duty at all to ministerial staff at the, in the building at any time? Um, um, no, I wouldn't say that, um, Senator. Uh, the, the role of our security staff um, is uh, a screening function uh, to ensure that people who are authorised to, to enter the building can do so. Um, they also have a responsibility to uh, respond um, to an incident uh, that becomes uh, uh, a, a serious incident as it becomes apparent. Um, so certainly in that respect, um, that would apply to all occupants of, of Parliament House, not just the ministerial wing. So it's an interesting, and it, it follows on from Senator Kitching's point though, doesn't it? Because Department of Finance essentially is where people s send their pay slip, you know, their timesheets and stuff. It's a you know, it's really a paper-based relationship. There's not Department of Finance people wandering around this building, um, you know, looking after the work, health and safety of them. DPS are on site here with staff in the building, but you're saying outside of screening or responding to incidents, there is no other responsibility on DPS to keep people in, safe in their workplace. Senator, it's an interesting one for no, perhaps you again, and you and finance to take up. Well, Senator Gallagher, I, again, I, I, I don't agree with your conclusions or summary or interpretation of what the secretary has said. Where well, he has it tried to outline a particularly unique and challenging workplace with different sources of authority in different parts of the building. So I don't think, with respect, the secretary was can be fairly characterised as you were saying. He was saying that's all the DPS job is. Um, he was outlining specifically what the job of the security team is in that part of the building. Mm. But there's a security framework in place for this building too, yes. isn't it? So, and there's responsibilities for DPS under that. Like it, it goes beyond what just individual security staff may or may not do in the course of the day. Is that right? Th there's an overarching security framework for the building, which, as you can imagine, Senator Gallo is quite extensive. I, yeah, I, I and so the, pro the presiding officers and DPS do have responsibilities there. We and have, so we've agreed that. Uh, as I said, Senator Gallo, this building has um, unique arrangements whereby there are different effective sources of administrative authority in different parts of the building. Yeah. For example, I have very little knowledge of um, what goes on on the House of Representatives side, unless it needs to be brought to my attention. Mm. And similarly, um, on Senate side matters, they are 
sometimes dealt with without the knowledge but of this, the speaker. But this is part of the problem, isn't it? This goes exact. This goes this, to the, 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 part of the problem that's been highlighted in the most tragic way by this case, is that there are different different authorities that different make it hard, authorities difficult to administer. navigating. I agree. And then in this instance, a young woman in the middle of that, who we can all, I think, agree that was let down that night. I'm not, again, as I said, Senator Gallagher, I would, I could freely answer some of the questions and agree with or respond to some of the assertions. I cannot do that in this forum without potentially putting at risk. And that goes to any conclusion about facts on the evening. Okay. What I can say, as you know, is that we all share the concern that that process needs to be allowed to follow unimpeded. Um, just quickly, Labor senators have had about an hour. Yeah, I've got one final question and that will finish it for me. Okay, thanks, Senator Gallagher. So to um, Mr Stefanik, are you satisfied your department did all it could um, to maintain a safe place for Ms Higgins that night? Senator, I believe um, out of any situation there's always an opportunity to learn um, and to uh, make improvements. Um, so I certainly think that this would be, this would certainly f fall into that category. Um, to say we would learn nothing from this process um, would be foolish. Um, but as, as I said to you, Senator, we are looking at matters of process and, and policy. Um, and. Uh, what we what we know and what we've learned from it um, uh, is feeding into that. But you've changed nothing yet, but you might make changes. To uh, yes. Well, those changes, if they will come forward to the you know, appropriation staff and security committee of both chambers, mm -hmm. as you are aware, Senator, there was a very extensive inquiry into DPS and its actions in response to anonymous correspondence last year. Senators are aware of that. That was an extensive and comprehensive inquiry. So, But that was in response to concerns that were raised. It wasn't a self-initiated, oh, you know, department-led... It, it oh, hang on. It was, it was in response to correspondence that was anonymous that contained serious allegations. Yeah, and we sure. thought should... As I've said before, yeah. it was referred to the police, and when they came yeah. back to us and, and they said, you can progress your own inquiry, we did. So I yeah. think it's fair to say there have been work has been undertaken. I, I However, would. no, there hasn't been a change yet because, um, in, in, in formal policies and procedures. If such a change is to be brought forward, it will come forward to the Chamber Committees on Staffing and Security, mm. um, and those matters are under discussion. Yep. Yes. But w we can discuss any matter here. I mean, I... I Part of what you're pushing back on is that we are involved in discussions in other forums, but those forums aren't public. No, and that's but that uh, as I've made clear, so and Senator Geller, as I've made clear, there are some things that we do not discuss in public. For example, if we were changing the security protocols in this building, I wouldn't go into great detail of them in a public forum. Yeah, and I'm not asking. You I know. To. So my point is, there are some things that are appropriate to be discussed mm -hmm. privately. Where I can't discuss things publicly, in this case because of an active police investigation of potential legal action that may follow. Mm. As you know, that has been discussed in the appropriate fora, and there are two other where that has been dealt with. Mm. I think part of, you know, part of what I was trying to get at today is to understand whether, you've ha whether DPS had a cold, hard look at what went on and whether they've made any changes since, because the question on notice said they hadn't. Now, you began today by saying there hadn't been any changes, and now we're in the world where there are things underway and there might be changes I and I guess we'll find out about those in the future. discussions have been had, but no formal change in policy has occurred yet. Can I just ask one question? Yes, very quickly, Senator um, Kitching. Senator Wright, do you think it's appropriate that two years later DPS has still not interacted with either the AFP or with the Department of Finance? I don't think that fairly characterises the, what Mr Stefanik said. Mr been... Stefanik said that there had been no interaction on policies and procedures with the AFP or with the Department of Finance. No, I don't think... I think your question was narrower than that. Um, I'll, I'll ask Mr... St if we, maybe this Do is an think important a... point to clarify. I don't think what you're saying is true. OK, Mr Stefanik, have another go. 
and we can all read well, the Hansard okay, later on. But Senator Kitchener, I thought your question was specifically about the shared space with respect to the viewing of active footage. And policies and procedures in that space yep. and in relation to the, minister, the finance department and interactions. And Mr Stefanik said no, there had been no okay. interactions. So, so my question was not narrower than that. No, well, the first question was about the shared space and the CCTV. And we know, the second do you one, think it's appropriate? So you've taken into, you've taken I, in, I'm, I'm in what Mr Stefanik has said. Is it appropriate, is it appropriate that DPS has not acted in those regards in two years? No, I don't think that's a fair characterisation of the answer. You, you, you're asking, firstly, your question was about has there been interaction? There is regular interaction. In relation and, to and policies Senator and Kitching, procedures, there has not Senator been. Kitching, please I think, allow the I think the president answer. understands the, the question no, and he's just not answering the, it. I'm trying to answer the please question, answer. but I won't get four or five words out. There no. has not been a discussion with the government of the day about formally renegotiating the MOU of 1987 or 88 that actually underpins the administration of this building. I will say that there has not been. Um, so no one thought that maybe the policies and procedures of the shared space. Let's just limit it to the shared security room that the AFP and DPS staff share, security mm. staff share, they are there 24-7, mm. correct, yes, and no one has thought to look knowing that they actually saw that night on camera what was happening I'm not entirely in sure the corridors. I'm not entirely sure if, that's, if that can be asserted. Um, I'm and no one's done anything I'm since then. I'm not entirely then. sure, Senator Kitching, if that is actually true. Um, Mr. Entirely... Will that view contradict Mr. Stefani? I'm not entirely sure if the your question. assertion there is correct. Um, there are regular and ongoing discussions and changes about security arrangements in this building, and I've said to you that in this committee that the Speaker and I and the Secretary have had conversations about changing security arrangements. But not we... with the AFP, according to the Secretary. Um, we, I, um, we... You might have had them, and I'm glad you have, but the Secretary seems to be incredibly inactive and there have been oh, no Senator discussions Kitching. with, the, you're, you're with making, finance. No, making, You've said finance controls the ministerial wing. Administratively responsible, I think, is the best way to describe it. Um, you haven't had any discussions with finance, is what Mr Stefanik, and I'm asking and you... And that's, that's underpinned I'm by, asking you whether yeah. you think that is well, appropriate. Well, that, that, that arrangement is underpinned by a 30-year-old MOU. Um, that was set up... Really, with finance? With, Senator with, with the Department of Finance. The, the arrangements between... Yes, Senator O'Sullivan. With this, with Senator Kitching, Senator O'Sullivan. I asked a very simple Senator question, o, Chair. Senator O'Sullivan's just called. And I'm asking for an answer. Senator O'Sullivan has just called a point of order. I'm just point going to order. listen to no, him I'd to I'd his like point to of order. I'd like to hear the answers to the questions that, that Senator Kitching is putting. And you've asked her to not interrupt the witness, but that continues to happen. Thank you, really? Senator You're defending O'Sullivan. this? You want to defend Senator, this? I want to actually hear the response. S Senator, Senator Kitching. Do you think it's... Let me rephrase my question okay. so it's clear. And then leave Mr. a nice long break for the witness to answer it, please. Mr President, do you think it's appropriate that DPS has not consulted with the AFP since the alleged rape in 2019, with the AFP with whom they, shared, shares, they have shared space with in the security room? Do you think it is appropriate, as Mr Stefanik has just admitted, that he has not consulted with the Department of Finance about what happens in the ministerial wing? Is that appropriate? Oh, I'm gonna... That's a yes or no, no question. No, actually, you don't get to tell me how I answer questions, Senator Kitching. You should remember that from the chamber. Well, I don't get to tell people that I'd like either. an answer. Um, the arrangements with that ministerial wing are set by an MOU that predates all of us. Maybe that's a good point. We should look at it. The Speaker Maybe and I should. should look at it and actually look at arrangements in the building. I have actually read it, but it is a very old arrangement that no one has sought to change. Um, there are ongoing discussions um, with the AFP. With respect to the shared space, I'm not aware of them. but to try and characterise there being no discussions with the AFP about security arrangements in the building over the last two years. I don't think that is a fair characterisation of what the Secretary said. And I'm, I'm happy to let him correct me if he, if he thinks I've mischaracterised his evidence. Well, I don't think he would be correcting you. I think he would be clarifying the evidence he gave, which is contrary to your, the evidence you've just given. If it's contrary, it'll be corrected on the record. I, Senator Kitching, do not think it's contrary to what... I, 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 your question to me in the first instance, as I said, was specific about the shared space with the CCTV. I disagree with an assertion you made about, um, about what may or may not have been viewed there, because um, I, I don't know. With respect to the Department of Finance, OK, your point is taken. I have, a, I have responded. I think maybe we should all look at the MOU, and that's actually a reasonable point. It is a very old MOU. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just, just uh, very quickly, well, Senator Gallagher. Well, just Gallaher. to follow up, uh, okay. Mr. President, I think you, took, you said you would come back. 
um, to me, if you could quickly, on the time DPS contacted finance on the 23rd of March, 2019. When I get a chance to get out of the room and consult, I will. Right, oh, right, so you, you took it on notice. I thought I kind of took from it that you would go have a look. You know. I know, I, I, my view with respect to those questions I took on notice is that we will seek advice on whether or not it crosses the line in the statement I gave the committee okay. on the 1st of April. Including, but I will endeavour to do it quickly. All right, including the interactions leading to the cleaning of the suite as well. Um, I, again, I'll, I, I said I would take those and come back to yep. the committee as soon as I could upon seeking advice. I'm aware that Senator Kitchen has some questions about ICT and some of I would like to share it around this. if that's um, so all right. Come back to that. A long if, chunk yep. on that. Senator Waters. Um, just to stay on this matter, first up, um, three months ago I asked in the chamber, following some reporting, uh, that the alleged rapist of Brittany Higgins had been back in the building. And the information I received was that uh, he was not using a lobbyist pass and therefore he would have needed to have been signed in to access the building. I then asked about the details of a specific event that it was reported that he was at. And the information is that there was no formal record of that event. Um, so I am at a loss to understand how it is that um, an alleged rapist could have been uh, back in the building and how it is that we know, um, how can we know who signed him in and whether that person was aware that in fact um, he was an alleged rapist. And I, I'm progressing this issue through the um, Appropriations Committee, so I'm after an update on how can the information about um, when alleged rapists access the building um, be made available to senators who are concerned about that. What I would say is, I'm not going to use the terminology, I'm not certain of the date off the top of my head you're referring to. I do remember the question on notice and I did come back to you saying there was no record of the event, of, of, the, of attendance list at the event. Um, as you know, um, advice was received from the clerk and discussed at the Appropriations Staffing and Security Committee meeting last week. Um, I have been advised by uh, that committee where one of your Greens Party colleagues was at, um, Senator Waters, as you advised me, that I am uh, now empowered to circulate that advice and the determination of the committee to the Speaker. So, because the statement I made in the Chamber related to the fact that it was difficult to um, see how the Senate might order the publication of information that related to a member of the House, if it indeed was a member of the House. Um, and I've I will be communicating that to the Speaker today. That happened Friday afternoon, um, along with a copy of the advice from our clerk. I've also been advised that at the next meeting of that committee, um, I'll, there will probably be a motion put forward that specifically refers to this information. And the committee, I'm not at liberty to you know, determine how the committee will attend to it, the committee will attend to that. Uh, the complicating factor is that um, the House is administered jointly. And so where we have information, where a senator or a member signs someone in, we effectively treat that as the clerk's advice outlines as information owned by that senator or member. So some senators and members, in my view, with good reason, have a belief that they would not want all these registers to be made public, whether that be meeting potential whistleblowers or, in some cases, people meeting community groups or um, groups of um, citizens with a particular multicultural background where there's a contentious international issue, people feel at risk. So the House and the Senate um, would need to come to, uh, in my view, a a joint view, or the committees, we've re and I think that's a reasonable way to view it, on, on how to access this information. What I have made clear repeatedly, though, privately, and I'll say it again publicly, is if um, the authorities come to us to request information that is relevant to a law enforcement investigation, that is information that it would be the intention of the Speaker and I to treat as we have other information we've been asked for by law enforcement authorities to inform a relevant senator or member this information it was our intention to provide to police for the official purpose. So um, that, I appreciate, doesn't address what you want, Senator Waters, um, but I am not, um, it, I don't have the capacity to unilaterally address your, mm. act on your request. Can I ask whether the police have asked you or the speaker for that information? Um, I did have a conversation, and 
prior to this, um, and while I will say that um, we have acted on every request that's come before the presiding officers and approved it, the release of the information, I, I don't think it appropriate that I go into the content of what the police have requested um, and the information that we have provided to them in the course of any, any and I again make my comments generally, in any criminal investigation. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any move to make the sign-in process a more easily searchable process going forwards? Um, so we did do a, it was looked at when this EAC system prior to my time was put in place, whether or not an electronic system could be used that you know, people might be familiar with at large corporates or you know, um, departments where you sign in, you get a little printed black and white or colour badge that you wear, maybe sometimes with a barcode. At the time, um, it was determined that that was not feasible given the volumes of people we have, uh, particularly at peak times of the day. And in hindsight, with the COVID restrictions on spacing, since we've reopened the building, I can imagine the queues would have run well out the door. Um, but the secretary might be at more liberty to talk about limitations because that is something we can look at again. But it was looked at when the system was put in place and it was deemed to not be entirely practical. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just interested in the, the time saving difference. I wouldn't have thought there'd be much difference in a manual writing down of someone's um, name than a manual typing in of someone's name, which uh, was then yes. more readily searchable. Um, the, the complexity the um, President's referring to was um, an identity um, system was uh, originally planned for integration with the electronic access system when it was uh, rolled out. Um, but it was just deemed to th the system that was being proposed. Um, we were provided with another reference site where it um, was in place um, and it required um, a time intensive process and we, the, the reference sites didn't have the volume um, that we have, um, particularly on sitting days with visitors entering the building. Um, and that was the only option that was put forward so we decided not to complicate the um, the the electronic access system with that. Um, we are, however, now looking at a simpler system that stands alone. It's, it doesn't attach to the electronic access system. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a matter of looking at a system that will be quick, um, but will provide, um, um, I guess, the same level of assurance as we, we currently have with and, the existing manual system. And I would add, Senator, that the development of any such electronic system would require the development of a policy, like mm. the CCTV mm. and EX policy, which have both been relatively, I might say, a little contentious on the sen in the Senate, um, in order to govern uh, viewing, access and publication of such yes. provision of such information. Yes. Um, Mr Stephanie, just conscious that I've got a few other issues I want to cover, would, could you provide on notice a bit more detail about the investigations that you're undertaking in relation to that standalone system, just where it's at, what sort of time frames you're working at, uh, working to, um, yes, as much as you're I'll, able I'll to tell me on notice this. would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, can I move now to um, budget night revelry? It was reported that on budget night um, a whole bunch of incredibly wealthy people were invited uh, to attend a budget party in the Great Hall. Um, how much did that event cost and who paid for it? I'd like to take that on notice. I mean, that, 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 that essentially is done as a commercial it's room hire and catering. Um, so we'll provide the information consistent with we normally take such questions on notice. I can recall answering similar queries before. Okay. Um, is that is it a public expense or would that have been no, a no. privately funded it was a, endeavour? It would be privately funded. The room's hired um, and so then the catering is paid for. Okay. I'm so was any taxpayer money expended on I that doubt. event? No, it's, usually a, it's usually actually a bit of a money making. Um, yeah, typically for, well, so DPS Ward uh, manages the, the events in the building. Um, so uh, DPS would generate revenue from the hire of the Great Hall uh, and from the um, food and beverage service uh, offered there. Um, typically, particularly with large events, they will be, um, they will be private uh, events that are booked well, well in advance. Okay, so in this instance, was it a private event that was booked? I'll have to come back to you, Senator. I don't have the information. Okay. I'm almost, we'll get you the information. I'm almost certain it was a standard booking for events that happen in the Great Hall. 
um, in this case, I imagine it was the coalition budget night dinner, I think. Yes, anyway, okay. So colleagues. does the coalition pay for that, not the taxpayer? Well, with DPS, um, I would assume so, but because I, I, if I recall correctly, people had to pay to go. Is that correct? I'm looking, I didn't go, I'm looking at my colleagues. Um, and so therefore they pay us for the space and the catering and the security. So we actually, it's a, we effectively, it's a, um, a centre of revenue for DPS. Okay. What, how the 600 people turn up, 500 people turn up and pay, I imagine it's a combination of... Okay, so all of those people pay to attend? Well, we don't, again, we don't... We don't, yeah, we don't administer a booking system. Um, the coalition, I assume, through some system, ran its own booking system and took payment. DPS runs, a fun in, in that sense, it is a function venue. So a bill is issued, and I'm looking into it around, for um, function, room hire and catering and security by us, and it's paid. We okay. don't administer individual tickets or bookings or anything like that. So surely the money raised um, would be probably more than just the room hire. What happens to the excess money? Who gets that? This building um, has, has had functions for all of its three decades that have been used um, as um, services rendered by DPS and paid for uh, by the hirer, and what, that, that, that's the extent of DPS involvement. Okay, so if there was any additional fundraising that went on in the evening, um, that money wouldn't have gone to DPS once your costs were met? We send any them, private we, fundraising? We send them an invoice, is that essentially? And then they pay us. Okay. So, um, should I... Would Department of Finance know more about this or is it solely the province of, of DPS to hire out the function space? Mm, yeah. Um, I imagine it will be solely um, ours. So, so typically, uh, if, if um, an event organiser wants to um, hire a venue uh, within Parliament House, they will contact APH Catering and Events, mm -hmm. which is the brand for DPS's um, food and beverage operation. Uh, and then the events coordinator there um, would organise um, with the hirer um, for what their requirements were for the event. Um, so we issue a quote. Um, that is a quote for the hire of the venue and then a quote for the, say, per head cost mm -hmm. um, uh, of providing food and beverage services. Uh, and that, that is what we invoice mm -hmm. if that quote is accepted. Um, whatever is charged for that event, um, whatever revenue is generated is a matter for the hirer. Uh, DPS doesn't have any involvement in that at okay. all. So who paid the bill to DPS then, the coalition? Well, that, that, that's something we'll have to check, who booked it and the invoice was issued to and who paid it. We, can, we just don't have that on hand. But yes. yeah, we can get that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Are you system. able to get that today? Well, we'll have a look. I'll look at past answers where um, I think we have provided all this information and mm -hmm. I'm looking around at senators of all parties. We have provided all the information on who books and how okay. much it costs, so I don't expect it to be an issue. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just with the attendees, um, you're saying they pay to attend um, and there's no public money expended on facilitating their attendance, if I'm correctly um, following your previous no. answer. Yeah, no, no, no money Do they the travel GS. to the building at their own expense also? Well, again, that... I, I can't comment on how they get here, um, like in the sense that some of them may be attending on behalf of their corporate, corporate or on behalf of an NGO or on behalf of a political party and they may be paid to attend, they may be paid to come along, their cab fares and planes paid but for. But not by the tax, I'm just interested no, in taxpayer dollars. Well, the, we can respond to the Department of Parliamentary Services. No Department of Parliamentary Services money um, is used in funding that event or supporting attendance at it. Okay. Would there be a different department's money who have, could be used? And if it, so, who are they? And I'll go and ask them as well. Just genuinely. Department, then that should yeah, be Senator pursued Wood, I, Off the top of my head, I don't one. think so, but I can't assert something. I, okay. I don't want to mislead inadvertently by saying, no, no, and I, just I guarantee no one attended. the answer, yeah. hence I'm asking the question. It's not a then, trap. Quite frankly, the easiest way would be to do would be to, to simply a question on notice or a verbal question to every department. Great. And I've got nothing better to do. I know. I just... <laughs> I try to help. Okay, thank you. Um, I will follow that up and I appreciate you coming back to me if possible today with your responses to those earlier questions. So my last um, uh, portion is about the media contact policy that I, I um, have got your opening yep. statement regarding. Um, why was the decision made to revise the policy to prevent staff speaking to the media? It was in June last year. It was determined it needed to be. Yes. Um, so the, the, the policy that was in place was at a fairly high level. Um, it didn't really provide guidance on what staff could and couldn't do. 
um, um, among other things, Amelia identified that I was the only spoke, I or my delegate were the only spokes um, people for the department. Um, it, it was triggered by, um, so in terms of factual situ situation, the, the review of the policy was triggered because um, a, a journalist had contacted one of our staff that was a contact officer for an Austender notice. Uh, and that person um, gave advice to that journalist without being aware that they're not authorised to speak. Um, so that um, highlighted that we actually were providing limited guidance to our staff on how they should manage um, those sort of conversations. Um, so there actually was an event that, that did trigger that review. And what, sorry, what was the date of that um, inquiry by the journalist? So that was back in uh, June... Oh, it may have been before June 2020, but I don't have okay. the actual okay. date of that um, inquiry. Um, and you did go through who you consulted with, um, so I'm across that. Um, was there any input received from other departments, namely the PMNC, um, or from the Prime Minister or any other relevant ministers for that matter? Um, I don't believe there would have been um, any direct output, but normally when we develop policies, we'll usually cast across other agencies for consistency. Uh, saves reinventing the wheel, but mm. also makes sure that we are consistent with okay. what the Okay, so you checked their doing. policies, but they wouldn't have had input into yours. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Um, was any advice sought about the interaction of the policy with whistleblower protections that are available to DPS staff? Um, I don't believe so, no. Um, it, it, because it's entirely different. Um, it, it's really a mechanism to give guidance. Um, D despite the publicity around it, it was not developed with a view to it being a stick. Um, it was really to provide um, uh, an educational tool for for our staff. Okay. If um, the rev when did when did the revised policy take force? Seventeenth of March. Seventeenth of yeah. March. This year. This year. Okay. So if it had have been in place, would the security staff member who spoke with Four Corners mm. regarding the alleged rape of Brittany Higgins have been able to speak? Mm. Uh, uh, no. How interesting. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I'm going to go back to uh, the cyber security issue that took place, um, if I may. Um, uh, you've answered some of my questions in your opening statement, so thank you yep. very much for that. Um, uh, the, the reports on the incident talked about an external provider. I presume, based on your statement, that was Mobiltron? Uh, which, what, can you read the quote? Sorry, Senator Patrick. Well, it said two, the incident couple... apparently related to an uh, attempted at intrusion in relation to an external provider. That's what's been reported. Uh, uh, yes, that's the... Um, um the, the old mobile iron. Yeah, sorry, um, mobile iron. Mobile sorry. iron, the okay, old software. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. You said that the the attack went for 24 hours. Um, I, I wonder if you could tell me how far into that attack it took to respond, and then how long we were without services. Okay, um, so can I? The different numbers. Yeah, so. What I said, I, I'm not going to go much further than what I said in that opening statement. They are, that's, um, we've had some consultations about where it's appropriate to go. Sure. Um, I'll let the uh, officials talk through without re detailing any information that would in any way, in my view, make it someone figure out how we responded. That's sure. part of the issue. Um, as I've said repeatedly, I did, I did go into some detail on this last Friday, and I'm happy to do that privately with you, Senator Patrick. Um, but the hassles that you and I experienced as we were being mm. um, transitioned over to a new system in three days, not three months, uh, several months earlier, they were not related to the attack. Sure. I understand that. Yep. So I'll ask the officials to do it in broad terms, but without indicating how we responded to the extent that would you know, essentially be potentially information valuable to someone sure. that likes to cause trouble. Gary Hayes with uh, Assistance, Acting Assistant Secretary, Cyber Security Branch. Uh, Senator, would you mind? Uh, so I was just interested in uh, the the attack went for 24 hours. So the malicious uh, attack. Um, how far into that period did you recognise you were and respond? Senator, it was within several hours of being of of identifying that we were under attack. We had mitigations in place. 
um, which was preventing any more um, potential intrusions into the network. Okay, you said that uh, it's been stated that it was an unsophisticated brute force trade craft. That doesn't necessarily indicate that it's a sophisticated or that it's not a sophisticated player or actor that is doing that. So I just want to understand... Is you it will appreciate, as I've said before, um, attribution or otherwise um, is, not, we're not, is not something I, I think the presiding officers should do. Um, it's something that is a matter that uh, I think of the national interest, if it was that relevant. Um, it's also a matter of us knowing certain things um, and whether we know or not mm. is another <coughs> relevant fact. Um, so in that regard, I've said, and I think I've gone into some detail about the type of the attack, probably more than I have been able to previously. OK, so where I'm trying to get to is in responding to these attacks, clearly there is the activity that takes place at a technical level. There's also policing responses to these sorts of attacks. I presume they're unlawful. Um, and that's where I'm trying to get to. In, you know, is, this some, is this some kid sitting in a room uh, in Perth uh, uh, conducting an unsophisticated attack and uh, it is the intention to um, identify this person and charge them? Um, law enforcement's a matter for the law enforcement authorities, not a matter for the presiding officers. What I can say is that this is one of the single most prominent sites for harassment in the country. Sure. And um, it has quite extensive, um, you know, arrangements in place because of the extensive harassment that takes place. But I think you're, if you've got a question about law enforcement, Senator Patrick, it should go to the law enforcement. Well, I'm not authorities. asking how, how law enforcement would be conducted, simply that, um, it, that it's your expectation that in circumstances where you might be able to identify a player, I have every confidence and the extensive discussions with um, that our officials and the Speaker and I have with our agencies. Uh, if anything, um, I am very happy with those arrangements and they are complementary about the standards and the um, uh, ca capacity of DPS given the scale of the problems we face. Um, but whether, you know, there is to be um, or the actions of law enforcement agencies are up to law enforcement agencies. Well, not, respectfully, not to us. respectfully, Mr. President, if my house is robbed, um, I, I can deal with you know, the events as they're occurring, but the decision to press charges rests with me. Not really. In most cases, it actually rests with the um, charging agency. In, sure. In a real well, sense. It's not like in, it's, sure. it's a very uh, different environment in Australia. But um, I think, Senator Patrick, we need to accept that the the, the, the a, such a prominent network as this is not like your house being burgled, because you don't expect your house to be burgled every hour. Sure. A network like this is a very attractive proposition. Sure. And, and one of the ways of making it less attractive is to pursue the, 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 the attacker, and uh, I assuming they are within jurisdiction I, of the of I'm of, not going to get Australian into anything around that, because well, it, it, it goes does to, go, it goes well, to attri well. potential attribution. I don't think that's appropriate well, for me to do. Well, but there's a, there's a balance that has to be struck here. If you say, um, if you're putting on the record that you're not going to, uh, that, that it's not of your concern... I didn't uh, say that. ...as to the... Well, that's what I'm... I think it's a, it is if of the public interest. If you're asking whether I'm concerned, I'm very concerned. OK. Um, and if you're, if you're asking... And so now me, I'm saying, what are you doing about it? Well, well, well actually, you know, despite the attention-seeking, we have had an extensive discussion around this, particularly last Friday, in an appropriate forum. There is incredible resourcing that goes into protecting this network. The agencies are actually very happy, given what happened several years ago, about what this network does, its capabilities, and how it protects itself. And the last one, as I said, um, that while it was an unsophisticated brute force type of attack, there was no um, penetration of the network. No, I understand So that. don't try and say that because I'm not going to answer a question about what the law enforcement agencies want to do means I don't care. And I do. And every senator and member needs to. But what we also have to not learn is that these sorts of um, no. hassles in using the network are actually never going to end. There's no end point where we have a network that never has grief because someone causes it trouble. And I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. Um, let's try and reframe this in a different way. Um, has anyone ever been, has, uh, to your knowledge, has anyone been prosecuted for attempting to 
interfere with our IT systems? Not to my knowledge. Not that okay. I would be aware, but not to my knowledge. No. It just seems to me that's a, that's a void. Isn't it? Yeah. It, it's, you know, part of the deterrent is people ought to know that if they wish to you know, attack the, the parliamentary system, there is some possibility that law enforcement will follow I'm not going to get into a backdoor discussion of attribution. Mm. We, we work quite closely with the um, Australian Cyber Security Centre, Senator. Mm. Um, they, they are always advised within hours of us having an issue. Um, obviously, they're part of the Australian Signals Directorate. Um, um, but we would rely on them uh, and whatever security intelligence... Um, uh, laws are in place to pursue uh, any attacker um, that they uh, identify. Um, that, that's something we don't have the capability to, to manage or to identify. Oh, all right, so, so we're getting somewhere. Um, you're suggesting that if you, know, you engage the Cyber Security Centre and uh, they would make a determination as to whether or not to pursue it as a police matter, I mean, clearly if it's a state actor or it's someone overseas sitting in you know, uh, an overseas jurisdiction, um, that, that can potentially make it harder, but, but you say it's not your, res not your responsibility, and that's okay, I can go elsewhere and, and seek answers to this, uh, as to, to what are the consequences of conducting these sorts of attacks. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I, I don't have any sort of further information. But, but to, you, to you say it's not, your, it's not within your responsibility to do that. You talk to the Cyber Security Centre and they... Uh, make those sorts of decisions based on evidence, based on what, what they know. I think, Senator Patrick, it's a reflection of the fact that in this particular world, the idea of comparing it to a break-in of your house and reporting it to the police is, is, is simply not realistic. Sure. Um, we work with the authorities, the agencies, extensively to protect the network. Um, protection of the network is paramount. Secondary is usability of the network. Um, so I don't think it's fair to characterise what the Secretary said as, uh, in, in that way, or summarise it in that way. No, no, I wasn't actually yeah. attempting to characterise anything, I was just trying to get an understanding of who might take responsibility for the follow-up in the circumstances where a breach has occurred. Oh, um, I, I, and the problem with this, Senator Patrick, is it gets into the whole idea of, as you alluded to in your question, um, it gets into the whole concept of your knowledge or lack of it, of where it comes from, and I don't think that is a conversation that should be had in the public domain. All oh, right, well, I mean, there will be circumstances where you may or may not know. Um, uh, if I accept there are circumstances where you may know, the, the question is, do you pursue uh, that in, a, in, 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 re in respect of law enforcement? Um, I, again, the relevant authorities are aware... Removing that from any particular no, attack. It, it's, it, Senator Patrick, it's impossible to me for me to not say something here which can be easily misrepresented. We. Um, we deal with the agencies and the authorities about these matters. I don't think a comparison with being broken into your home is, and reporting it to the police is a realistic one. Um, and I'm not going to get into even a discussion that would allow someone to try and presume from what I say or don't say the issue of attribution. Yeah, well, uh, but because your question there's does There's another go aspect to that. to that, and that is, that is um, ensuring that uh, people are doing their jobs in, in relation to... Uh, uh, Deterring this sort of stuff from occurring. That's, there's, that's no shortage, all, that's there's, the there's no shortage. Of pe there's no shortage of people who do this. There's no shortage of people queuing up for this building's network either. As I said at the start, this is one of the. I, more I know that. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to find out about what you do about these people. Well, actually, I don't think anyone's cracked that nut, Senator Patrick. I don't think okay. anyone can say there's a great deterrence to this because it's actually very um, widespread globally. We've got networks in Australia sure. that have been subject to it. So. Um, Again, everyone is doing their job, and their job meant this time the network wasn't penetrated. All right, I'll go back to... I've got a couple of quick questions on this matter. Uh, sure, yeah. Senator Patterson, if that's all Thank right. you. Um, Ms President, I just want to return to this um, issue of the language that Senator Patrick raised about the tradecraft being described as an unsophisticated brute force attempt to um, enter the network. I think some people might have inadvertently drawn the conclusion based on that language um, that unsophisticated brute force implies an unsophisticated actor. Is that intended to be conveyed by that statement? The statement I means um, it's a language we actually get from the people we work with. Um, mm. Exactly what it says, it was, it, I don't think people should extrapolate anything from it mm. um, other than it, it meaning exactly what it says, but I hadn't thought of what you said earlier, so that um, is not an interpretation I had. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, brute force is a characterization of the technique, um, not a characterization of the attacker. Mm. And I may pursue this with um, ASD separately next week when they appear before Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Um, but it is the case, isn't it, that sophisticated actors use a range of tools available to them to try and enter systems, uh, including unsophisticated tools, because sometimes they work. Uh, my understanding, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Um, just one other matter. Um, uh, Mr Sevnik, you said that when um, these sort of incidents occur, DPS always notifies the ACSC. Um, did DPS notify the ACSC this, in this instance? Uh, yes, we did. Um, and was it DPS that first notified the ACSC or were they aware by other means? Uh, I believe we contacted ACSC once uh, we'd identified that there was an issue, but I'll let Mr Ays, but... Um... Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, we, we contacted the ACSC. I, I may um, understand the ACSC may have become aware of it through other channels, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we did make contact with the ACSC. I just want to um, not go into too much detail in this forum for obvious reasons about how the ACSC might have become aware through other channels. Um, why wouldn't the first... Uh, presumably the information about the attack was in the hands of DPS. Shouldn't it have been DPS that first advised the ACSC, not anyone else? Can I say there are some things here we... I, I don't want to go into in the public understand what I'm trying not that to avoid actually, that as well. That may um, that. It's actually safer not to answer that question in a public domain. Okay. Can I just then ask about the protocols um, for notification? What are they um, and how quickly are they put into place when an incident like this occurs? Okay. So can I just confer with the fish? Yes. I just want to make... Um, a few matters to provide the answer with. Uh, Senator, we have a, um, a cyber security operations centre that was stood up a couple of years ago uh, under an NPP. Uh, it's a very capable cyber security uh, operations centre. Our, um, our role is to uh, initially triage and have a look at those incidents ourselves. Um, we get a, a number of um, at, at, at attacks, for want of a better term, uh, and they happen regularly. Um, mm. We, we triage this one. At some point, we decide whether the, we need to notify the ACSC and, and seek their assistance, and that occurs as mm. part of the course. So is information given out by DPS at any other level to any other party before ACSC is notified? Uh, generally speaking, no. Um, we may seek assistance from our technology vendors. Mm. Um, but uh, when it comes to specific cyber security advice, we rely heavily on the ACSC. Okay. I, I won't ask you to come back to me on notice, but can I just encourage you to go back and check exactly in this instance whether information was given out in any other way um, and whether, in fact, ACSC was first notified by DPS or whether they were notified by other means. And I, I don't expect you to come yes. back on notice. Yeah, but there are answers I can't provide. I can provide privately that explain that um, very easily. Yep, OK. And then just finally, uh, Ms President, I appreciate the point you made about attribution being a matter for the executive, and I agree. Um, but just for this committee's knowledge, do you know who um, the actor is in this instance? I'm not going into in that regard of what I know and what I don't. OK. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Back to you, Senator Patrick. OK. So I just want to go back to the uh, security system contracts that yep. we've talked about in the, in, the, in the past. And I thank you for a much more comprehensive answer, Mr President, on... Uh, on, uh, on this contract, um, the, the, the explanation basically provides that, uh, and, and the, just to give a bit of a history of this, there was a $20 million tender. We now know that it's cost $60 million. So I think you've now broken out where, where that additional cost is. Um, so you say that uh, one part of that additional cost is $18 million uh, in what I would call sustainment or the ongoing operation. Uh, how, how many years are, uh, um, is that $18 million um, operation for? How many years does that cover? Uh, Senator Matt O'Brien, I'm the First Assistant Secretary for Finance and Property Services Division. Is your question in relation to the tender? Yes, response? that's correct. Yeah. I believe that's for a period uh, of up to 10 years. So a 10-year contract that, that flows from that. Um, th so the, um, the response was $18.2 million. Has that changed in, in, in actual 
uh, execution of the contract. Has it changed since the answer, or do you mean has well, it been no. numbers before it was so, 18? So that, that was the number they said in the tender. Um, that may have changed to uh, be a new number now that uh, now that you're actually you know, operating the system. Might have gone up, might have gone down. Yeah. Um, so the, the uh, amount expended in relation to maintenance services since November 2018 is approximately 13 million. Okay, so that actually sounds uh, uh, like you're, it's costing a lot more because you've, you've got a 10-year contract for 18 million and, you, and you, we're um, it's at, uh, five years in, four years in, and it's cost 13 million to date. Sorry, I was checking something. Yep. Sorry, sorry, Senator. So it's cost 13 million dollars to date. Um, uh, it's supposed to be a 10-year contract uh, for $18 million, so you've clearly spent a lot more up front. Do you expect the, the current rate of expenditure to be similar? Uh, no, Senator. So the department has taken a decision to uh, insource the longer-term maintenance. Um, that decision, I think, comes into effect in a couple of months' time. Uh, so the capability that we have to support that system will be from within the department. Okay, thank you. Um, now there were two, uh, some additional elements that that um, involved additional cost. Um, one of them was associated with contractual changes required to uh, to increase the scale of the um, ESS, um, which is the electronic security system in response to identified operational requirements. Uh, so an additional $14 million was uh, identified in terms of you know, additional scope. I'm just trying to ha Where I'm coming from in this is that you went to tender, you got a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you made a decision where price clearly had a, an impact. Um, uh, there, there, is, there are some people who work with the Commonwealth knowing they can buy into a contract, they effectively corner you and then, and then add additional cost. So before Mr O'Brien answers, can I say one thing? We just need to be careful about the degree of some of the elements here because they do go to security sure. arrangements in the building. I'm just asking about and the cost. other thing, but, no, the other, but part of it could be used to explain that. Um, mm. The other thing I'll say is that there was changes to this program. Um, it w was there before I came in. It's, mm. I've been there when some changes have been made, which I imagine have incurred extra cost as well. Yeah, so there were $14 million in, in additional scope, and then there was another $10 million uh, that was for unforeseen latent conditions. I don't know what that means. Is that, so it sounds to me like they're warranty issues that would normally be covered under a contract. Um. Um, I'll address the latent conditions um, issue um, before Mr O'Brien gets into it. Um, so latent conditions are um, things that are unknown um, about a building uh, and its infrastructure at the time uh, of a contract being issued. Um, so there, are, there may be difficulties in terms of the services uh, or accessibility um, that, that impact on the contract um, and then require a variation uh, as a result. Okay, so th that raises a problem in itself and that you go to tender having fully scoped out what, what it is that you are seeking to achieve, uh, that that was a, uh, f for the, if you like, the upfront cost was uh, tw uh, $21 million or close to $22 million. But what you're saying is there was $10 million, so another 50% that wasn't contemplated in the original in the original program? Well, I can't speak to it being well before my time, Senator Patrick. Mm. What I will say is having um, spent a lot of time on security upgrades to this building since I became president three and a half years ago, um, there were a lot of issues that needed to be addressed that um, uh, needed to be added to, uh, to use lay language. Um, I found a couple of examples myself where things just um, weren't included in the thing, but I can sort of understand how they weren't. This building is incredibly complex structure with respect to this particular contract. So, um, yes, some of it was things that, if it was being done now, I think people would know because it's been done once. Okay, so how, in the context of negotiation for these contract amendments and for these latent 
conditions, um, have you ensured that you get value for money, noting that uh, the money's gone to the one contractor, uh, who in some sense has a hold because they have uh, provided the, the, the system uh, and you can't walk away from that. Um, Senator, I think the um, the nature of the procurement and the fact that it was that initial $22 million was to undertake a detailed design is an important fact. So um, the scope provided by the department was then um, interpreted by uh, the successful tender and as that process unfolded, um, some things that were not known at the time of the tender arose. That's a driver for the latent conditions. And then there were a series of operational decisions taken by the department, for example, on how many um, doors to apply electronic access to that related to policy for um, capabilities such as lockdown. Sure, so I understand that. So, and that's what we've sort of talked about before. My question went to, as you are adding things, as you are, you know, um, dealing with things you hadn't thought about, noting you are bound uh, to a particular contractor who's provided you with a particular system, how do you achieve, ensure you achieve value for money, um, you know, because there's no competitive t attention? What are the processes you put in place when someone comes with a contract change proposal, uh, presents you with that? How do you ensure you're getting value for money for the taxpayer? So I guess the short answer, um, Senator, is to leverage the initial contract. So the nature of the contract itself, um, if you look at the, the question of scaling up, contained um, prices for different resources and prices for different activities. So as that scale up decision was taken, um, the negotiated contract is leveraged to simply add additional scale. So from that sense, the initial value for money assessment made by the department carries through to that decision making process around scale. Do you, do you have the ability, um, because you're sort of, uh, you, n normally when you have a, a competitive process that, that gives you some assurance about value for money, when you're going to additional content, do you have the ability to cost investigate in respect of those uh, CCPs to, uh, to basically you know, look at their costings uh, after the event and make sure that there's there's not huge profit in there. Um, so, so there's two things. I guess what um, Mr O'Brien was talking about was the schedule of rates. Um, so sure. when the original uh, tenders are assessed, um, obviously those schedules of rates are yeah. considered across You've got a baseline all the rate. tenders. Oh, You've I got a baseline. That. So you um, so you, know, you have a value, value for money assessment that's made at the very early stages. Uh, then, as Mr O'Brien said. Um, those those rates are then applied in in any subsequent variations. Um, the other is, and I am certainly aware in instances where we have um, sought a, um, I think the the phrase is a quantitative uh, assessment uh, of quotes that are received on variations, um, where we get an independent party um, verify the cost that's the quote that's been provided to establish whether it actually is reasonable. But, but just then, this, this is my final question. Just in relation to the contract amendments, does the contract permit you to cost investigate? That is to go in and look at the books and and ensure that you know there's a, re a, a reasonable profit margin, but not excessive, and that costs are reasonable. Yeah. I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Patrick, Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, Chair. Um, this is not a hard and fast number, but roughly how many Australians would come to Parliament House on a on a normal year, um, including school children, the public, and, and of course visitors, lobbyists. Um, so pre pre COVID, um, yeah. roughly eight hundred thousand uh, people a year. Eight hundred thousand per annum. Does that, does that um, doesn't include pass holders, does it? That's it doesn't include no, pass holders. That's only visitors. Public that, visitors. That's just the public. So pass holders would be would, uh, would be additional to that. That would be all visitors to to Parliament House, whether it's for business or tourism. Um, yep. But it excludes pass holders. Okay. Um, and would you agree that on generally on, on matters that Australians care about, they would they would like to see some leadership from from Parliament House? I uh, think on, that's, on, to be fair, that's a matter of policy for the Secretary. I mean, 
Well, I'm just asking you. Well, he's, he doesn't have to answer questions and opinion. I can answer it. Well, well, would you like to answer it, Chair? Well, what's the question? Would, would you agree that on, on issues like uh, like recycling, for example, that Australians would would expect to see Parliament House leading on an issue like that or showing leadership? I imagine there are a lot of Australians who would share that aspiration. I tend to yep. not try and aggregate them all into one monolith, but, yeah, I imagine there are a lot of Australians who would. OK. So your, your, your government put a, some legislation before the... The Senate and the House recently, the waste reduction bill. Um, my question is, uh, is it relates to catering and the products in in, in the canteen. Yep. I know there's special uh, regulations in place for COVID around takeaway containers, um, but I've just there's there's three basic products I wanted to ask you about. Um, the first one was the these biopack yep. uh, knives and forks, which are plant based um, material. Everything in here is commercially compostable. Uh, which is which is awesome. Um, I every time I go in there, I, I have a look in the bins, and of course, there's it's down to where the people put them in the right place. But there is no bin for compostable material. Would, would you, do you do you know if these are, are actually commercially are separated after they're put in the bins and sent off for commercial composting? Um, I I don't know off the top of my head, Senator. I can take that on notice to investigate yeah, further. If, I, if, I, if you could, because this is a big issue around the country, people are spending good money to do the right thing and buy the right products. But there's actually once they once they use it and spend the money, then there's no process for so not you're saying because I know you're more aware of detail. This yeah. night, that, that needs to go into a different bin than say a plastic recycling bin. That that would can be a suggestion. I'd like to perhaps put you in writing. Um, okay, no, I'm interested, and it would have yeah. to be a different bin to a plastics recycling or a paper cardboard. Yeah, so you can third bin. C correct, because yeah. this is this is set up for a commercial uh, composting. And would that be, for example, oh, sorry, to, I'm just asking. No, no, please. Get my head yeah. around it. Would that be a place where I put my food scrapings as well? Because they go no. into composting. No, no, that would be separate. Um, and, unless you can actually put that into an organic waste collection facility. Please uh, write but, to me. but even then, that would be a different process to commercially composting. We, I'm, I'm, the yeah. Speaker and I will consider anything put to us. I wasn't aware that they were not, shall we say, classically recyclable, if you know no. what I mean. Um, but obviously the limitation is yeah. the number of bins we can fit in place, but absolutely. Well, we'll my my guess is, and if you could check, is that they probably go to landfill. Uh, although we spend, obviously, uh, TPS spends good money on, on Does buying that mean they product. compost in landfill, though, they, in the sense they just that they don't degrade? They literally just go to landfill. Mm. Uh, yeah, but they, they don't... No, they're only commercially compostable, oh, okay. so they, won't, they, they could take thousands of years to yeah, break okay. down like, like other products. Mm. Some products will break down naturally, yep. others need to be commercially, commercially right. composted. The other one was the, the takeaway container, so these will continue after COVID. Um, for a start, there's no... Um, there's no messaging on it at all, like there's no recycling... Uh, Directions of whether it's recyclable. So I wouldn't know which bin to put that in. Mm. I'd probably, based on what's in front of me, put it in the rubbish bin. But it does look like it's compostable or recyclable. So that would be something else I'd ask that perhaps you, so can you work mean, with the manufacturer. Again, lay, lay language. You mean it should have the stamp on it like my bottle does, saying yeah. recycle logo number one, two, three, or four or something. So the coffee cups, yep. um, the top, the lid does actually say it's recyclable. So that the lid will tell you that that goes in the recycling bin. But there's no, there's nothing here to indicate the broader. The broader cup has a plastic liner, so unlikely to be recyclable. Okay. Um, and with that would go in so the rubbish. What you want that is would the go stamp in the that people recognise from the goods they buy. Some up. kind of labelling on it. You could work with the manufacturer on that, uh, or you could buy a separate product that can either be compostable with a separate stream, or uh, we know what to do with it. Because uh, look, 800,000 people. It's I don't know. They don't all eat. <laughs> don't all eat at the canteen, but. Um, I'm glad over the years you've migrated away from water bottles to provide them alternatives, especially for the school kids. That, that's great leadership. But I just think um, the whole country needs to deal with how we compo properly well, compost products. I'm happy to, very happy products, to look at it. It would be great oh. to actually start that here in Canberra. Very happy to look at it. That, that, that's all my question. No, very happy to look at it. Cheers. I've learned, I've, I've learned something. About Sorry about the props, honest. Chair, but no, I, thought that, I, felt, I thought it was very important. You're allowed to use props in committees, yeah. <laughs> and I've got a plastic bag here that's got a coffee spilt in it, so I won't. <laughs> Um, I'm just wary that we did have an early, very early morning tea break. I might just suspend the committee just for five minutes for everyone to exercise their legs and do what they want to do, um, and we'll reconvene shortly. Reconvene the committee, and I will hand the call to Senator Kitching. Thank you, Chair. Um, Firstly, Ms Lachetti, I think this is your first appearance here. And just, just for my...
clarification, you, your position is part of the restructure that occurred a little while ago. Is that correct? Have I got that? I've got the org chart somewhere. Yes. Um, Liz Lichetti, First Assistant Secretary, Corporate Services Division. The position um, Assistant Secretary of the Corporate Services Division came in with the new structure in 2020, 20, January 2020. Prior to that, it was the Chief of um, the, coup, the coup role. Sorry, the, it was the Chief Operating, Operating Officer. Officer role. Thank you. Um, can I turn to, um, to Mr Stefanik? Um, all departmental officers are bound by the parliamentary service values in the parliamentary service code of conduct? Uh, that's correct. Um, you're bound by the parliamentary services, service values in the parliamentary service code of conduct? Uh, I believe so. Is that a yes or a no? You believe yes? Um, well, as a, um, as a statutory officer, um, uh, I believe it would apply to me also. Do you need to confirm that? Uh, I can take that on notice, um, but I don't believe it would be a specific provision that would uh, be a reference to me specifically. But you probably would be, wouldn't you? Sorry? You probably would be, wouldn't you? Uh, well, whether I am or not, um, it'll be important for me to model the values and behaviours. Mm. Okay, so you would uphold the values in the code? That's correct. So an extract from the parliamentary services values reads, the parliamentary service respects the parliament and all people, including their rights and their heritage. And you've always treated colleagues in accordance with that, with uh, respect? I believe so. You wouldn't have made comments of a colleague, a senior colleague's sexual I think, um, I think, orientation, for well, example? We go, again, we sent it a kitchen. One of the um, standards and principles of operations of committees is, is that if the, someone is to be quizzed about um, something, then it's, it's not a Perry Mason moment. Um, present the evidence before them and, um, and make an assertion or otherwise. But open-ended questions along those lines without providing someone with an example or evidence, I think is not consistent with the practice of committees in this matter. So you're referring only to the last question because I'm pretty sure asking a public servant whether they're bound by the parliamentary no, service for, values no, and the fine. parliamentary service code of conduct I agree. is not, that's a pretty... I agree. I was just yes referring, or no to, kind I was referring of framework, to just what isn't you it? said then, Senator Kitchen. Yeah. Um, Mr Stefani, you accept that there may be current employees who wish to participate in the Senate inquiry into the operation and management of the department? I believe there, there, there would be, yes. And you would have active knowledge of that? Uh, I have some knowledge of that. Mm. Um, do you think that employees of the department who wish to participate in the inquiry, do you think they should feel fearful for doing so? Uh, if they're telling the truth, Senator, no. But not from, not for example, that their employment would be terminated, for example? if they participated or wish to participate in the inquiry? The rules on parliamentary privilege are absolute, um, and that goes to participation even in inquiring the building. I, it is, I, I'm I saying agree. it's something that I strictly um, uh, adhere to, and the Speaker and I always reinforce. And Mr Stefanik, do you model your views on the presiding officers? Do you believe that, do you believe as the President says, that the, the rights to participate in inquiries, the right of privilege is absolute? Absolute. Senator, um, before I was in this role um, and before I was in my former role, I was a table officer for uh, 10 years in the New South Wales legislature. So I'm very, I'm fully aware of privilege but you believe that? and its importance. Yes, You course. believe that no one should be fearful for participating in a Senate inquiry yes, or indeed any inquiry of this. Yep. Okay, that's very good to hear. Um, do you think that if someone feels strongly enough about something that they've witnessed and they want to report the matter to the police, that they should do so? Uh, and of it's of a criminal nature? Well, certainly. You certainly believe that? If the matter is of criminal nature... They should um, report it. Then they, of course, should report it to the police. Okay. And 
if the employee of the department wish to make a report to or cooperate with the police, you'd support that employee? Again, again Senator, where there is a specific rule against hypothetical questions. I mean, it's and, not. And, no, hang on. If makes it hypothetical. Um, there is a specific rule against hypothetical questions. If there's a scenario that you wish to present to the secretary, I think it is fair you do so. Hypothetical questions, are, you know, are, I haven't interposed myself at this point, uh, until this point. But if there's a scenario to put, then I don't think it's a hypothetical. My, my question was around: Would the secretary or would the department um, support an employee who is making a report to the police? Of, that, that was of a criminal matter. Subtly, that is subtly different to what you were asking, Senator Kitching. I agree. And I don't. So, Mr. Stefanik. I'm not quite sure, Senator, where you're headed, um, and I don't know. Um, I mean, is it a matter that um, I believe to be a criminal issue? No, is no, it no, something asking, that I have no knowledge of? So you're asking me to make an assessment based on a really amorphous. No, no. I'm asked, well, I think we've just decided. The president and I have just decided that uh, no, 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 the no. slightly different form of words. Senator Kitching, the secretary is entitled. Make it to, not... Secretary's entitled to ask you to be more specific. Well, I was just saying that you removed the word "if" and rephrased your question. Uh, Mr. Stefanik, do you believe that if you have an employee and they wish to report a criminal matter to the police, that they should do so, and that you would support that employee? Well, yes. Thank you. And Mr. Stefanik um, did ask questions about what particular circumstance because the awareness of what may or may not be a criminal matter at any particular point in time is obviously relevant to that question. No, the question is, would the department, would Mr Stefanik, support an employee who had witnessed something of a criminal nature and reported it that's, to the police? Well, that's like, actually, Senator Kitching, that's actually different to what you just asked because, uh, and they're very important. Mr. President, I can go back and keep going back to Hansard and we can have this discussion, yeah, but you're splitting hairs. No, that's I'm what's not, happening. Because the knowledge of an event by whom I'm and asking, when would is would an employee relevant? doing their duty Senator as a citizen, as a citizen, going to the having question. witnessed something criminal? Would they be supported in going to the police? That's a pretty basic yes answer. Well, I would have. I wouldn't disagree. I would have thought, but it's DPS, so who uh, would know? No, I don't disagree with you, Senator Kitching, in that regard. Um, would the employee's employment be affected for speaking or cooperating with police? No. No, so it wouldn't be affected if they cooperated with the police. And so, no. yeah, okay. Um, are you able to explain your understanding, Mr Stefanik, of what constitutes a contempt of the Senate, especially in relation to intimidation and adverse treatment of witnesses? Uh, it's a matter for the Senate to make a decision about what um, constitutes a, a contempt of the Senate. Well, I think, let me read you the part of uh, parliamentary privilege resolutions agreed to by the Senate on the 25th of February 1988, which includes the following interference with witnesses. A person shall not, by fraud, intimidation, force or threat of any kind, by the offer or promise of any inducement or benefit of any kind, or by other improper means, influence another person in respect of any evidence given or to be given before the Senate or a committee, or induce another person to refrain from giving such evidence. Yes? You're aware of that? Uh, I'd, you've, uh, I'll give you the you, number thank again. Thank you for reading so you it to me. I've maybe read it a bit in more in detail. It's, it's one of the parliamentary privilege resolutions agreed to by the Senate on the 25th of February 1988. Um, have you directed, given, and I understand it's a verbal direction, given employees a direction not to communicate with senators' officers? I don't believe so, no. I know at least on one occasion in this building, and I won't be more specific, where um, some uh, staff of DPS in a particular area were told they were no longer to respond to queries from a particular either staff member or, off, or individual office. I know of one time that So was they done. were not to communicate they, or not to answer questions uh, from... Not to... They were, they, they, they were not required to have any further um, uh, communication with... Um, an office. So is it, are you saying that it's okay, given what I've just read from the 
resolution. No, this was a very different circumstance. Yeah, I was and just so why have it. you raised it? Because it's not relevant to what no, I'm raising. Actually, it is. Because which is but Senator, Senator Kitching, Kitching, you have please. to let people answer. It is relevant because I was saying I am aware of a circumstance where some staff were told to not deal with a, either a staff member or a particular office. So I'm in fact, I know of two circumstances, so and they were not related to any. Kitching. They were not related to any inquiry. Um, in one case, it was they were not required to respond to queries from a staff member. So it was nothing to do with DPS officials so approaching. Where employees office. of the department are giving information, so I hope there's no um, you know, dereliction of people's duties under whistleblower legislation, no. which is, I hope, what you're not suggesting. Um, so where employees of DPS are giving information to people who sit on this committee, there's no pro that wouldn't that wouldn't breach anything, would it? No, the exact. And there would, if a direction was given to employees no, not to communicate with senators' offices. Well, that's okay. Not to, there's a difference between not to. Um, well, I'm not aware of the latter, but there's a big difference between not communicate to people who are part of an inquiry and not to communicate to people more broadly. Now, I'm not aware of the latter, but they are actually different instructions. So, let me give you an example, okay. and there is actually sure. physical evidence of one of these examples, of a particular example, um, where Mr Stefanik has issued a verbal communication to employees not to communicate with senators' offices regarding the inquiry or indeed with estimates. Well, I'm not aware. And I would say that that would breach whistleblower protections. So let me give you an example of a, the real a physical example of where there is where there was documentation, um, where someone was giving mail to a senator's office before estimates, and it was intercepted by the department. It was addressed to a staffer in a senator's office. The department intercepted it. No. And that person was then had their employment terminated. Yeah. So, Senator Kitching, I can speak to this with some detail. Um, well, I actually want. I asked you a general question no, no, but first. No, but this is a specific. And then a specific, specific incident one. that I'm going to be transparent about. Yep. And people are um, listening, including the person to whom it was addressed. Yeah. So, and I'll, I did speak to a senator, who had a staff member, who I guessed because the name on the envelope was not complete. If I recall, it was a first name only. Correct. But, they, but it was Let known who sent it. No, no I, I'm not sure if that is the case. I've got a feeling it may have been, and I'll check, that, that the envelope, and I recall seeing it, was, I believe, opened in the mailroom. It was brought to my attention. It became pretty easy to guess to whom it was directed. I sat down with that senator. This is some time ago, I in fact think pre-COVID. I sat down with that senator and explained the circumstances. And I'm not going to divulge to who it was, but that senator, um, I don't think I want to put words into their mouth, but no further action was taken. And the explanation I proffered, if I recall correctly, was accepted, even if it was not an ideal circumstance. But oh, yes, the wasn't. envelope only had a first name on it and no office, if I'm correct. But it had a mobile on it. Were you the only person who read the contents of that document? I don't know Mr. if Stefani, I actually read it. Mr Stefani, did you look at it? it? Uh, yes, I did, Senator. Yes, you did. I, Ms. Think Ms. Saunders, I don't know whether you were actually here, Ms Saunders, when that happened. I but were you? Did, were you here? I think that's how it came to me. Senator, the, the I, package... My understanding is a number of people read it. The package. And it was whistle Senator sorry, can I, just, can I just clarify what yes, we're discussing? And then allow the witness so it was to whistle, the it was whistleblower material about something happening in the department and it was intercepted in the mail room. No, it was opened um, by a mail official. And very um, And they're not DPS officials, are they DPS mm -hmm. officials? Are they in the House, uh, house it was a, yeah. it was a DPS but, um, official. And it had a first name on it and no office. And a mobile. It, well, it I, had I, a mobile. I'll take, I, I'll take your. But um, it, it was opened. I think, by an official at, in the mailroom. It and was, and yeah. read, and then Mr Stefanik and read it. And I think that's how it was brought and to my attention. I think someone else read it as well. Okay, but well that may be the case. But and I it's did, true that the employee was sacked soon after. I did actually take that um, information when I, when I saw it and the envelope. It was apparent to me to whom it may have been directed. 
and I went and saw that senator personally and explained the chain of events, and that was over a year ago. And that the person who was communicating that information no longer works here. Well, I can. I mean, there's a. I think there's a, there's um, a wider context to that, um, but we don't normally go into individual Senate, circumstances. But the secretary may, given that no one's name has been mentioned but, thus far. But we agree, don't we? We agree that whistleblower protections should be followed. Or well, parliamentary privilege in particular. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and absolutely was the word you used before. And Mr. Stefanik agreed, unless you want to change this, agreed that parliamentary privilege was absolute. You agree, Mr. Uh, Stefanik? Yes, yes. Good, well, that's good. Um, and if people wish to, if employees of the department wish to communicate information to senators, that they should be able to do so because we believe in parliamentary privilege. Well, parliamentary privilege, one must recall, goes to um, proceedings and work relevant to proceedings in the chamber or a committee. Yes, that's right. Parliamentary privilege does not extend merely to the receipt of mail unless it is a matter that is related to parliamentary proceedings. That's right. Okay, and, so I, and Yes, and, I, and that's why I'm also invoking whistleblower protection legislation as well, because I think you'll find that the Commonwealth is subject to whistleblower protection. I'm not as familiar with the law on that off the top of my head, but I'm happy to look at Ms. it. Mr Stefanik, has anyone else in your department given a direction to staff not to communicate with senators regarding estimates, committee business? No, I don't believe so. Um, Senator, I'd like to actually put a bit of detail around what you've provided, very limited context. Um, that staff member um, actually took legal action and failed. Um, so to say there's been no independent examination of the circumstances... I didn't say that. I um, never said there was an independent examination yeah. can we, at all. Can we, can we please allow the secretary... If assertions are made, particularly with quite serious implications, it is only fair and reasonable the secretary provide directly relevant information to the case that's been put, for, put forward. You made an assertion with respect, Senator, about the person being oh, sacked... Point of order. Uh, point of um, order, Chair. Yes, Senator Kitchen. So th that is actually not a true reflection on what I said. I never talked about an independent. In fact, I'm very limited in talking about the staff member because that staff member went soon after. His termination finished soon after. But I understand he has employment elsewhere and I'm aware that Canberra is a very small town. So I have been very limited and I certainly did not refer to any other investigation Chair, or any on other... Point. Can I, can yes, I respond? On, on the point of order, um, Senator Kitching is clearly privy to things which other members of this committee are not. It will be helpful to me as a member of this committee if the Secretary is able to provide relevant information for context, because I'm at a loss as to what Senator Kitching is referring to here. And I would have thought uninterrupted as well would be helpful. Um, so, Mr Stefanik, you have the call. Please Thank respond to Senator Kitching's Thank question you, Chair. and provide context. The, the subject of the legal action was um, in relation to that person um, uh, using the Public Interest Disclosures Act, which often people refer to as the whistleblower protection. Um, the, the, um, we, we are getting into an area where it is, the person will be readily identifiable. Yes. Um, the action that was taken, uh, I believe the judges uh, response to that is that there was no no um, no evidence essentially um, to support their claim. In in terms of the matter of privilege, as the as the president has already outlined, uh, when there was a suspicion about the potential senator, this may have been addressed with he was alive to the fact that he needed to um, raise it with the senator in case there was any privilege to be claimed. So I think in terms of how the privilege being absolute and how it was managed, um, the, the department drew it to the president's attention as soon as there was any uh, doubt about the uh, potential recipient uh, and uh, the president responded accordingly. Okay. So, um there's no need for DPS staff, so current employment I'm talking about, staff um, to be fearful about participating in the inquiry into DPS? If they're telling the truth, Senator, there's absolutely no concern anybody should have. So they're not going to lose their employment? No. 
I, well, the submissions that you've received are clearly confidential. Um, so I I'm not would not know about the identity of who that is. Actually, those submissions. Senator but Kitching, I'm just wary that Senator Waters had a couple of questions to follow up. I do want to just go to another matter. But How long will it take? Because we are getting very close to lunchtime, and I'm just trying to get a sense of whether or not we intend to continue with DPS. I don't, no, I don't lunch. want to hold up the committee like that. But I'll just ask. So, Mr. Safanik, no employee of the department wishing to contact an elected parliamentary representative should feel fearful about doing so? No. They won't be punished? No. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Waters. Follow-up questions in relation to the budget night um, yeah. fancy pants um, invitation. That, that's not the right words, but the budget night event Indeed. that was held in the Great Hall. Um, thank you for taking some of my earlier questions on notice. I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to... I've had a five-minute break for personal reasons. I'll get onto it when we leave. Okay, great. So can I just substitute a few additional questions? I'm interested in who made the reservation yep. to use the Great Hall, and I'm interested in who paid the invoice to DPS for the venue hire and the catering sure. and booze costs. Um, so thank you for taking those on notice. But I'm more broadly interested in whether there are any rules against using Parliament House as a location for a fundraiser. Mm, no, it's a, it's a not uncommon um, event that um, Parliament uh, event spaces are hired in Parliament on the commercial terms DPS has for use of um, fundraisers. I imagine it's been done for NGOs and community groups as it has for political parties over many okay, years. Okay, so there's, there's no, no rule rules against, against that. No. Right. Um, and so can I just check in terms of process? So um, you said it was a coalition event. So the coalition um, pays DPS the fixed amount um, that you quoted was the cost for venue hire and, and catering. Um, and then the coalition can charge whatever they like for people to come along to attend that. There's um, no involvement so. of DPS in setting a cap or that's no. totally at the discretion of the of the coalition. Okay. Um, and so it's not a matter for the DPS that a political party is using the Great Hall as a fundraising... If, if the, um, no, no, to be fair, again, I, I say this is not a matter for DPS to make a determination on. If, political, if, if members of Parliament want to make a determination and set such a rule, it's entirely up to the Parliament. It's not up to officials to decide um, what the facilities can be used for, given they've been used and, you know, under the same sort of rules for 30 odd years. Okay. Um, so it was a fundraiser, though, just so I'm well, clear. Well, hang on. You've got to ask, ask someone who attended. I didn't go. But I didn't convene the function, I didn't organise the function, I didn't attend the function. My suspicion is that it was a fundraiser. Okay, all right. Um, and just for absolute clarity, so the DPS can't have any involvement in how much ticket price might be. So there was, we know lots and lots of very wealthy people, um, five odd rich listers there, they could have been charged Again, any amount. It's a matter for the people who hire the facility. They, they, they are obliged to comply with the policies, which are you pay, as the event space, catering, security costs, um, and that you can conduct a fundraiser. I mean, every year, not um, the press gallery ball happens, and that's a fundraiser. So for charity, other... <laughs> not well, for no, political no, parties. Okay, I think. Hang on, a look, Senator bit Waters, of you're going to the purpose of fundraising um, now. Your questions were about fundraising, I, and the Parliament is entirely free to set rules on this. It's not up to officials to change the rules, and I think it's unfair to to to, to assert that they could, because I think a lot of members well, and senators wasn't would be asserting annoyed. that. I was simply asking. Yeah, so well, there's no rules against political parties using Parliament House as a fundraising. There's no rules location. against that, other than the DPS events hire policy. There's no rules against groups using Parliament House as a fundraiser, political parties and otherwise. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Waters. One question, Mr. Senator Kitching. Has the department ever taken steps? to examine communication, so email, the email system that DPS manages, um, to examine those emails that might occur between departmental employees and parliamentarians or parliamentarian staff. Have you ever looked at anyone's email? Um, the general rule is no. Um, the qualifier to that is um, if, if there is a parliamentarian involved that they would be communicated with in, in relation to that. So you do examine parliamentarians' email? 
um, no putting words in my mouth, Senator. Um, no, I'm actually if, asking if, you to clarify. If we, if we, if if we are seeking information in an email, um, filters are placed in the search um, for those emails to ensure that it does not intersect with uh, email traffic to parliamentarians. So if you have a departmental employee, you can look, obviously, you can look at that email. That's correct. And if they've emailed a parliamentarian or a parliamentarian staffer, what do you do in those circumstances? We stop. You stop. Have you ever looked at committee members' email of this committee? No. Senator Kitchen, you said one question. Well, maybe we can continue this in the inquiry. And as I said, Senator, because we apply filters, um, it would not... Um, the the address of a senatorial member would not pop up in that search. And, okay, so um, do you let the, the parliamentarian know that, that perhaps there is... Only if, the, only if there was a requirement, for example, if there was legal process required uh, or a criminal investigation. And then you would let the parliamentarian know and then we go through the process that I described earlier um, with respect to the provision of information to external authorities. Sorry, sorry. Then we go through the process I, I described earlier where if, for example, someone searched uh, uh, or there was a request for information held by Senator Chandler, whether that be, in all honesty, signing register, something related to EAX or whatever, or an email, I would inform a, a, a senator in this case that um, we'd had a request and the decision was that it would be provided they had an option to claim privilege for that separate domain. And one, in 100% of cases, you have you filtered out the parliamentarian, is that correct? That's correct. In 100% of cases? Um, Senator, if we have ever... You, if we have ever looked at our staff emails, we deliberately avoid, um, by applying filters, um, looking at any uh, email traffic between parliamentarians and our staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Senator Kitching, um, that concludes the uh, examination of the Department of Parliamentary Services and the examination of the parliamentary departments more broadly. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, the committee will now break for lunch and reconvene at 1.35 p.m. And at that time it will begin its examination of the agencies within the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio. Thank you very much, everyone. We are for it. I will reconvene the committee. Uh, and I welcome Senator the Honourable Jonathan Dunningham, Assistant Minister for Industry Development, representing the Prime Minister, the Honourable Shane Stone, Coordinator of the National Recovery and Resilience Agency, and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, I don't. Thanks, Chair. Mr Stone, I understand you have an opening statement to table, but you wanted to read some excerpts of it out if to I the committee, could, if possible. Um, I'm happy to table it, because it is a lengthy yes? statement, and Senator Ayres assures me that he always reads my opening statements when yes. I table them. I do, I do. Thank you. On the record. Forensically. Yes. Uh, but I just wanted to start with this introduction, if I may, Chair. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. The establishment of the National Recovery and Resilience Agency by the Morrison government is historic, and I'm pleased to see that the initiative enjoys bipartisan support. For the first time in our history, there will be a single agency in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet that will have a wide charter and remit and in the same spirit in which contemporary Queensland Reconstruction Authority, the QRA, and the Queensland Rural and Industry Development Authority, QRID, were put on a sound footing by the Queensland Labor Bligh Government and the bipartisan support 
of the opposition LNP led by Lawrence Sprigboard, I think we're off to a very promising start. So I will table the balance of the Thank opening you very statement much, Mr. Stone. in the interest uh, of being able to deal with substantive questions. Really appreciate that. Senator Watt, you have the call. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mr Stone. Look forward to many interesting estimate sessions with you from here on in. I haven't had the opportunity before. Um, <laughs> I'll take that as a comment. Um, no, it's a, it's a really important role you've taken on, um, obviously, you know, the existing roles that you had and the bushfire recovery work as well, so um, we're very interested in it. Um, one, of the, one of the things you might be aware, and I, I should say probably most of my questions in this session are going to relate to uh, the bushfire um, recovery funding, or a lot of them will anyway, mm -hmm. um, but I will come to the broader roles that this sure. new agency will have. So you're probably aware that from previous estimates, one of the things I've, I've really focused in on is how much of the bushfire recovery funding has actually hit the ground, as opposed to what's been announced. Um, because I, you know, I think what's, what really matters is what's actually happening out there rather than what's being said in press releases. Um, after the last estimate session in March, uh, I put a number of questions on notice to the various different departments that have got responsibility for the bushfire recovery funding programs, um, asking them to provide details of the funding that's been expensed by their department as opposed to simply committed or allocated. Because that's, as I say, what I'm trying to get to is how much has actually left government and is making a difference on the ground. Um, and I don't know why, but all three, all but three departments that we asked those questions of transferred responsibility back to your agency for answering. So we might have to follow up on some of those things with you in future. But I just want to focus in today on the ones that we have had back. Um, and um, the in a previous question that we've put to the Bushfire Recovery Agency, um, we were told that the amount that had been expensed under the Bushfire Recovery Fund for the $41 million Forestry Recovery Development Fund was $41 million. The question on notice number is 3283. So what the Bushfire Recovery Agency said to us was that $41 million of this Forestry Recovery Development Fund had been expensed. But when we went and asked the Department of Treasury, who uh, they, they advised that, in fact, and this is in question on notice 3285, um, that funding expensed from that fund was, in fact, only $10 million. Um, so why is it that we are told by the Bushfire Recovery Agency that a certain amount has been spent to help people, but when we actually go to the agency who's delivering it, they tell us that it's only a quarter of what the Bushfire Recovery Agency is saying. Um, thank you, Senator. Before I uh, call on my colleague, uh, Marina Brusmar, from the Bushfire Agency previously to address that specific uh, point, and I also have President um, Major General Andrew Hocking who was also a deputy within the agency um, and has remained in the handover period given that we're now in our third week. I just want to make a couple of preliminary um, observations. I have watched the estimates on the bushfire and the questions that have been asked and it prompted me to, to go and have a look because I mean I was interested to see um, what was it that we were doing in flood and drought that was so different from what was supposedly happening in bushfires. And yet, when I drilled down on it, I came to the conclusion that the money had largely had gone out. And we'll get a bit more detail on this shortly, but perhaps it was the telling of the story or it was a different um, scene in terms of what had occurred down in Victoria and New South Wales. But I was able to estimate that with the assistance of the numbers that I was able to look at, that 2.3 billion of the 2.8 billion of Commonwealth funding had actually gone out, <coughs> either directly or to states that were handling the money. It's a bit more of a complex environment than what I'd been dealing with up with um, flood and drought. And I, I really want to take this opportunity to 
try and reset the record a bit because you, you could be led to believe by some media coverage that the bushfire agency had somehow failed, and they haven't. It's um, how the money has been apportioned, how it's been then distributed, and how it has then been spent. So let's now go to that very specific question that you had on the forestry, and let's get to the bottom of why forestry had an answer and then Treasury had a different answer. Uh, Rena Brunsma, um, Deputy Coordinator. So, um, Senator Watt, as we've spoken about before, when we're reporting on uh, measures under the Bush National Bushfire Recovery Fund, we've got about 29 measures and hundreds of different ways of delivering that money through third party funding agreements. And what we try to do when we report is give a consistent as possible message about the costs that the Commonwealth has incurred during a financial year. Uh, so with the question on notice with the Forestry Development Recovery Fund, um, there have been 14 successful applicants announced in 22nd of December. Um, the Commonwealth's costs included in the funding agreements and the related administration costs is the 41 million that we report. Um, I note that according to a milestone payment, um, which isn't a good proxy for delivery of services. Yes, DOOR reports expenditure as 10 million. Uh, we've always been very transparent on our website about uh, nuances and different definitions uh, across the board. And I think in total, um, when you compare our figures with the figures from other agencies, um, taking into account different definitions, we may have maybe a 6% to 9% difference overall. Um, but for that one in particular, what we're reporting is the Commonwealth's costs that have been com included in the funding agreement. Okay, but this is the point, isn't it? Is that, um, and you know, because you've been at the previous estimates, yeah. that my concern has always been and, and I'm not critical of the officials. I know you're all working really hard and doing a good job to assist bushfire victims. My criticism is of ministers in the government um, who you know you have to help respond for. And when we see announcements that the government makes that say, we've allocated this much for a particular type of recovery and we've spent this much already, but then we go to a, the department that's responsible and they tell us that in fact, only a quarter of that, in this instance, has actually been expensed. It, it just demonstrates that there is a difference between what the government, as in ministers, is saying versus what's actually happening on the ground. And I can understand from the Commonwealth's accounting perspective, you know, from the Commonwealth's point of view, the money might be spent once it's hand, handed to a state or handed to an NGO or whoever the delivery partner is, but it's not what bushfire victims are seeing on the ground. And here we've got... Um, the Forestry Recovery Development Fund, where we're told on the one hand that $41 million, the total amount has been spent, but if you go and ask the government department that's responsible, it's only a quarter of that. So, I, I think what, what we have heard from the communities is uh, they're not really interested in which level of government is spending the money or what the accounting treatment is. Uh, they're interested in what's actually happening. I and know, so but the isn't, isn't the point that only a quarter of what's being claimed is actually happening? Because only a quarter of what's claimed has actually been spent. Not necessarily. So as when a funding agreement is signed, the third party who's delivering the services will be spending money we just reimburse them at milestone payments. And so we don't, we're not in a position where we can track every funding agreement and the expenditure under every funding agreement that's happening on the ground. Uh, all we can report on is the total funding agreement that we've committed to that organisation. Um, and DOOR then can, as, as they get sort of receipts and invoices, as they come in, then they can reimburse mm. it. And that's what they're reporting on. Mm. So, there's yeah. no perfect um, way to reassure communities that if you're using uh, expenditure as a proxy for action, um, it's probably not a very accurate um, uh, a proxy because of the way that the milestones are, are spread apart. They're not actually as things are happening on the ground. But it's also surely not a very accurate proxy for action to simply judge money as being spent when the Commonwealth has sent it to someone else to use. Mm -hmm. It's actually spent in the sense of helping bushfire victims when 
they're seeing forestry recovery or when they're seeing environmental recovery, mm. all the other things. It doesn't help people to have the money in sitting someone else's bank account waiting to be spent. Mm. So that, that's why on our website we do what we call local government area profiles. So for every profile or L, every LGA that was impacted by the Black Summer bushfires, we actually go to a lot of effort to try and describe the action and the activity taking place in that LGA because, uh, you know, as I said, I don't think that um, commitments and expenditures are a very good proxy for what's actually going on. And we have been very transparent in the past, making clear on our website that when we say something like spent, exactly what it means. And we say things like this, um, this means this many funding agreements, or this means this is subject to reimbursement. So we have been transparent in trying to uh, communicate in a very clear and consistent way um, to support people's understanding on the ground. I mean, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly give you three other examples that we've been able to establish from these questions on notice. So the Bushfire Immediate Wildlife Rescue and Recovery Program, it was a $150 million program. What the Bushfire Recovery Agency has told us is that it's expensed $94.9 million, which sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. You go and ask the relevant department, it turns out to be $18.1 million rather than 94.9. If we're talking about the Bushfire Recovery for Species and Landscapes program. Um, the Bushfire Recovery Agency says that it's expense $53.1 million. You go and ask the department that's actually administering it, they say it's $34.8 million. And it's the same when we're talking about expenses for uh, recovering telecommunications as well. So as I say, we haven't even been able to get answers from most departments mm. to the questions we've put to them. But there's three or four examples where we have, where they say, they've actually spent a lot less money than what ministers and the Bushfire Recovery Agency are out there telling people has yeah. been spent. So those three examples we are aware of, and on our website we had said that that was the Commonwealth costs for approved funding yeah. agreements and for work in train. And as I said before, when you consider the the difference, the slight difference in definitional issues that we use across the um, all the money that's gone to the bushfires, the difference would be only around six percent. Um, so there's not a huge discrepancy in terms of expensed versus otherwise, um, and it comes down to um, defini the definitions and what we're including when we say expense. Well, I mean, you say that it's only six percent across the entire program, but. As I, I'm operating a little bit in the dark here yeah. because we haven't been able to get figures back from the, most of the departments, yeah. but those that we have been able to get figures back from, it's a lot more than 6% difference. Yeah. So the, the question on notice, we coordinated that on behalf of the department. So the data that has come in is from the departments. Mm. And so we had discussions with um, DOOR. I think at last Senate estimates, there was some uh, discussion between yourself and Secretary Metcalf about the difference in definitions. And again, it comes down to the way that we communicate for the general public is based on um, a definition that tries to indicate the work that's incurred in a financial year and the costs that are incurred to the Commonwealth mm. in that financial year. Mm. But you'd accept surely that bushfire victims, when they hear ministers out there saying that 90% of a particular fund has been spent, mm. and that's what the recovery agency says, when people hear that, they think that is actually work that's happening right in front of them, helping them recover. Mm. Uh, but if it turns out that it's actually only a small fraction of that, then aren't people right to be feeling a little bit misled? I, I would say that um, the work is happening. So that's, that's the issue. If we reported just at the end of every contract, um, which is particularly in the, um, uh, the, the infrastructure or the, um, <coughs> what's it called, the strength in telecommunications, they don't actually invoice until the end. Uh, and that would be a, a significant underreporting of action that's happening on the ground. I don't think there's a perfect uh, definitional fit here. Um, so what we've tried to do is give a, a figure that is fairly consistent across the board that indicates how much the government has actually signed up with a third party provider and that third party provider is actually delivering services. Okay. Um, can we move on to some of the new funding that's been um, allocated in this, for, for next year's budget? Um, and Mr Stone, I'm sure you'd agree there's been a pretty substantial increase in funding for resilience uh, in this budget, or at least that's what the government said. Yes, there is 600 million. Yep. So um, do you have a breakdown uh, of how much of that funding is new and how much of it is existing funding that's been repurposed in some way? Right. 
Um, the 600 um, is new. And when you say that, you're talking about the 615 million for Preparing Australia? Yes. Program? Yes. Yep. I'll just get Hannah to um, come up. She's the total right. Um, this young lady I've put in charge of this area. She formerly was in charge of drought, and she's been charged um, with the responsibility for the way that we approach the most basic things. What's resilience? What's it really mean? And how do we apply this two amounts, 400 and 200? Mm -hmm. So Hannah Wandel, um, I'll just get Hannah to walk you through the approach that's taken. It is all new money. It's not repurposed money and uh, Hannah will be able to tell you where we're up to. So that, well, just in the interest of time, can we, so can we just start with the, the $1.2 billion over five years that the government has said has been allocated for uh, resilience and recovery from natural disasters? Before we get into the Preparing Australia program, of the $1.2 billion, how much of that is new and how much of it is existing? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Hannah Wandu, Executive Director of Drought and New Programs Resilience. Uh, that funding is new funds committed uh, following the Royal Commission. Uh, so that is broken down, uh, as you mentioned, $600 million um, from uh, the contingency reserve put um, towards the Preparing Australia program. Uh, there is additional funding, I understand, $209 million for the Australian Climate Service um, for details about that program. I would need to refer to the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, there is some additional funding put aside uh, for this agency, uh, which my colleagues can talk to in terms of the profiling uh, for the National Recovery and Resilience Agency. Uh, there is some additional funding uh, as well that we uh, have for the National Capability Package, which is $4.5 million uh, put towards recovery uh, capability. Uh, there is also additional funding um, that's been put aside for an Enhanced Emergency Management Australia, but I would need to refer that to the Department of Home Affairs. Okay. So, so to give you one example, um, the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants, which are included underneath the Building Australia's Resilience heading in the budget papers, that is existing funding, isn't it, rather than new? I would need to refer that to my colleague. Thanks. Uh, that's correct, Senator. So it's a combination of unspent money out of the Bushfire Recovery Fund, as well as the complementary 98.5 million from the complementary projects fund. So that in terms of existing funding, not new, it's, it's the 280 million for the Bushfire Recovery Grants. That's right. And what was the second bit you said? Uh, Senator, the bushfire recovery grants, that money came from um, an underspending the bushfire recovery fund of yep. 181.5 million and 98.5 million from the complementary projects fund. So that, that, that gives you the 280. Right. Okay. The complementary projects fund, is that, was that within the National Bushfire Recovery Fund? It was. So, okay, so in total, it's 280 million that formed part of the notional $2.2 billion bushfire recovery fund that has been repurposed now for this new Building Australia's Resilience package. That's right? No, I don't think that's correct. Uh, Senator, in terms of the funding for the agency, it comes from a number of sources. There is new funding such as the Preparing Australia yep. program, so that's the $600 million. Um, Ms Wandel referenced the, uh, the, the capability package of $4.5 million, uh, which is made up of a number of components. Uh, there is other funding that will come across from Home Affairs and EMA on 1 July, mm -hmm. uh, given that this is a two-stage move. So 5th of May was bringing all the bushfire functions together with drought and flood, and then 1 July was bringing in the functions from Home Affairs around uh, resilience and risk reduction and yep. recovery. So, Ms Brunsma, um I could see you nodding before. Um, it is the case that the $280 million, um, which came out of the Bushfire Recovery Fund, the Notional Fund, that's now being repurposed here for this new package. Is there any other funding in this 1.2 billion that the government has announced for resilience that was existing funding, as it, whether it be from bushfire recovery or other agencies? Anyone know? Senator, I, I can, I can uh, answer that. So there, there is funding that is coming across from uh, Home Affairs EMA. Yep. And that includes things such as the disaster recovery payments to uh, special category holders from New Zealand, uh, the pandemic leave uh, disaster payments. So there are a number of uh, a number of initiatives that are picked up under the uh, existing funding arrangements. They're not included in the 1.2 billion, though, are they? 
that they will come across under the agency remit from 1 July. I, yeah, I realise you'll take responsibility for those, but they don't seem to form part of this 1.2 billion. G'day. Katrina The Chief Finance Officer might know. <laughs> That's right, I've made my way to the table. Um, we can give you a breakdown of existing um, and new funding on notice, yeah. if that what, would help. What I was going to ask on notice is if you can give us a breakdown of the funding programs yep. um, under this Building Australia's Resilience package, if you can break it down by you know, department, yep. program, financial year, new existing, new or existing, but are you in a position today to even just tell us in, an, in a global sense how much of the 1.2 billion is new and how much of it was existing funds that were held in various different departments? So, as far as I'm aware, the 600 million we've talked about is new money. Mm -hmm. The 280 is what you've just spoken about. So you've got around 300,000 there left to go. Yes. Um, there's at least around 90, I believe, over the forward estimates um, that is coming in from other agencies on departmental funds. And I would have to get you. So they'd break. be existing funds? It is, and it's funding from the former agencies when we're coming yeah. together through the MOG situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I'd there's have... there's probably at least a quarter of the funding the government's announced is actually just existing funds that have been repurposed. I'd have no, to give you the exact figure. <coughs> Sorry? It's a lift and shift. The staff and the budget comes with them to the agency. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's existing funding as opposed to brand new funding. Well, the brand new funding I always counted on the budget papers is the 600 million. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if I could just clarify, Senator, the, the, the two other elements are the four and a half million national capability yep. package and the 40 million for the North Queensland Strata Insurance uh, Program. Yeah. And that'd be new. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, if you can come back on notice with the details, that'd be great. So, just looking at this um, 600 million or 615 million dollar preparing Australia program. There's obviously not a lot been said about this publicly so far. It was in the budget papers, but not a lot of details so far. We've only had it for two weeks, yep. and uh, we've got a designated team who are working on it, and that's led by Hannah Wandel. Okay. Yeah. Um, so have grant guidelines been drafted for no, this fund We're yet? not that far into it. Okay. Uh, as I said, we're only three weeks, um, and we're not still not complete. Uh, we won't be complete until the 1st of July yep. when the Rural Financial Councillors and that pointy end of um, EMA come yep. to us. Yep. Um, when do you expect those guidelines will be drafted by? Well, we hope uh, sooner rather than later. I mean, we're... What does that you, mean? Well, what that means is that we're facing a mammoth task marrying all the different bits yep. and pieces together. I mean, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the questions that you're asking first up because we're, we're also grappling with those same issues mm. in... One of the good things about a single agency is that we're going to be able to standardise the way we approach grants, loans, whatever we do, in a way that's clearly and easily understood and is driven from the bottom up, as we did in the flood zone in North Queensland. Mm. We tailored our activities around what local people wanted. So, so there's been a lot of ad hoc. Look, well, yeah. you can see that, I can see yeah, that. Yeah. And we need to really iron this out yep. And we're not going to do it overnight. No. Do you expect it'll be done before the next disaster season? Oh, I, I would expect it to be done before Christmas. I, I can tell you, people working 24/7, coming to grips with, you know, what needs to happen. Like we worked last week. I signed off on 26 million dollars in bushfire grants, back to the Victorians. They put up certain proposals, under the arrangements. We scrutinised them and then I, as the accountable authority, sign off. We signed off. They would have gone back to Victoria today. I'm hoping that they will deal expeditiously. I think I asked, what did they say, a week or two weeks? Um, so we're sort of clearing the decks where we can. We've got another lot coming in from New South Wales. And people are working very hard to try and hit the mark and they're doing it with the full cooperation of our bushfire colleagues who've came across yep. from their agency. Okay, understood, Mr Stone. And sorry if I have to cut you off, I'm just going to be short of right. time, that's all. Um, uh, do you anticipate that the, these guidelines will be um, provided to the Department of Finance? Will they have some oversight over these guidelines? How yeah, this money will be spent? 
Uh, Senator, the Department of Finance will absolutely be engaged in the guidelines, um, as is the requirement. Um, and we would expect to have the guidelines um, ready in the next uh, couple of months with a view to opening the scheme in the October-November timeframe is what we're currently aiming for. Okay, so you expect to be calling for applications? Yes. Is that by October-November? Yes. Okay, but we probably won't see any money distributed from this fund prior to the next disaster season, which in some parts of the country starts in July. Uh, Senator, we're aiming, I mean, there's around $50 million allocated uh, this coming financial year, I think, for the Preparing Australia program. And, and you know, our view to opening the scheme in the October, November timeframe is to get the money out the door this uh, coming financial year. Uh, but to your point, I, I would expect only some of that to have gone out uh, you know, prior to Christmas. Can you, you just said 50 million in 21, 22? I think so, Senator. I'd, I'd have to double check that figure. Maybe while we keep asking questions, yeah. could someone just prepare for me the year-by-year -year breakdown of that funding? Sure. Um, and I understand guidelines are still being prepared, but has any thought been given to who will be eligible to, to apply for this funding? Is it going to be councils, state governments, NGOs, private sector? This What's the, the 50 or the 600 million? Well, I suppose I'm sort of assuming it's the same. It'll be the same because it's the same program, or am I wrong there? Uh, Senator, there are two elements to the program, and Ms. Waddle's well placed to go into the detail. But essentially, 400 million is, is, is funding that is targeted at uh, communities, and 200 million is funding that is targeted at households. And there are Sorry, 200 million for households. 200 million at, for households. Yep. And then 400 million for what uh, we refer to as the Preparing Australian Communities program. Mm -hmm. And just to complicate matters a little further, of that 400, there are projects of local significance. So they're projects from 500,000 to 10 million. And then there are projects, um, a separate, two, uh, the, the other 200 is for projects of national significance. Uh, and that's grants of five to 10 million, five so to 50 million, sorry. Local government and local co community groups. That'll come out of 400, 400 million in total. 400, yeah. Yes, okay. So, we'll so this, this is the sort of stuff that'll be in these guidelines. Okay. Yes, it is, Senator. Yeah, can I say in the guidelines though, I mean, when we hit the ground running on the floods, we got the guidelines up pretty quickly and we still got that core of people who understand what's required mm. to get guidelines that are not, an in, not a barrier to people being able to apply for something. Yep. And I tell you the other thing that we did, and uh, we're going to do this also in the, in the um, fire zones and that, we run grant workshops. And that has helped people understand what you need to do to be yep. able to make a successful application. So, and who, who will be the final decision maker for grants from this fund? Will that be ministers, it cabinet? Be, it will be the minister will be the decision maker at this stage. Right. So there'll be your agency will provide advice. My recommendation to the minister. Okay. Yep. Um, but it, it will be a minister. Is there going to be? There are some grant programs that have like a ministerial panel, a number of ministers. Is that likely here, or are we really just talking about Minister Little Prouder to be? Would it? Well, it's early days. At this stage, Senator, is Minister Little Proud would be the yeah. decision maker. Okay. Um, and. You said that you expect to call for applications in October, November. That's correct. Or was it call for or finalise? The scheme would open? In, yep. In, because between now and then, Senator, there's a, quite a number of steps we need to go through to, yep. to settle the guidelines. Sure. Um, so we've got a fund that has $600 million in it that guidelines have not yet been prepared the minister will have the decision-making power about where that money goes. What guarantees can you give us that this isn't going to be used as just yet another National Party slush fund, which we've seen proliferate across this government? Mr well, Stone? I don't believe that would occur. Why? Um, based on the number of people who are involved at an organisational level, who uh, will work tirelessly to ensure that these are uh, grants that are recommended on the basis of equity and need. So despite the fact that we've had sports rorts, regional rorts, I've lost track of every other kind of rort that National Party ministers have overseen, we should just be confident that this one's well, going to be rigid edge. I mean, well, let me, uh, let me pose this then. I mean, was there any concern about the way we did the flood grants or Well, well I'll come to that in a little while. All right, well. Yep. I mean, I did not hear a single word from anybody to say, well, that was not equitable, that wasn't fair, that didn't hit the mark. It's the same team of people who are going to be working on these bushfire 
grants and loans? Um, what what um, what safeguards, if you like, will be imposed through the guidelines or the process to ensure that we don't have a repeat of sports rorts and regional well, rorts? Senator, I can't comment on what you call sports rorts. I followed it peripherally. Um, in the cut and thrust of the political world in which you live, um, that was the name you gave it. Um, but you would have done that when you were a politician no, yourself, wouldn't you? Never, never, never. I mean, look, the reality is that uh, I, I come back. I mean, you, I, if you want to raise some issues about any of the flood grants and, and funding, I'm, I'm surprised. But it's the same people, and they're they're dripping with integrity in the way that they conducted themselves. And we've done it hand in glove with Q Rider. Um, we're a check on each other. We've got an appeal system. Um, we'll, op we'll approach the bushfires the same way. I mean, I've, I've talked about sports rorts, regional rorts, where we've had national ministers, <coughs> national party ministers, get their fingers in and work out who gets funding and who doesn't on a political basis. But even in this portfolio, and I accept it's before your time, the, um, it was the bushfire local economic recovery funding which went through the New South Wales government and John Barillaro had his fingers all over it with the result that Labor held electorates didn't get funding and National Party electorates and Liberal Party electorates did. So it's happened before well, in what? this very portfolio. It's a different government, different, different scenario. I mean... Your money, mate. My? Well, it is now. Come off, yes. Come off, Senator, can I confirm, preparing Australia will be directly delivered by the agency. We're not going through a state government, yeah, exactly. we're not going through a third party. We will directly manage the, you know, the, the evaluation and selection process and the advice that's provided. So if there are rorts, as history would suggest there will be, it'll be on, <coughs> on your agency rather than anyone else? Well, that's a big assumption, but... Um, well, there's no one else you can blame by the sound of it. You well, can't no, blame a state I'm, government or... I never seek to blame anyone else. I mean, I took responsibility and I take responsibility for everything that happened in the, the flood and the drought zones. I mean... But there's no... So, so, again, my question really is, what safeguards are being built into this funding program to ensure that we don't have ministers ignoring recommendations that might come from you and picking their own projects like what we've seen in a range of other programs? And that will be settled as we finalise the guidelines, Minister. Senator, that is something we need to work through. And we have Department of Finance, we have uh, Australian Government Solicitor, we have a range of parties who have a role to play in settling those guidelines. You know, in the two and a half years I've been in this role, not once has a single minister ever sought to speak to me about any of the grants or loans. Not once. Hmm. Which, which, so I, I judge them on their the way that they've interacted and performed with me. And I'm no shrinking violet, Senator, as you would be aware. Mm -hmm. um, and I can assure you, not a single minister or a prime minister has ever, ever come to me and said, I want to see a bit of favouritism for this one or that one. It hasn't happened. Mm. And you can assure us that you've never... I'm not going to change the way that, I operate, Senator. And, and you've never displayed that level of favouritism yourself in terms of how you no, administer well, the programs. Uh, I'm new to the funding programs that you've administered. Yeah, but so. I mean, I'm, I'm not from this part of the world, so mm. who do I know to favour? I think you know a few people in this government, Mr Stone. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> it's not the way I ever operated in government and I'm not operating like that. I mean, you know what's more important to me than anything else is my integrity and my reputation. And at my stage of life, I'm not about to compromise it. Um, I th I, as I understand, I've also asked questions um, before, probably in different estimates committees, about the emergency response fund. That now, 1st of July, that will become Plus. your baby. Yep. But my intention is to ask questions about that in home affairs yes. estimates. I think that's the right place to do it up until it transfers across. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, but you'd be aware there's now a $4.4 billion fund sitting there because of the interest that it's accrued which was partly supposed to be used for mitigation. How, how is it going to work between that fund and this new fund that's going to be available for resilience and mitigation activities? So, Senator, as you um, I understand you're aware, there are two parts to the Emergency Response Fund. There is the, the funding um, for, um, I'll get the terminology right, but essentially $50 million available for mitigation works and $150 million available annually for uh, recovery activities. 
In the current financial year, the $50 million for mitigation works uh, has been expended and announced, so be aware there's a range of flood mitigation uh, measures. We were actively, actively involved in that evaluation process. The $150 million for a recovery, there are very clear constraints around under which circumstances that can be used, and essentially that is money for last resort, that is, you know, where, where the disaster recovery funding agreement or other mechanism doesn't provide the funds to cover the costs associated with a particular recovery initiative. So, for example, if there was another black summer bushfire, instead of um, having to set up a special purpose account uh, to cover the costs of that, that money is then available to cover uh, recovery activities outside of the DRFA, mm. in ex essentially in extenuating circumstances. Yep. So, so, whereas this new funding won't be last resort, as you've That's termed correct, it. That's correct, Senator. So can we expect that this new funding will be used for things like cyclone shelters, flood Absolutely. levies, Absolutely. Uh, fire breaks, sort of built infrastructure, as well as you know, employing people to do things? Is that the intention? Uh, that's absolutely the intention, Senator. So, so uh, in, in terms of that funding, you know, the, the, there is a, a clear funding profile, and I can go through the figures now that, that, that you saw it earlier, but, but it will cover a range of social, economic and, and built um, activities. Okay. Um, the budget also committed, I think it was $61.1 million over four years to support the establishment of this agency. Um, do you, are you on notice able to just break that down by staffing, office rental and equipment, media and communications, consultants, the, vet, the usual sorts of categories of spending that we Actually, see? we can. Uh, we have very detailed analysis. Sure. If you have that there, of that. feel free to table it, but if you don't, if you can take it on notice. I won't get you to run through it line by line. Forward estimates? Yes, please. Take it on notice. Okay. So bearing in mind our staff will have tripled. Yeah, just what, because you're picking up home there. affairs staff as well. Yes. Yeah. In particular. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe Bureau of Meteorology people, I don't know. No, 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 no. They, they, we're a customer of theirs. Okay. They don't join us. Okay. I can um, give you the, Senator, I can give you the ASL figures over the forward estimates if you're sure. after those. So we've got 185.8 for 21-22, 166.5 for 22-23. Sorry, what was that number again? 166.5. Yep. And 166.5 for 23-24 and 166 for 24-25. And why is it more in 21-22? Is that because you're getting people on to begin with to get it set up or? A uh, bit of that, um, yes, absolutely. Um, as we set up for our uh, new programs that we'll be rolling out. Okay. Well, there's, there's another important component of that. We took everyone. We didn't sack anybody. Mm. Everyone had the opportunity to come across and we will sort out over time who stays, who goes, who doesn't want to stay. And that's why there's that initial uplift. And, okay. and, also, and also, Senator, I mean, both the flood work and the bushfire work essentially peak this year. So in the out years, that, that work does taper off as, as those programs are concluded. Okay. Can I... I'll, I'll put a few other questions on notice to do with that, but we just don't have time to go over them here. Um, Mr Stone, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in, earlier in May, I put a question on notice asking for additional information on the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program. Um, I've got, I'm, I was going to ask some of those questions now, unless if people have the answers to that. It's not due yet, so, you know, it's no issue that hasn't been answered, no, no, but I thought it... I think you know, we did go over this this morning. Um... Thanks, Ms. Brimo. Brisbane. So, um, so uh, how about, can you confirm, now from memory, it was $240 million? For the bushfire, Black Summer Bushfire Recovery yeah. Grants. No, it's $280 million. $280 million. Yeah. Um, the, and that was money that had been allocated within the $2 billion Bushfire Recovery Fund that has, has not yet been spent. That's correct. Okay. Um, and once that's spent, that will take us to $2 billion? J just over $2 billion, just in fact, $2 billion. yeah. yeah. Okay, so which which unspent programs is that money coming from? Yeah, uh, so $98.5 million has come from the complementary projects. Uh, complementary projects was uh, intended to get at unmet need after the local economic recovery program was finished. Um, and so it is, it's purposefully been held back so that we can actually address what is left after local economic recovery. 
Um, the 181.5 million, uh, there's a range of programs or measures within the Bushfire Recovery Fund delivered under the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements. Um, seven of these are demand driven. And so we're looking at um, point in time estimates that are informed by the jurisdictions that have incurred the costs and, the, and we've forecast based on that. Um, they are the back to business grants for wine producers, compensation for volunteer firefighters, back to business grants for apple growers, uh, enhanced grant assistance for small businesses, emergency bushfire response in primary industries, $10,000 grants for small businesses and other DRFA. So they were programs where the government said they would spend a certain amount, but as it's turned out, that amount hasn't been spent. Yeah, so and the, they're now being bundled together as a new thing. Yes, yeah, so to ensure that that money is actually um, spent on bushfire recovery, it doesn't go back to consolidated revenue. Mm. Uh, it's now being regrouped together uh, so that we can get at the unmet needs in those communities. What, what was the process leading up to the announcement um, that these funds would be pulled together as a new grants program? Uh, through the budget process. So, but did, you, did your agency provide advice to the minister recommending that it had all these spare funds and how yes. about we put together a new package? Yes, yes. So that was based provide. on advice from the agency? Yes. Um, was, would you characterise that, that announcement as a rushed process? No, not necessarily. We track those, um, we've been tracking those uh, measures for quite a while and we do adjustments at each MyEFO and at the budget process. So in anticipation of the budget process, we were already thinking about what we would do there. And am I right that at this point, there've been no eligibility criteria or guidelines developed for this new fund? Uh, the guidelines are under development, so we are working with Department of Finance on the guidelines. Um, we will have the guidelines out prior to the start date of the program on the 1st of July because we want to give applicants as much time as possible to apply for these new grants. So you expect applications to be called for around about the 1st of July? That's right. The program will open on the 1st of July. Um, with guidelines out before that? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, have those draft guidelines been circulated for consultation, either within government or outside? Uh, possibly within. Um, so we have been working, definitely we've uh, circulated to Department of Finance and PMC as we're required to do under the Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines to make sure that we're compliant. Okay. And without locking you in because it's still a work in progress, what who is likely to be eligible to apply for these funds? Yeah, so um, the Minister's already announced that the, um, the funds will be available to all of the LGAs uh, that were impacted by the, or disaster declared uh, for the Black Summer bushfires. So that's 113 local government areas. Um, that includes Tasmania and ACT, which weren't previously eligible under local economic recovery. Um, the eligibility is likely to be um, uh, uh, community groups, um, small businesses, uh, um, local councils. I think the announcement actually references that there'll be a range of organisations that will be able to apply for the grants. Okay. And for this fund, who will be the final decision maker? Will it be the minister the again? Minister. The right. minister, or if the minister chooses to delegate, but at this stage, it's understood that the minister will be the, um, the decision maker. And will state and territory ministers have any involvement in deciding these ones? No, we're delivering this direct as a Commonwealth program and we'll be delivering it through the Business Grants Hub. So under the whole of government um, Commonwealth grants process, um, we actually have an expert grants hub uh, deliver the grants on behalf of the, the agency in, uh, in, uh, in compliant with the Commonwealth grants rules and guidelines. So this one will be kept well away from John Barillaro <laughs> and his um, slush fund. So I think distributing we, fingers. We discussed the local economic. Yeah, we discussed uh, local economic recovery funding last time. I'm, I'm not. Order. Some of us have a bit of respect. Some of us have a bit of respect for public funding, Senator Canavan. I know it's a, a concept that's alien to the National Party, but some of us have a bit of respect for it. Um, Okay, so it'll be the minister. So, but there are there are two big funding pools available out of this budget, where we don't yet have guidelines, where the minister will have the decision making power. Six hundred million dollars for resilience, two hundred eighty million dollars for bushfire recovery grants. 
and in the end we're just supposed to trust everyone that a, a National Party minister is going to just do the right thing this time? Well, I mean, as, um, uh, as Mr Stone pointed out, the process will be run through, the guidelines get run through the Department of Finance. There has to be compliance with the Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines, and so those Grants Rules and Guidelines are very clear about the role of ministers as decision makers. Um, a minister who um, overrules the advice of the department um, that is giving him or her the advice um, does need to report that to the Finance Minister. So there's, there are safeguards and checks in the Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines. Um, the, you called it sports rorts before. Um, those, that, that was actually a very different situation because the Sports Commission is not subject to those Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines. So it's a different situation for this. So we won't have any colour-coded spreadsheets a la National Party 2019 for the distribution of these funds? <laughs> Sorry? Ross Kelly. I've forgotten that one. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a colour-coded spreadsheet there. Don't say it's relation. It's unlike you to, it's unlike, it's, it, Mr Stone, it's unlike a, uh, a highly paid public servant to make oh. a politically partisan comment. Oh, sorry. Oh, so I think after an extended period of basing, you've been going for 45 minutes. Patience has worn out, so. Oh, they're the kind of comments I expect from partisan ministers rather than partisan oh, public, well, by impartial Stone public servants, uh, Mr Stone. a huge amount of patience after the uh, extensive baiting that's gone on. Um, but perhaps, Senator Watt, on behalf of the people who need we these funds, you can continue with your questions. Can, can I just Sorry, add, Chair. with the 26 million oh. that I Order. signed off Order. last Friday, um, the minister delegated that to me to approve. I'm expecting more of that to happen. Which one's this, sorry? That was the 26 million that um, the team <coughs> processed. When I said, well, what happens now? They said, well, you're the delegate. You decide this, not the minister. He's mm. delegated it to you. So, um, I mean, if you're looking for a sign of good faith, I, I think that was a, a good example of it. Um, you're not still a member of a political party, Mr Stone, are you? Oh, I'm a life member of the country Liberal Party and also of the Victorian Liberal Party. I think you might find that Kim Beasley has uh, similar uh, sure. accolades because does that's he who we are. But does Mr Beasley distribute public funds? Well, he certainly spends them. What, as the governor? As the governor. He receives a salary? No, he manages a household with his official secretary. Does he, does he distribute... $280 million worth of public funds? Senator I think those yes. questions might... There's and certainly not... Well, the only reason I'm, I wasn't intending to go sure there... I wasn't intending to go Beasley. there with Mr Stone, but he's asked us essentially to trust him and, and that his, his role in the distribution of these funds is a guarantee that it's not going to be a partisan process. If so there's a specific claim about Mr Stone or his conduct, I, I expect you'd make it here rather than ask random questions about his political affiliations, which are on the public record. I think his record as coordinator general speaks for itself. But do you have an allegation about Mr Stone's No, no, conduct? I suppose I'm, I'm just surprised that we need to rely on, you know, the assurances of good faith from a public servant Who fronts up with instance. political connections as the way that we avoid a partisan distribution of these funds. Are you suggesting what Mr Stone does is partisan? I haven't, I haven't alleged that. I'm asking him whether, if, is that essentially the safeguard that we have to make sure that these funds aren't distributed in a partisan manner? Safeguard. Yes, so um, as I said, this, the assessment of these grants will be done by the independent whole of business, whole of government uh, business grants hub. Um, we are anticipating that the governance will include that um, Mr Stone will chair uh, an assessment panel then uh, that will look at the assessment as it's provided by the Grants Hub and then advice will be documented and given to the Minister. So all of that is, um, you know, that, those, th that's a fairly robust process that is compliant with the Commonwealth Grants, grants Rules and Guidelines. Okay. I mean, since we're, since we're Talking about you, Mr. Stone, I have a couple of questions which I'm, I'm sure you were Can expecting. Can I assure you I've recused myself from all political involvement? Okay. I don't go to branch meetings or participate. Lucky in you. Way. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, it's, I mean, it's on the public record that as the um, head of the Flood Recovery Agency, you were receiving, a, I think, an annual salary of $617,000 a year. 
Does that sound about right? right there, but it included annual leave entitlements and everything. Right, so rolled up, it's about 617000 If you're making the point that I get paid more than the Prime Minister, yes, I do. Yep. So does every other senior public servant yep. in government. Is, and you, we've already noted that you're now going to be responsible for a lot more personnel, a lot uh, bigger an agency. Are you expecting a pay rise? No one's offered anything. <laughs> right. So not expecting anything Well, look, more? when I took over drought, um, there was a suggestion I would get an extra 100 and I said, don't bother, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm just pleased to be of service to my fellow Australians. OK. And what, what was the process in deciding that you would be take on this different role, different and broader role, compared to what you had? Um, well, I was uh, simply assigned the extra duty. Um, Did you get a phone call from a minister or their office asking you oh if no, you wanted to a, take it I'm, on? I'm a remuneration tribunal appointee, and as such, it falls to um, PM and C and the Prime Minister to so, well, will you do this too? So, how did you find out that you were Word of going mouth. To I've never had a letter. Word of mouth from whom? Well, from various people around me who said, this is what you, you're expected now to do. I mean, I consulted with my chief operating officer on... I said, is there a letter? He said, no, there's no letter. But, yeah, OK. It's, but, it's, but it is in the budget papers. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we're well, well within our rights to ask yeah, sure. who contacted you to ask you to take on this new role. So who, who was Well, it? there was a task force um, set up to decide which way to go, whether it was to set up a whole new agency or to um, merge one with the other, either bushfires and, and flood and drought or over to me. Um, in terms of uh, someone coming to me and saying, would you like this job? It just happened. Yeah, it doesn't just happen. Someone well, asks you. Who, who asked you? I'm still waiting for the letter. Yeah, but who... OK, you haven't received anything writing. Who verbally approached you? Well, it was indicated to me at a PM and um, Prime Minister's office, uh, one of the very senior advisers, that that this is uh, going to be added to my responsibility. <laughs> right. So a, a senior advisor in yeah. the Prime Minister's office asked you to take on this additional responsibility? Well, they said, I take it you would be still prepared to do this, to which I said, well, I would. But I thought I'd get a letter. I haven't had a letter. OK. The... Uh, Should I get a letter? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm no <laughs> longer an IR lawyer. Probably not for Senator Watt, Mr Stone. Um, <laughs> just to quickly interrupt, um, Senator Watt, you have had very close yep. to an hour and Senator McMahon does have a couple of questions. Yeah, I could probably wrap up in about five if that's OK. That would be wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the... Do you know... Do you know when you were asked what date it was that you were asked to take on that additional role? No, it was as the task force was starting to wrap up and um, there was a lot of talk back and forth between officers as to what direction it was heading. Um, so if we're now... There was a lot assumed that I would simply just fit in. So there was now... Well, as opposed to Mr Colvin, who was heading up the Bushfire Recovery Agency? So again? At, it was assumed that you would fit in as opposed to Mr Colvin taking on the well, broader Mr. role? Well, Mr Colvin at the last Estimates meeting said he wouldn't be heading it up. He, yeah. I don't think he had any any interest to continue on, which left me as the last man standing. Hmm. When did... Um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr Colvin took leave from the agency and was replaced by Ms Brinsma as the acting coordinator. What date did he take leave from the agency? Oh, I don't know that answer. Do you know Ms Brunsma? Or do you know what date you took on the acting role? He stayed a couple of weeks to help me with the transition and then he said, I'm out of here. Was it, was it around the time that the new $280 million bushfire recovery grants program was announced? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Ms. Do you know Ms Brunsma? The $280 million grants program was announced afterwards. Do you want to grab a seat? Because I've probably got a couple other questions <laughs> here. So, sorry, the, the grants program was announced after Mr Colvin. I believe took so. Leave. I'll, take, I'll check on notice, though. Um, okay. I believe we were still working through the detail at that stage. Did Mr Colvin express any concerns to you about um, the government's decision to announce this new grants program or the way it would be rolled out? Look, Mr Colvin's uh, personal views are uh, probably not relevant. Um, I don't <coughs> recall him uh, expressing any concerns to me at the time, no. Right. The, um, and you don't know the date 
you took on the acting role? No, I think Could I... Could you come back yeah, on... Yeah, I'll come back. Sorry, I just don't... Off the top of my head, I don't okay. know. It was about three weeks. The... Um, I'm going to have to put some questions regarding the Flood Recovery Agency on notice, I'm afraid, just due to lack of time. Um, <coughs> am, I, am I right, Mr Stone, that there's, there are a number of vacancies on the advisory board for the Flood Recovery Agency? Uh, but potentially two. One is already retired and uh, there's another one whose time is coming up. So. Uh, I'm uh, now searching out people with expertise in bushfires right. to supplement who's already there. So there'll be, there'll be a new advisory board for the new agency? <coughs> I haven't really got to the bottom of whether it has to be a new board or it can be a continuation um, of the existing board. But um, like, for example, um, Fiona Nash was going to seek um, yep. National Party pre-selection in New South Wales. <clears throat> and I advised her she would need to come off because of, you know, potentially engaging in political activity. Yep. She came off and then she didn't proceed with the pre-selection. I invited her back, but she declined. Right. So uh, the um, otherwise... Um, oh, we've got uh, two spots. Sorry. <coughs> Because um, I, I don't know if this is up to date, but it looks like the advisory board for the Flood Recovery Agency has about eight vacant positions on it. No, Would, no, that's not correct. So it might just not be right on, no, the, um, no, no. on the website. I think the total number of uh, board members, in fact, about nine, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, Doug, I might leave it at that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Mr. Sain. Senator Watt. Senator, Senator McMahon. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Stone, I'd like to turn to what is a mutual passion of ours, being the Northern Territory. Can you tell me the um, on-farm emergency water infrastructure rebate scheme, um, can you tell me is the Northern Territory signed up to that scheme? Yeah, a very popular um, scheme, um, Senator. Technically lies within agriculture, water and environment. Um, however, uh, the agency has a bit of an oversight and uh, was at the pointy end of promoting it as well as encouraging participation, participation by state and territory governments. I uh, am aware that a letter was received from the Deputy Chief Minister uh, Madison on 12 May saying that um, they would pay the legacy rebates for the Northern Territory of 150000 and uh, the Minister also advised that they would commit a further 200000 to be matched by Australian government funding in the 21-22 for new rebates. So um, a bit slow coming on board, but ultimately got there. I'd met with Minister Manison twice to encourage participation because it was a very popular scheme. Yes, it, it was. Um, so 200,000, um, if people applied for the maximum they can under the scheme, that would be eight projects. Uh, Yes, it's, it's skinny. Uh, I suppose when you compare it with Queensland, where um, I think they've committed 1.9 million, and uh, Victoria, mind you, they're more population and more farmers and people eligible. Victoria um, agreed to commit uh, $863 thousand um, dollars including 192,500 for administration costs so it's it's been a, a varied you know response across the states and territories but they all seem to be getting there so I mean uh, 1.4 million square kilometers of the Northern Territory much of which is subject to to regular drought events um, eight projects wouldn't seem to be an awful lot. I just invite um, my drought expert, Hannah Wandel, who was previously in Department of Infrastructure before joining the agency, and she will give you a bit more clarity um, around what you get for your money in terms of what the Territory Government is um, offering. Thank you, Senator. Hannah Wandel, uh, Executive Director of Drought and New Programs Resilience. Um, 
as Mr Stone outlined, um, the letter was provided on the 12th of May um, for the government to pay the legacy rebates of $150,000 and then um, $200,000, which would be matched by the Australian government funding um, in 2021-22. Um, so that's a matched contribution with the Australian government, yep. who would also be fronting up uh, that amount of funding. Um, at this stage, there are ongoing discussions um, which each of, with each of those governments, obviously okay. um, agreements being made um, with each uh, government uh, as time goes on. So um, once all agreements are signed, the government will come back to uh, where we are at in terms of the program's ultimate allocation, um, and there may be scope to um, go back to the uh, Northern Territory government to uh, revise uh, these funds. In terms of the types of um, projects that can be funded, um, under this program, installation of pipes, uh, water storages such as tanks and troughs, water pumps, desilting uh, dams and associated power supplies. Um, and it is um, up to 25% uh, of expenses to a maximum of $25,000. Um, so rebate amounts could vary. So, so it, it may well be beyond that um, project amount that you mentioned. And this is a 50-50 uh, partnership arrangement, isn't it? We're, we're putting in 50% federally and then matched by the state and territory governments? For this second round of funding, so for the um, $50 million announced as part of last year's budget, uh, funding needs to be matched between state and territory governments and the Commonwealth. Um, yes. And this program is, uh, this round is $50 million, is that correct? The uh, funding that was announced as part of last budget, yes, was $50 million. Uh, there was an additional $50 million that the Commonwealth committed uh, previously, so $100 million altogether. Right, so the Territory is asking for 200000 out of $50 million. Uh, my understanding is that on the, uh, for this most recent round, the Northern Territory indicated they would commit $200,000. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator McMahon, and thank you very much to the representatives from the National Recovery and Resilience Agency for coming along today. We will dismiss you with our thanks and see you again at next estimates. And I now call the Office for Women within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. We do have to get Senator Payne online, so we might just take a few moments to work through that. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks, thanks Sam. <laughs> yep. Sure is.
Right, okay. I will perhaps wait. Ah, right. We'll get underway. Uh, I welcome Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, Minister Women for Women via teleconference, Ms Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy, Ms Catherine Hawkins, First Assistant Secretary of the Office for Women within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and other offices. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, well, Chair, let me first of all check that we have uh, adequate communications and that you can hear me and that uh, I can hear you. I can. I can certainly hear you. I hope you can hear me. I'm sure you can. I can hear you and I can see you. Great. Um, Chair, uh, can I first of all thank the committee very much for their um, support in enabling me to, uh, to appear by um, uh, Webex link, given that uh, I'm currently uh, dealing with a period of quarantine following uh, international travel, uh, as colleagues may know. There's just a couple of points I wanted to make, uh, if I could, Chair, because there's been quite a few uh, initiatives since the uh, last estimates hearing. I won't take uh, very much of the committee's time. Uh, firstly, I wanted to refer very briefly to the establishment of the Cabinet Task Force on Women's Safety and Economic Security, which I co-chair with the Prime Minister. I wanted to uh, note the uh, expansion of roles within the uh, Cabinet and the broader ministry, uh, including the creation of a Minister for Women's Safety, a role held by uh, Senator Anne Ruston, uh, a Minister for economic, uh, Women's Economic Security, uh, a role held by uh, Minister Jane Hume, and an Assistant Minister for Women, uh, held by Senator Amanda Stoker. Uh, also, Chair, if I could uh, acknowledge the um, uh, significant uh, outcome from the work of that Cabinet Task Force, uh, but particularly the government's announcement of the Women's Budget Statement, a package of initiatives which focuses on three critical pillars of support on women's safety, on women's economic security and on women's health and well-being. To ensure the delivery of these measures and to maximise outcomes for Australian women and girls, uh, this government is uh, committed to also enhancing closer cooperation with the states and territories and with civil society organisations. Uh, and to that end, we look forward to uh, the next Women's Safety Ministers meeting with the uh, states and territories. A meeting of that group uh, was held while I was uh, travelling and was chaired by Minister Ruston. Uh, we're also consulting widely on the next national plan to reduce family, domestic and sexual violence, as colleagues are aware. Uh, the expiration of the current plan occurs in 2022. And on the 29th and the 30th of July, we are holding a National Women's Safety Summit. Planning is underway for that, and that will involve experienced uh, violence and family safety advocates, service, services providers, uh, other stakeholders, uh, and of course, women who have experienced uh, family and domestic violence uh, themselves. I wanted to very briefly acknowledge the fact that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner has begun her independent review uh, into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, uh, which the government commissioned. And I also want to acknowledge cross-party support uh, for that uh, across the, uh, the parliament itself. We've responded to the Respect at Work review uh, that uh, we commissioned and which was also led by Sex Discrimination uh, Commissioner Kate Jenkins into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. And our roadmap, roadmap for respect response uh, will help to create uh, a new culture of respect in Australian workplaces. Uh, and the budget outlines our further investment uh, in that. Uh, internationally, uh, we have uh, long been a champion for women, peace and security. And on the 12th of April this year, we published our second national action plan on women, peace and security 2021 to, uh, to 2031. Uh, that is about putting women's meaningful participation at the centre of our international efforts to both protect and promote women and girls' human rights, to prevent and resolve conflict and to establish enduring peace. Uh, and finally, Chair, uh, during my recent overseas uh, travel, 
I had the opportunity to meet uh, with both the UK Minister for Women and Equalities, uh, Secretary Liz Truss, uh, and with the co-chairs of the White House Gender Policy Council, which is established under the auspices of uh, First Lady Dr Jill Biden. Uh, those conversations focused on helping to end gender-based violence, to promote women's economic security, uh, and on enhancing women's leadership in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I know officials are there. I understand you've acknowledged them, Chair, so uh, look forward to uh, going to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Ms Frame, do you wish to make an opening statement? No. Ms Hawkins, do you wish to make an opening statement? Thank you. Very well. We will go straight to questions and I'll give the call to uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Um, Minister, the forecast administered expenses for the Office of Women in the PDS for Prime Minister and Cabinet seem to indicate that the government is cutting the funding for the Office of Women, uh, the annual funding for the Office of Women, by almost half over the forward estimates. Why is that? Minister, um... Thank you, uh, Senator, Senator McAllister. And uh, I don't think that is a, an accurate reading of the, um, of the budget uh, papers. And I'll ask uh, Ms Hawkins to uh, respond to that. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Uh, Catherine Hawkins, First Assistant Secretary, Office for Women in Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, Senator, there's, there's not a cut um, for the Office for Women's funding. Um, so what it is is some people are confusing the funding that comes to us in the Office for Women for our departmental expenses, for us to run the Office for Women. They're confusing those departmental expenses with administered expenses. So that um, it's on page 29 of the PBS, the portfolio budget statements for um, the Prime Minister's department. We can see exactly what people are looking at. There's a table there, table 2.11, um, that has administered expenses in it. And next to Office for Women, it does indeed have, uh, so for the 2020-21 financial year, it has a figure of 25.9 mil. And then in the next year, so for 21-2022, it does have like $18.8 million. But as I say, they're administered expenses. And what that money represents is it represents actually quite a large increase in the women's leadership and development program. So in the Women's Economic Security Statement 2020, you might recall that there was a, a major increase in the WLDP program. So the government had increased the funding by $47.9 million. And then indeed in the Women's Budget Statement that the Minister for Women has just referred to, the government actually decided to put a further injection of $38.3 million into that women's leadership and development program. So what you're seeing in that part of the PMC portfolio budget statements is the way in which that very large increase in the women's leadership and development program has been profiled over the Ford estimates. Uh, and um, I think I think that maybe uh, one of the, your, your other senators on the committee might have asked a similar question actually in the, in the budget estimates in, in October. What we decided to do, what the government decided to do was because we were in the middle of a global pandemic, the government wanted to front load a lot of that money in the year that we were facing that, uh, all of the upheavals with COVID. So it's, it's absolutely, I can, I can see when people look and say 25 minus 18, uh, but it's, it's actually the opposite. It's a huge increase in the grant funding. It's profiled over the Fords in a certain way, uh, and it absolutely doesn't represent a cut in the Office of Women's funding. Right, and yeah. so does the department have a, a breakdown of the departmental appropriation as it is going to be applied to the departmental funding for the Office of Women? So in terms of that, Senator, I can say to you that for this financial year, the departmental funding for the Office for Women is $6.9 million. Um, and our ASL cap for this year, so our, our staffing, was 34.5. There will be an increase to the Office for Women's budget for the next financial year. That's being worked out through the internal Department of PM&C budget processes at the moment. So that, like, so internal budgets are being worked through. Uh, but happy to take that on on notice, Senator, when those um, when that internal PM&C budget is sorted out. Come back Sounds to good. Yeah. Um, on the question of the women's leadership program, um, 
there was an extra 38.3 million announced in the budget, mm -hmm. um, and that comes on top of 47.9 million announced in the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement. Mm -hmm. um, it, from the grant information, it looks like only 1.7 million of that funding has been allocated since then. Um, so 1.65 to the Financial Planning Association and 55,000 to the Migration Council of Australia. Mm. Is that a correct understanding of the status of that program? No, Senator. So in fact, um, uh, on uh, on Saturday, there was a press release that went out uh, about the fact that 60 organisations have been allocated 39.8 million for projects to support women. Uh, and that is the first, well, I can stand to be corrected, but that's the major tranche of money from that $47.9 million that I was just referring to. That was that very large injection into the Women's Leadership and Development Program from the WES 2020. So as I say, that, uh, that round uh, that was a highly successful round, Senator, it was very oversubscribed, uh, and those 60 organisations uh, that have been announced uh, on, in a press release on the 22nd of May uh, goes into some detail about that. Um, will, when will potential um, recipients be able to apply for grants from the new funding that was announced in the budget? When do you anticipate the next round to open? So, Senator, we're having a look at that. Um, we'll, we're, we're having a look at what is the best next steps in terms of that additional $38.3 million. Yeah. So there's, there's not a time frame for that at the moment. Like it, it, it has just been announced, as you know, Minister, and as I mentioned also that that round that we have just, that the government has just closed and has announced rather on the weekend was quite oversubscribed. So there are, there are different options in terms of moving forward with how the government might like to uh, allocate that additional money. Right, so the announcement, um, the last round for the 60 organisations, presumably mm. the profiling for that is not all for this financial year. That's right, Senator. Is it possible to table... Um, well, what I'm asking for is a document that sets out each of those grants and the profiling for those? Yes, Senator, we can do that. Um, and they were all uh, undertaken on an open grant process? It was, Senator. Uh, for yes. the 60 that were recently announced? I'll, I'll ask my colleague, Ms. Tor Ms Thomas, to come in and give you some more detail. Thanks, Ms. Thomas. Oh, yes, Margaret Thomas, Assistant Secretary, Women's Economic Security Programs and Leadership. Yes, I can confirm it was a full open competitive grant round with uh, the DSS Community Grants Hub and other independent panel members as part of that assessment process. Right. And I can confirm that there will be information on the 60 uh, organisations that will be available. What I'm asking is for you to make that available to this committee. Yep. Uh, yes, we can do that. Can Senator. you table that now? So we'll yes. take that on notice, Senator. We'll mm -hmm. take that on notice, Senator, and we'll provide it to you. Okay. Um, is there a profile for the uh, anticipated expenditure? Um, out of this fund. I note that you've indicated, well, put it this way, is the uh, administered expenses shown on page 29 of the PBS, the profile of expenditure planned for this fund or is that documented separately? So those figures mm. uh, represent the, the combined 47.9 and the 38.3 over the Fords. Right, and nothing else is contained in that line item? So I would have to come back to you just to um, double check on that. I'll take that on notice for you, Senator. Okay. Yep. Um, does that include both the project stream and the advocacy stream? Uh, in terms of the overall funding for the Women's Leadership and Development Program, that's correct. It does include both the National Women's Alliances and the project grants. Right, OK. So in terms of the National Women's Alliances, um, what is the profiled funding? Over Can you table a document that shows the profiled funding for each of those two streams within the Women's Leadership and Development Program? 
So we can definitely take it on notice for the National Women's Alliances. I don't know that we've we've got it here at, at the moment, but we can we can absolutely take that on notice, Senator. Okay. It's a very large amount of money um, that's been announced. The history of this grant program is that many of the allocations were made uh, through a targeted or restricted invite only approach. I'm trying to understand to be blunt, whether the government has established a vast slush fund or whether you have a transparent plan to allocate the funding that's been announced. Can you reassure me about the approach to allocating this funding? Yes, so Senator, uh, we absolutely are fully uh, aware of the uh, PGPA, the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act requirements, Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines, uh, other ANAO best practice approaches, uh, and seek to adhere to those um, at, at all points. As I've just mentioned before, the recent grant round was a full open competitive grant process, uh, and as Ms Hawkins has said, significantly oversubscribed. Yes, but since 2018, there's been quite a number of allocations which were not done in that way. So what I'm trying to understand is what your plans are for the future in terms of these grant, these grant programs. It's a very substantial amount of money that's been uh, made available in the budget, and I'm trying to understand the approach that the department intends to take in allocating it. Yeah, um, and Senator... So, uh, Senator, as with, Senator, as with uh, the grant round, that the uh, officials are speaking to now from the Women's Economic Security Statement 2020. Uh, the grants, uh, the proposal uh, from the budget, Women's Budget Statement, would equally be for an open competitive grant round. Right, so your intention, Minister, is that all of the funds allocated to the Women's Leadership and Development Program from here on in are going to be allocated through competitive grant rounds? Yes, Senator. Oh, thank you. Um, Ms Hawkins, oh, by the way, Chair, where am I? Uh, what allocation of time do you have oh, for me? You've only been going for 10 minutes, Senator, McC Senator McAllister, so you can have a bit longer. Thank you. Unless you want to pass the call to someone else. No, I've got plenty to ask, to but okay. I just don't want to get halfway through it and realise that I have to stop. Um, Ms Hawkins, on what date did you become aware that a women's budget statement was being produced for this year's budget? Senator, I'd have to take on notice like a, a date, um, but what I can say to you is that the women's budget statement uh, was prepared as, as part of this, this year's budget of the 2021-22 budget. How did you become aware that this year's budget, unlike the last seven, was going to include a women's budget statement? Uh, Senator, look, I mean, uh, with going to the date, I, I just would have to take that on, on notice. Um, so I'd, ha I'd have to take that on notice, like when, when I became aware exactly. How did you become aware? So how I became aware is in, in, the, in the context of lots of conversations about where the government's heading. I think the, the minister has, has said at times in the past that there's different ways that the, the government communicates the policies and programs that it has uh, at any given time, um, and, and at some at some point uh, in the process, uh, it was uh, clear that a, a women's budget statement was happening. But more than that, on, on timing, I, I couldn't talk to you about that. I'd have to take it on notice. So maybe was it two months before the budget, Senator? I, I really would have to take it on notice. I see, Minister. You have previously uh, said on the record this. I think the women's economic security statement does a better job than a women's budget impact statement in many places to summarise the context of the budget and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Um, you've said that women's budget statements, you'd read through women's budget statements over the years and found them to vary significantly in terms of their value. You've been asked many times in this committee why the government doesn't produce a women's budget statement. What changed? Senator, I think uh, the women's budget, with women's economic security statements uh, of, uh, of 2018, an initiative of, uh, of my predecessor, Kelly O'Dwyer, uh, the women's economic security statement of, uh, of 2020, have uh, done a very good job of uh, setting out some of those key issues, particularly around uh, women's economic security. 
Uh, but what we've been able to do with the, uh, with the women's budget statement is to deliver, I think, a very important initiative at a pivotal time, uh, frankly. So we are responding to unprecedented social, economic and health impacts of COVID-19. We are implementing our roadmap, roadmap to respect, uh, to uh, ensure that Australian workplaces are safe and are respectful. We're in the process of developing the next national plan that will set out our future ambitions for how we as a nation prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. And we're also, of course, uh, now also preparing for uh, a discussion on women's and economic security at National Cabinet in July. So it is a timely, uh, a timely bringing together of uh, a range of those, uh, well, of all of those issues, frankly, uh, in a women's budget statement that I think uh, reflects our strong commitment to the safety, to the economic security, to the leadership and health and wellbeing of women in Australia. Mm. That's very useful, but it doesn't really answer my question. The government has resisted producing such a document for seven years. You yourself have repudiated the need for such a document in this committee. My question is, what changed? Why do we have one in 2021 when we didn't have one for the last seven years? Senator McAllister, I've said um, that uh, I regard the value of the women's economic security statements uh, very highly, and I do. Uh, but I've also just set out the point in time at which we find ourselves uh, in relation to uh, a number of key policy issues, uh, whether it is the response to COVID-19 across a range of, uh, of, uh, of aspects, whether it is the response to the Respect at Work uh, inquiry, whether it is the development of the next national plan uh, on the prevention of violence against women and their children, whether it is uh, the discussions on women's economic security that, uh, that we have been having. So all of those things come together and I think are, are well responded to by a women's budget statement. Uh, and I have said before that having reviewed many of them, many of them, uh, they have been very variable uh, in both their approach uh, and, uh, and their impact. Uh, and in some cases in their values. So uh, this has been brought together with an eye to uh, those key issues uh, and I think an important marker uh, in the 2021-2022 uh, budget. I see. Uh, it, 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 Ms Hawkins, is it correct that the production of the women's budget statement was led by Treasury? Uh, that's right, mm. Senator. They did lead it and uh, we worked very closely with them in its production. Right. And were any Office for Women's Staffs actually seconded to Treasury for that They process? were, Senator. And who was who was seconded? So, so, so two of our staff were seconded. Right. So, two office for women staff. Uh, yes. Right. Which staff? I can give you their names. I'm happy to give you the, the name of the SES officer. Was Mug Thomas, indeed, who is the um, assistant secretary in our women's economic security and programs and leadership uh, team, mm -hmm. and the director of the women's economic security team. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Ms. Thomas, what day did you find out that you'd be seconded across to Treasury? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Mm. OK, when were you seconded to Treasury? In what period did you work at Treasury? Uh, I just don't have the dates in front of me, Senator. I wouldn't want to provide any misleading information. I'll have to take it on notice. Mm. Was it two months out from the budget, Ms Thomas? Senator, I can come in. Um, so uh, she may well have been seconded within the last, within the last couple of months. She may well have been seconded, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll just have to check the exact date. Yeah. Two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks out from the budget. Wait, Senator, I see where you're going. I, I just, Senator we Wilson. genuinely don't have the date with us and we're very happy to give it to you on notice. Ms do. Thomas, yeah. surely your diary indicates which building you worked in and under what department? Surely your memory. Senator, it was, it was within the last one to two months, is longer than, longer than one month. But we'll come back to you with the we will come back to you with the date. Perhaps we could try and come back to that today. We can we can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, how much longer would you say, Senator McAllister? Um, look, I have quite a lot more on this broad subject. Um, why don't I pause here, mm -hmm. allow other senators to ask some questions, and then I'll come back to that process. And that that sounds good to me be able to um, come back to us with um, mm -hmm. an outline of the period that she was seconded to Treasury and when that commenced. 
Senator, if I could, I, I think that we'll, um, we'll, we'll be able to give it to you after this, as, as we're physically here. We will need to, um, we will need to just get it for you after we've appeared. Uh, can you explain why that information is not available to Ms Thomas right now? Senator, can I add, it's Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary for Social Policy Group. Um, I just wanted to add that in addition to uh, a physical secondment, and we will have to check the date because I'm not actually sure of the date myself, but there was also regular engagement, many discussions that I had with my colleague Jenny Wilkinson, who was the Deputy Secretary leading that in Treasury. So there would also be that additional context we would want to put in that preceded a physical secondment where there were very intensive discussions and um, intensive collaboration going on for quite some time. So we, we would reference that in our response as well. We'll provide you that context because it is also directly germane to the collaboration between Treasury and the Office for Women in the production of the Women's Budget Statement and the time involved in that. Well, with, with respect, I, I don't think that's the question. Uh, you, that, that may be the answer that you want to give and the context that you want to give. I think Senator McAllister's question was pretty straightforward. Um, you may want to give that further detail on notice, but it should be simply a matter of checking diary records to, to ascertain the question that Senator McAllister's asked. And I think it's reasonable um, for the good order of this committee for the call to go to somebody else and in the intervening period for that answer to be provided to Senator McAllister when she uh, recommences her questions. Senator, Senator and the Wood officials have said that the date when they can reasonable response. Oh, Senator Payne, could you repeat that? Sorry, the, um, we just lost your bandwidth for a second. I said the officials have said they will provide the date when they can, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator Payne. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Senator McAllister. I too await the um, information about how long the comment was for. I'm less concerned about a specific date. I was more interested in, is it a matter of weeks, a matter of days, a matter of months? So we're, we're all looking forward to that advice. Um, Can I just ask clarification? Would you also like advice about the secondment proceeding? Because it's also into the future as well. Would that? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank Great. you. And the nature of what that secondment will be for now that it's in the post-budget period. Mm. Thank you. Certainly. That would be very helpful. Um, just in relate, sticking with the women's budget statement, it's not a women's budget impact statement in that it didn't do an analysis of the impact on women of the proposed budget measures and then also do a uh, summation and analysis of the impact on women once the budget was announced. It wasn't an on the way in and on the way out. It was simply a collation. Um, so I just want to make that clear, given that what we used to have, um, it's very different in nature from what we used to have. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but that's my understanding. Um, I too am interested in the level of engagement that you had in producing that document. Uh, sounds like we'll have to wait for your dates. Can you answer me whether or not um, the Office of Women was consulted on the decision not to put superannuation on government funded paid parental leave, as was mooted in the week prior to the budget? Senator, in terms of, um, I just want to go to your previous comment slash question, if I may, when you, uh, you you made a point about the fact that this women's budget statement is different to mm. the previous ones, mm. and I uh, was hearing you make some comments about the relative nature of the analysis in this women's budget statement compared to the previous ones. I, I would just point out um, to you and to the committee that there is a good deal of gender impact analysis in this women's budget statement. There, mm. there is a chapter on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on women that goes through uh, and uses a range of data to show indeed what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been on women. It, it talks about employment by gender. It talks about the changes in hours worked by parents. Uh, it, it breaks it down according to the ages of the youngest child. Um, it gives uh, a snapshot of what is happening in the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, in terms of women's safety, uh, the same kind of thing. It, it goes through and, and talks about uh, partner violence experienced uh, by women uh, and likewise in the women's economic security uh, chapter. Uh, there also is analysis about the gender pay gap that shows that it has narrowed over time, but it remains significant. There, is, there are charts about 
uh, the full-time ordinary earnings. Sorry, the men are talking and I can't hear the witness. Would you mind either turning the volume up or can people keep their, yes, their side no. chats down? Um, sorry, Chair, that wasn't so, sorry, a, that wasn't a reflection on you. It was to... more that there were groupings no, no, of dudes having right. chats can while we... we talk about women. Yes, if we're having off the side chats outside of the room, please, Thank we'll you. keep it to a dog. Please walk. continue, Ms Hawkins. It's also that I'm hard of hearing, so thank you for turning the volume up before. Uh, so, Senator, also in the Women's Economic Security uh, chapter, it does actually talk about the full-time ordinary earnings uh, at the gender pay gap by industry, and there are a couple of really good um, bar graphs and scatter plots that actually show um, that, you know, in mining and construction, that as we know, that uh, the, the gender pay gap is, is quite large. Um, it, so it, there is quite a lot of analysis about participation, employment, uh, enterprise. So I, I just wanted to have an opportunity to share that with you, that there, there is a range of analysis about the position of women in terms of women's economic security, of, of women's safety, of women's leadership, and then the various measures and initiatives that the government has agreed to as part of this $3.4 billion package then relate to those issues and challenges that have been articulated in the analytical parts of the chapter. So, so I think, so I, I, would, I would share with you uh, that, that there is actually gender analysis in here uh, about what the, what the various measures are. Thank you. My, my point was that it wasn't a gender lens on the way in as the budget was being prepared. So I accept everything you've said, but mm -hmm. I think that also stands alongside my point. But my question in particular, as I'm sure you recall, was yes, whether or not the Office of Women was consulted about the decision not to put superannuation on paid parental leave payments as had been mooted in the week prior to the budget. So, Senator, there were, um, as you would as you would imagine that there are a range of, of policies that are discussed uh, when governments are developing budgets uh, and and on that super one I, I would have to take that on notice as well senator in in terms of um, in terms of advice I I have to say that I, I was away for a couple of critical weeks and so I, I would have to take that on notice. Okay. Senator. Is there anyone yeah. else at the table that was involved when that decision not to have super on PPL well, as but was Senator, I'm actually going to, Senator, I'm actually going to suggest that uh, in the preparation of, uh, of uh, a budget there is uh, a vast range of discussions and I'm not going to ask the Office for Women uh, to comment on which discussions they were or were not involved in. Well, I am, because that's why we're here in estimates, and that's what I've done, and that first well, one's no, that's been taken. Well, that's not the case, Senator. A budget is a budget is a, uh, a process of the Cabinet to bring together uh, the uh, measures and the initiatives that form the budget, and I am going to suggest, Senator, that I'm not going to ask the officials to comment on the in or out um, approach that you might want to take on uh, on different policy measures that were speculated about um, in the uh, in the weeks preceding a budget, the budget is the, is a matter of record, and if you want to go to those issues, then that's a different matter. Sorry, I don't understand why in budget estimates I can't ask whether the Office of Women was consulted on the abandonment of a policy to put super on PPL for women. I genuinely don't understand how that's in any way out of order. Well. Senator, I completely reject your characterisation as the abandonment. That's my policy. question. For a start, for a start. Uh, and secondly, the budget is, as you know, as you would know, I assume, the preparation of a budget is uh, a cabinet process that brings together a whole range of uh, discussions and initiatives and policy considerations. Uh, and it's not appropriate, in my view, for officials to comment one by one on what you might have read in the newspapers in the uh, in the run-up to the budget. If you want to ask about measures which are in the budget, uh, then please, we will be happy to respond on those. In the lead-up to the budget, was the Office of Women tasked with undertaking any work pertaining to whether superannuation should be paid on PPL at any point? Senator, the budget, let me say again, is a cabinet process, and I'm not going to ask the officials to um, engage in uh, open speculation on those aspects of the cabinet process. If you want to ask about measures which are in the budget, then of course we can comment on those. Well, I'm not asking you to ask them. I'm asking them directly, as is, I understand, my ability to do so, given that we are in estimates. I'm, and that, I'm that entitled to ask about Senator, the work of, correct, of the Senator office. That's correct, Senator Waters, but we probably are um, sailing perilously close to the line of where we 
broach over into policy questions which are best directed to the minister, yes. as you would be aware. I, I understand that. My, I was simply asked whether the office had been tasked with looking at that issue. That is a perfectly uh, within rules question that I believe is about to be answered. Uh, Senator, I was just going to um, suggest that with any measures, um, if, with regard to superannuation, they would emanate from the Department of Treasury. Um, so we would not be tasked to develop a measure or it would not emanate from the Office for Women's Superannuation is the responsibility of Minister Hume um, and she's supported from the Department of Treasury. So, okay. so you wouldn't be asked and you weren't asked and you didn't do any work on that particular issue? Is that I'm right? not commenting on, on budget processes, deliberations that, that would have gone on on budget measures, but it, any superannuation measure would not have emanated from the Office for Women. I understand that, but surely someone would have asked you as the Office of Women. I'm really, like for the, about the sixth year running, I'm really just trying to get a handle on what it is that you guys do and whether you're given that preeminence to input into the policy development process. And I, I would really like the answer to be that you are, but I, 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 I don't get answers to my questions in successive estimates. And I genuinely want to understand how you are utilised as an important organ of government. And so I want you to have input, but you never answer me when I ask you whether you have or not. So I'm sorry, but I just, I don't know, I'm trying to understand what it is you do do. So Senator, I can definitely answer the question when you ask me a, a question like that to say, what do you do? Uh, what we do is in relation to when the government decides it wants to do a women's budget statement, which they have this year, uh, that in this instance, we worked really closely with Treasury, as I've just said. I put two very key people from the Office for Women into the Treasury so that we were operating like as close as you possibly could. Uh, and that, you know, my team then were a conduit back to us in the Office for Women, where we were involved in in putting this package together with Treasury. We were involved in going out to other departments, seeing what kind of proposals were around, formulating um, the, this package of measures that has, has gone to the government. So that, that is a, a very large piece of work. Uh, in terms of the, the other work that we do, given, given the nature of your question, you know, we, we do a range of things. We, so the Australian government has got its 50% um, gender diversity target, so the Office for Women uh, is the organisation within government that reports on that. So we do the annual report for that. We work with other departments so that you've seen that there has been a steady increase in the number of women on Australian government boards. So in, in December last year, that has now hit 49.5%. Um, uh, in the women's safety space, of course, Minister Payne co-chairs the Women's Safety Task Force, which is set up under the National um, Federation Reform Council, Senator Payne, Minister for Women, uh, co-chairs that with Minister Rustin, the Minister for, for Women's Safety. So we in the Office for Women work very closely with our colleagues in DSS uh, to help shape those task force meetings. Uh, those meetings at the moment are very useful in terms of paving the way for the development of the next national plan on women's safety. Uh, so that next national plan uh, that will follow the current one that ends in the middle of uh, next year, in the middle of 2022. That's a major piece of policy work that the Office for Women is doing jointly with the Department of, of Social Services. Uh, we've talked before about the fact that there has been a, a parliamentary inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence. Uh, so, so teams are looking at the work from that parliamentary committee report with a view to informing uh, the, next, um, the next national plan. We've just been having conversations about the Women's Leadership Development Program. That is now a very much expanded um, grants program that the Office for Women runs. So there's a, there's a large range of, of, of work that we do in the Office for Women. Okay, look, yeah. thank you for that clarification. Conscious of the time, I will um, proceed to ask a few more sure. specific questions sure. that you may or may not be able to, um, to, sure. to answer me at this point in time. Uh, but I do appreciate that context, thank you. Mm. Um, so just coming back to uh, decisions that were taken in the budget, mm. um, did you or did you not have input onto whether or not super should be given on PPL? Senator, 
I've, I've listened to what my minister has said. I, I am, when you ask me a question about did we or did we not have input into something in the budget, like we have been very helpful with the committee before and mm -hmm. after the um, October 2020 budget, we went yes, no on all the different things that you asked me. You're asking a different kind of question now about did we did we advise on something that, that isn't in the budget? Um, I've listened to what the minister has said. I am happy to take the question on notice uh, because it's a, I don't have with me a list of things that we did or that are not in the budget uh, that we did or did not. It's, it's a different kind of question well, to the ones that- I'd love that list on notice, thank you. If well, there's more than one issue, please <laughs> give us all of that's, them. That's not, it's obviously, you know, Senator. Thank you. I, I await that list with great interest. C can we can we clarify on that, Senator, that um, I'm taking on notice the question that you have asked me about? Did we advise on something that's not in the budget on the super on the super? Well, my actual issue. question before we had some uh, instruction was: Had you worked on that issue in the lead up to the budget? Have we worked on superannuation? Yes, broadly on PPL. On PPL, super on PPL. We'll take that question on Thank notice, you. Senator. OK. Now, likewise, we consulted on the decision to provide only 200000 to the working women's centres in Queensland and the Northern Territory. So on that one, in terms of where we consulted, so obviously it is part of the, of the women's budget statement, uh, and so we were aware of that. So, so to that, that level, uh, we, we definitely had visibility of that proposal going through the budget process, yes. Okay, that's a bit different to consulted though, isn't it? I don't understand the, the language. What, what was your input sought on the quantum? I might just ask my um, colleague, Ms Brochure, if she's got anything further to... You, you'll understand, Senator, that there, there are, it's a $3.4 billion package. It's a very large package, so if Ms Brochure can, can assist. I think um, Elizabeth Brochure, Assistant Secretary, PMNC. Um, can you just give me your question again? Yes, whether so or not we 200 will... grand for the Working Women's Centres, Queensland and NT. Um, why so little? and was the Office of Women consulted on the quantum? Uh, Senator, so, Senator, in response, in relation to the initiative itself, it is uh, an initiative or a uh, funding measure of the Department of the Attorney General, as I understand it. Uh, so the Department of the Attorney General can speak to, uh, to quantum um, and Ms Brayshaw can perhaps help on any other issue. Okay, so was the Office of Women consulted on the quantum, albeit that it was a Justice and Attorney General decision ultimately? So, Senator, what I might just come in and say is that we, we understand from our colleagues in the Attorney General's department that it is an interim funding, the um, 0 .2, 0 0.2 million, to support the continued delivery of services, mm. um, and that it'll be a matter for the, as, as the Minister of Women has just pointed out, it, it is going to be a matter for the Attorney General to, to determine next steps on that. And was the Office of Women consulted at any point on the quantum of that amount? And Senator, I can say yes, we were aware of the proposal and it was in the context of the government's response to the roadmap to respect, which is one of the recommendations about working with all governments as to appropriate funding for working women's centres. So my understanding is, is that um, through Attorney General's Department and the Attorney General, there's further conversations still to be had with states and territories around that recommendation. Yes, I accept all of that. Was your office consulted on that matter? Senator for the Whip. fourth time, I'm so, I don't understand no. why it's so hard to say yes or no. S Senator, I, I, what I can say to you is that um, I guess it is just this concept of consultation, right? Like, so we, yes. we definitely know that this proposal is going through, so we well, Did we're anyone in ask you whether it was a good or bad idea? What did you think about it? You know, how would you change it if so, you could wave a wand? So like, maybe that's what I, I think could, of as consultation. Maybe I could frame it in a different way because we, we are trying to be helpful to you, that what I would more say is that, that, that a whole range of proposals come forward. Uh, and uh, as we've said before, and I, and I know that you, you take the approach of like going through a list of what did we see and what did we comment on, but what we have said to you before also is that the Office for Women is, is not the only source of advice to the government in terms of looking at the gender impacts on policy. And so what we do in the Office for Women is that we use the resources that we have got to be able to go in and, and, and look, at, look in, in varying degrees of detail at policies at different times. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely not that I'm um, 
not trying to answer your question. What I'm more trying to say is that we see a whole range of proposals yes. and it's not so much a question of like, were we consulted on everything? It's that we need to make decisions about what we, uh, what we look at in more detail than, than other things. So in, in terms of our office, we, we use our resources to decide which ones we go into. So I'm in wanting to answer your question, I'm, I'm not wanting to mislead you, I'm not wanting to be difficult, but I'm saying to you that we, we see a lot of these proposals yes. and then there are choices about what we might go into at any given time, okay. which is why I pause to think, would I characterise that as being consulted? That's, yes, that's okay. where I'm coming from. If you had more resources, would you be able to do that deeper dive into all of those issues that come before you? I think that the Office for Women would, would always be prioritising which ones that you would look at. Because as we have talked a lot to the committee before, the, each minister and each department is charged with looking at policies and programs for all Australians, and that includes women. And as we've also talked about before, that the Minister for Women and the Office for Women focus on some, some key areas, and we've talked about those of women's safety, women's economic security and women's leadership. We in our office focus on specific things within those areas to try to turbocharge different parts of, mm. of the government's policy. Mm. So, so there's, a, there's a range of things that we do. Uh, so you're, I get it, you're selective, you've got limited resources, you make strategic decisions, that's yeah. okay. And it's yeah. also okay to say that. Thank yes. you for, for sharing that. Yeah. So you can simply say, no, we didn't have the resources to do a deep dive on that particular issue because we were looking at these other issues. I'd love you to look at all of the issues I would, I would see you fully resourced so that you could be a genuinely, uh, really effective agency. And, and so I don't blame you for not having the resources to, to look at everything in a deep way. I, I hold the government of the day accountable for Senator, that. Senator, what, what I would say is that I, I see my role um, as, the, as the head of the office women to, to do what I have just been discussing. And I would also say now that the Prime Minister has set up the Cabinet Task Force on Women's Safety and Women's Economic Security, that there are, um, as Minister Payne said in her opening statement, uh, Minister Rustin is the Minister for Women's Safety, uh, Minister Hume is the Minister for Women's Economic Security, there is Assistant Minister, so there's actually an expanded women's portfolio now with then expanded departmental resources that are supporting those, those ministers as well. So it really does go to this point that the Office of Women plays a valuable role supporting the, the Minister for Women, but we're just absolutely not the exclusive source of advice to the government across the board on these issues. Mm. Okay. Look, I dare not ask any more specific questions about the budget because I'm conscious of the time. I do have um, a few other questions. I'm not sure about everybody's patience. Um, we'll just... I'll seek views from the rest of the committee. We urge you to have an afternoon tea break imminently. We can work through the afternoon tea break, but I'm aware that Senator McAllister has a few more yes. questions, Senator Seawood has a few more questions, you have a few more questions, Senator Waters, and I have about five minutes worth of questions for the Office for Women. Chair, I've got some questions too. You've got well. some questions for Office right, for Women? Or, or so, yeah. would yes, you, yeah. yep. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll this one too now. Okay. Yeah. Come up with them, I, I've had a good <laughs> go. I'm happy to pass the call over. Do but we I would think like we can get it done in 15 day. minutes and work through afternoon tea, or would we prefer to take afternoon tea now and come back in 15 minutes? I think, given that coalition senators appear to have 10 minutes of questions mm -hmm. and green senators appear to have 10 minutes of questions, doing it in 15 minutes sounds very unlikely because yes, that doesn't really accommodate, even say. in that scenario, yes. me having any questions. Yes. Okay. In that case. We will go to afternoon tea now and we will reconvene at quarter to four. Thank you. We'll recommence at 3.54 p.m. and I will uh, hand the call to Labor for 10 minutes. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Ms Thomas, have you had a chance to check your records? Yes, I have, Senator. Uh, and Catherine, Ms Hawkins yes. will respond on my behalf. <laughs> so, Senator, we, we did have a look and uh, we're uh, glad that we took it on notice because um, all of our... Uh, so it's, it's good to, to know what the answer was. So, Senator, the budget discussions were ongoing, as they normally are. 
uh, and the physical secondment commenced on the 26th of April. 26th of April. So two weeks out from the budget, someone from the Office of Women is seconded into Treasury. And, and, a sec and uh, just one person? Two, two people, Senator. So um, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Women's Economic Security Programs and Leadership Branch, and then uh, one of her colleagues, the Director of the Women's Economic Security Section. And Senator, I would just underline that, um, as my colleague, Deputy Secretary Frame, was saying before, uh, that that, that in, in no way was the start of the discussions. It was when the physical um, secondment happened. I see. Um, Minister, when were you informed that there was going to be a women's budget statement? Senator, these uh, discussions are, are ongoing around uh, the form that uh, a budget will take. Uh, and uh, the ERC process uh, itself, I've participated in uh, a number of those uh, discussions, as you would expect, over the months um, preceding the budget. and. Uh, the form in which it has come together uh, ensured that it was one of the, um, uh, I'm not, I, I think they're called blue books, even though they're not blue, um, one of the, uh, the blue books uh, that was uh, presented and of course it forms uh, part of uh, a number of the other budget publications. So an ongoing process, Senator, um, as I've said, and I was part of that uh, ERC, uh, as a pro ERC process as appropriate. Okay, so it's an ERC decision. When was that decision taken? Uh, Senator, um, I don't have a particular uh, time or, uh, or date uh, for you. As I said, it was part of the ongoing budget discussions over a period of time. Four weeks before the budget? Two weeks before the budget? I mean, last time the document didn't make it to the printer on time, so you'll understand the level of interest in trying to find out when this process was initiated. Uh, well, Senator, I think you'll see from the uh, the budget material, both in terms of uh, portfolio budget statements, in terms of, as I said, um, what is known as the uh, as the blue book, the women's budget statement, uh, the incorporation of uh, the issues, particularly around uh, safety and economic security, right through the budget publications. Uh, that this is core uh, to the uh, to the budget 2021-22. With respect, that answer is not responsive to my question. My question was, when was the decision taken to develop such a publication? Uh, well, there are multiple publications, as I said, oh, Senator. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested in the women's budget statement. Uh, so I said I don't have a particular date or time. It was uh, an iterative process, Senator, and uh, part of the ongoing discussion through the ERC process and the Cabinet process. Well, it wasn't a feature of last year's budget and it was a feature of this year's budget. So at some point, someone signed off on the idea that there was going to be a women's budget statement. Is there a reason that you can't provide that information to the Senate? I don't have a particular time, Senator. It's been part of the ongoing discussion uh, for the preparation of, of this budget, as you can see by the budget material. Mm, but there was a decision point when the form of the budget was determined. What date was that? I don't have that date, Senator. Can you take that on notice, Minister? Sure. I've asked you four times when the decision was taken to produce a budget statement. I've explained that the context is that last time it was taken so late mm. that it didn't make it to the printer. Mm. I'm interested in understanding when this government finally decided to produce a women's budget statement. I thought you just asked me to take it on notice and I said, sure, of course I will, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry if you didn't hear me, Senator. Whose idea was it? Ms Hawkins, I heard your answers to Ms Waters about um, the scope of your, the nature of your involvement in the policy decisions of government. Can you identify an important economic decision that the Office of Women has been deeply involved in making? I've asked about this a lot, so I'm interested if you can think of one. I, I struggle to think of one. Senator, I would say that uh, in this women's budget statement uh, that has the, the $3.4 billion worth of initiatives in it, uh, if you have a look at the, when we look at the fact that $1.9 billion 
is for improving women's economic security. $1.7 billion of that uh, goes towards uh, childcare, uh, further childcare assistance, uh, and the Office for Women was involved in those childcare discussions closely with our colleagues in, in DESI uh, and Treasury and other departments. Uh, the the $1.1 billion of the women's safety package that I referred to before, as I have, uh, have said to the committee before, women's safety is shared by the policy responsibility is shared by Minister Payne as the Minister for Women and Minister Rustin as the Minister for Women's Safety, and so the Office for Women uh, was involved in, in working through various safety proposals with our colleagues in, in DSS at various stages of the process. Mm, okay. Which department had the lead on the budget measure, uh, Women's Economic Security Package in BP2? So in terms of the overall women's budget statement, so as No, no, the budget measure, women's economic security package that's listed in BP2 at page 81. Yes, yes. Were you Senator, in the lead for that? So, Senator, what I was about to say to you is that that, that um, package that you're referring to is, of course, you know, a major part of the women's budget statement. And uh, Treasury had the, the overall lead on the women's budget statement, and we worked very closely with Treasury on that. Oh, I see. And... Who led the production of the measure Women's Safety, which is listed in BP2 on page 83? Yeah, so as I was saying before, our, our colleagues in Department of Social Services uh, did a, a range of the work on the Women's Safety package. And as I was saying before, in terms of the, the policy for women's safety being shared, we in the Office for Women work closely with our colleagues on that, including in that, that package that's in BP2. Uh, and those initiatives are in the Women's Budget Statement that we've been talking about. So DSS led that, but you had input. Uh, which department led the measure on women's health that's in BP2 on page 125? So the health um, package is led by our colleagues in the Department of Health, Senator. I see. It was reported in the Sun Herald on April 25 that Treasury had emailed the Department of Health on Tuesday the 20th of April asking for urgent input uh, from health on things that the government were doing that would benefit women. Had you been doing any work with the Department of Health to develop a women's health package prior to that email being sent on the 20th of April? Senator, I'd have to, I'd have to take that on notice about the health side of it. I'd have to take that on notice. Okay, so did the work plan for the Office for Women over the last 12 months involve work on health prior to the 20th of April? So in terms of the, I guess there are two, two parts to this. So there's the Office for Women, and we have talked in, in detail before about the priority work that we work on for, for Minister Payne as the Minister mm -hmm. for Women. So safety, women's safety, economic security, leadership and the targeted international work. So our colleagues in the Department of Health take the lead on the women's health strategy. Uh, and uh, so we, I would say that um, that, that work is, is, is primarily led by Department of Health, Senator. Right. Okay. Um, were you consulted on the Family Housing Guarantee? So, Senator, I, in terms of the way I was, was answering Senator Waters' question before about the Working Women's Centre, uh, we it's definitely, obviously, one of the, the measures in the uh, statement in, in terms of um, formal discussions and consultation. I don't know whether my colleague, Ms Thomas, has got Perhaps I can ask a more precise question. Did you see it prior to receiving a Cabinet submission? We have conversations with a range of agencies on a range of policies and specifically as to whether or not we saw that precise mm. one, um, mm. given how many initiatives there are. Mm. We we just really okay. need to check that. Were well, you consulted on the decision about SAC's ERO funding? You've previously advised that you hadn't provided any advice on that uh, in your answer to question on Notice 42. Were you subsequently consulted about the SAC's ERO funding decision? So, S Senator, I, I think that we will probably have to take that on notice as well in, in terms of the way you're asking the, the questions. We, we, have, we knew that it was on foot uh, when, we, um, when we talked to you last time. We, we gave you the answer that we did. You will see that the government has decided to, uh, to invest in that, uh, to support the SACS ERO in, in the housing sector. Uh, so, so that is one of, the, uh, one of the initiatives that is included in the Women's Budget Statement. Were you consulted on the aged care announcement in the budget? So, Senator, in terms of the uh, aged care uh, uh, announcement, uh, I might ask my colleague, Deputy Secretary Frame, to, uh, to talk about that. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator, uh, 
that was obviously led, the package led by the Department of Health, mm -hmm. um, but colleagues from Treasury, uh, Finance, and myself in PMNC and another and the health team there, and also DESI and DSS um, formed an interdepartmental committee that were consulted extensively in the development of that package. So yes, we were consulted extensively on that package as it was prepared. All right. Senator McAllister, this is ten minutes. Okay. Look, I guess uh, further to Senator Waters' question, I'm trying to understand what. The department, the, the Office for Women Awards, actually doing in relation to this women's budget statement. Minister, did you have final sign off on the women's budget statement? Um, Senator, the women's budget statement was uh, prepared by um, uh, by officials in the normal process, as you as you would expect, and uh, I was part of the sign off process for that. Yes. It just sounds to me like this was all pulled together very last minute, officials seconded two weeks before the budget. None of you can tell me when you first heard of the idea of a women's budget statement or say that tell me this with any clarity. And a range of measures appear to have been led by someone else. So I'm Senator, I absolutely disagree with, with, with you. Um, we are, as, as Ms Hawkins has, uh, has gone through, the Office for Women Works uh, across government with agencies, as does the, uh, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Ms Bray, in PMNC. Uh, they lead in uh, the coordination and the discussion of a significant number of, uh, of these policy areas. But ultimately, every single department uh, is still also responsible for ensuring that they are delivering policies that are responsive to the key policy, policy issues of the day. That's actually how you pull together uh, a statement of this nature, Senator, with the involvement of the Department of Health, with the involvement of officials responsible for women's safety, officials responsible for aged care. Uh, and in fact, uh, as, as frustrating as it may be to you, Senator, I think what the women's budget statement has shown in uh, 2021 uh, is the work that the government is doing and uh, the importance of the work that the government is doing and the measures that we are supporting. Well, thank you for that explanation. I actually, the last seven years, the model that you describe has been in place, where each individual department is responsible for their own decisions in relation to women. And we haven't had very good results for women at all over the last seven years. I was just wondering if anything had changed, but it sounds like the answer to that is no. All right, thank you, Chair. That's all I've got. Thank you, Senator McCullough. Well, I think we demonstrate some very significant investments and commitments uh, on these key policy issues, and that, again, you are wrong. Okay. Um, we do seem to have lost the visual of Senator Payne there. Sadly, I know, Senator, uh, Senator Chandler, I was having difficulty hearing and seeing the video, so I thought it might um, narrow the... Um, uh, yeah. make it easier if I just reduced it to uh, sound. Right. Thank you very much for updating us with that, Senator Payne. Um, I just have a couple of questions for the Office for Women, um, and following that I will hand over to Senator Canavan for another couple of coalition questions, and then we will go to the Greens to round out this section of the day. Um, as the Office for Women, what defini definition of woman do you use? What definition of women do we use? Could you well maybe give us a bit more context of course. for the um, question? You oversee and promote a range of initiatives, funding programs, um, specifically designated for women. Um, how do you define what a woman is to determine eligibility for the purposes of providing advice on women's policy to government and ministers? So, um, in terms of in the Office for Women, we, we recognise uh, individuals who identify as women, uh, and that's in accordance with the Australian Government guidelines on the recognition of sex and gender. Right. Um, on what basis do you use those guidelines to guide that decision, that, 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 that policy position? So, Senator, um, 
in terms of answering your question, as, as I say, we, we follow the Australian Government guidelines on the recognition of sex and gender. So um, I guess in terms of uh, looking at our grants program, to take an example. So uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit uh, today about the expansion of the Women's Leadership yeah. and Development Program. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, the grant guidelines, it, would, it, would talk, it talks about the fact that those grants are there to assist women's safety, um, women's economic security, women's leadership, to, to um, boost women's workforce participation, to, to assist to keep women safe. Uh, and then in terms of, uh, in terms of the definition, uh, it then comes back to where I started in answer to your question. Uh, in terms of, of us uh, recognising any individual who identifies as, as a woman. So to be clear then, the Office for Women is not focused exclusively on policies for the betterment of biological women? Senator, I, th I think I can only repeat what I've just said in terms of uh, what we do is following the Australian Government guidelines. Okay, thank you for those responses. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Ms. Hawkins, I, I think I heard you say that um, I think you heard, heard you say that construction and mining industries have a have a larger pay gender yeah. pay gap than, mm. than average. Mm. Yes, Senator. That's the case. Yes, Senator. Can you explain why I, I've got the Workplace Gender Equality Agency's a very useful comparison tool here? Yes. Yes. And they say that. Um, the gender pay gap in the coal mining industry is only 14.3% compared to 20% for all industries. And mining as a whole, the gender pay gap is 13.6%, and the gender pay gap is 20% for all industries. So what, is this data wrong? So, Senator, let me, um, I I'm, thank you for, for raising the question, because in fact, I was, when I was talking <coughs> um, before, I had a scatter plot diagram and a bar graph in front of me. So I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to say that it, in terms of the gender pay gap by industry of the document that's on page, the table that's on page 37 of the women's budget statement, that in terms of looking at the highest gender pay gaps by industry, that the top ones are professional services, finance, healthcare, um, rental services, construction, and then we've got media administration and mining about in the middle of the pack. So thank you, Senator. I was actually okay. looking at the chart next to it. And um, okay. so thank well, you for Well, if that. you could take on, notice, um, take on notice whether or not this data is correct, or well, just the question whether or not uh, the gender pay gap in mining is below average. Sure, uh, Senator, I can. But, but as I... It's a detailed question. As that, I've graph said doesn't, in, that graph might not indicate the average, I suppose, does it? Or, uh, it? It's the, it's the full-time ordinary earnings right. gender pay gap by industry. But, but we can absolutely take yeah, it on okay. notice, Senator. Okay. And okay. Uh, indeed, our good colleagues from Wajia are obviously coming yep. in next. And, yeah, and I was they will be that, able so. to correct uh, however I misspoke in the, earlier, um, in the earlier evidence, Senator. Have you gone to some of those industries that are below average and checked with them what they're doing right? So, Senator, we are aware of um, uh, what a range of industries are doing. Like, so to, to take an example, uh, just as we've been talking about mining, uh, I know that the Minerals Council of Australia uh, is doing a lot of work in the space of addressing sexual harassment. Uh, and uh, the minister has mentioned this in the past. So there are a, a number of industries that know that it makes good business sense to narrow that gender pay gap. Uh, and as I say, our colleagues in Wajia do a lot of good work of, of working with businesses to, to really make the business case about um, why you would want to narrow the gender pay gap and that you'd want to uh, increase women's workforce participation uh, because the very interesting research that Wajia has conducted with Bankwest Curtin um, does actually show uh, that there is a very good bottom line business case for profitability of countries uh, to, to increase your, your gender diversity in your firms. Yeah. Um, just on another topic, um, are you or the government uh, looking to develop any policies to help the 30% of women who work at home look after their own children? Mm. So, Senator, um, in terms of in terms of your question, I've just got the, the overview of the women's budget statement in front of me. And 
I guess in terms of the kind of issues that we've been talking about, it, the government makes it very clear in the overview that for Australia to succeed, Australian women need the freedom and opportunities to make genuine choices yeah. uh, about their career and their future, uh, be free from violence and the threat and the threat of violence. So, so Senator, I would say that while a focus of the women's economic security part of the women's budget statement is on looking at how to increase women's workforce participation, given um, the, the about 10% gap between women's and men's um, participation, uh, that the women's budget statement, and indeed, of course, the government's policy, um, absolutely recognises uh, the genuine choice that individuals make about what they, what they want to do. So, so there's nothing specific uh, to help or support those women who work at home and look after their own children, they're still working. I mean, I tell you, my wife indeed works, works harder than me. In, <laughs> um, but, in, indeed they yeah. are. Indeed they are working, Senator. Um, there, is, there is no doubt about that. I guess what I'm saying to you is that in the, in the context of, of this particular work okay. uh, that the government's doing, so I'm sure that there would be a range of well, I'm, not, I'm sure, like I know that there are a range of, of other mechanisms. So our um, colleagues in, in other departments, such as the Department of Social Services, uh, there are a range of uh, measures and programs and, and support um, for, for women absolutely who are at home. Uh, in terms of the, the focus of this, uh, it is about removing barriers to women's workforce participation for those who want to do that. So, so choice, of, of course, is, is a very key um, theme here. Doesn't seem to support choice, though, it's only helping some. Um, just on another topic, quick, I've, I've got limited time, um, so it's last, last set of questions. Um, it, it is illegal to, for a company to pay uh, a male uh, a higher wage than, than a female for the same work, is that correct? Yeah, Senator, yes. yes. Are, there, are there any recent cases of that occurring or any or do you, do you, in your role, look for if anyone's breaking the law and seek to take cases up to enforce the law? So, Senator, it's, it's not actually a role that we have in the Office right. of Women to look at that particular issue. Um, and I guess what I would say, just coming off the back of our conversation about the gender pay gap, yep. is that the gender pay gap is more about women's overall position in the workforce. Sure. Um, so uh, sometimes people think that the gender pay gap is actually about the fact that um, women are not paid the same for as men as the same Yeah, it's work, an important distinction. It is, um, yeah. um, But there's no evidence that then, or there's no cases or examples of men and women being paid differently for the same work. So. So what I would say is that um, I did, and it's a little while ago now, so uh, I will correct the record if I am not getting it exactly right, um, but there has been research about comparing graduate salaries of men and women, so even looking at the graduate level before, uh, in many instances, perhaps... I, I'm sorry to pull you up, I've just got such limited time. I've just, it's so, a simple question, I mean, is there any evidence? Yes. I mean, so, I'm talking about research or comparing averages. Yes. Uh, because all that obviously has a range of, it's a multivariate equation, which is hard to pin down. Just very simply, is there any evidence that men, in, a specific example uh, of a company or, or, or a business or public service where someone employed uh, as a male is being paid more than someone employed as a female for the same work? Senator, I do hear your question about asking me about individuals. Um, that, that's not something that, that I have, have got um, uh, visibility of, but I will say to you that there is this research that does show that there is a, in dentistry, to take an example, there is a very large divergence between male and female starting graduate salaries, which tells us that there is something going on there in terms of um, that, uh, that research says that that's something that's going on. So why doesn't well that get referred to the appropriate authorities to enforce the law if that's something? I because as you said, it's illegal if that was the case. It would be illegal to do that. So why not take that up with the legal authorities? Senator, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I guess what that right. it, it, it is looking at uh, what is happening across a whole industry. Right. So I'm, okay. I'm not sure that the, the research is, is That's going right, into actually pinging it's, individual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but there is research that does show that kind of divergence at the, at the graduate level, which is why it is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Seawatch. Thank you. I wanted to go to single parents mm -hmm. and single mothers, obviously, given um, you're the Office of Women. 
80 percent of single parents are women. Mm -hmm. Are you doing specific work on single parents and particularly those uh, single mothers and that particularly those that are living in poverty? So, Senator, a, a couple of things that I would say is that uh, in terms of one of the initiatives in the women's budget statement. Uh, that is increasing the childcare subsidy for families with two or more children aged uh, five and under. There, uh, there's that measure that is in the the budget. Um, the uh, other one is well, a another one that the government has announced is this family home guarantee. Yes, I and want to come to that. Yeah, but specifically. So, I want to know what other work you're looking at. I want to come to the guarantee in a minute. And oh, okay. Um, let's go first to the broader issue of single mothers living in poverty, since a high rate of single mothers are living in poverty. Don't see how you can afford a house when you're living in poverty, but... No, Senator, I, I, I hear you, and um, I, I hear you saying that you want me to come to the Family Home Guarantee uh, later, but it, it is part of my answer to your question for the moment, is that in recognition of the fact that... Um, uh, so the recognising obviously the importance of housing and, and, the, and the government is building on this first home loan deposit scheme, as you've probably seen in the women's budget statement, that uh, from the 1st of July this year, there will be this 10,000 family home guarantees that will be yep. made available and to eligible single parents with dependents. Uh, and the key thing here is that uh, the single parents with dependents will be able to purchase a home with a deposit as, as little as 2%. 2%. When you're um, living on parenting payment single, or as many single mothers are, um, living on job seeker. Hence my question about the broader issue in poverty, mm. leading to then, since you went there, mm. the housing guarantee. Mm. Did you, and I've obviously been here for the whole of this discussion, so mm -hmm. I've heard it. I'm still mm -hmm. going to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Would you have provided advice saying this is the single most important thing you do for single mothers who are living in poverty who probably can't even afford the 2 per cent? So, Senator, what I would say in answer to your question is that, that this particular initiative will actually... is said to actually assist 125,000 um, single-parent homes uh, with this. So, so that, is, that is a significant number of, of people, and I, I take your point, but I'm just uh, letting you know that it is estimated that around 125,000 single parents with dependents may be eligible um, for this. And the calculation that the Melbourne Institute's done is that a mortgage, you need the mortgage that an average single parent mm -hmm. or single mother could, well, it's for single parents, majority of whom are single mothers, the average mortgage they could get was around 370000 to 375000 mm -hmm. How's that going to buy a house in Sydney or Melbourne? No, I, I, I hear your point, um, Senator. Um, I will just ask my colleague, Ms Thomas, to, to add, add to my answer. Thanks. Uh, yes, look, the specifics of that program, um, the Treasury would be best placed to answer any details around the, those particulars. I suppose we very much look at um, broad supports that we can provide to women to prevent them from ending up in that situation in the first place, as well as then uh, uh, response uh, arrangements and so the government certainly does provide considerable funding to the states and territories on housing and homelessness or to go towards housing and homelessness services. That doesn't, thank you, and I'm not dishing, you know, you're trying to prevent people, women falling into those circumstances. The fact is we already have a lot of single parents and single mothers that are living in poverty. So what other responses uh, were you consulted on any other responses to deal with women and children living in poverty besides the housing guarantee? Or was this, were you just asked, did you come up with it? Did you suggest it? Did you provide any other advice on how you address single mothers living in poverty? Senator, if I could just add um, some additional information. The family home guarantee is the one that is in the women's budget statement, but there is also uh, more expansive work as well as the national um, housing agreement and, and funding to the states. The National Housing Finance and Infrastructure Corporation, NIFIC, 
um, which is within the Treasury portfolio, um, is doing more extensive work there to increase the supply of affordable rental housing, which is what, um, with regard to what you're asking, that is clearly what's needed to assist more women in these situations. So they are very actively working in that space. I imagine they will be appearing and could talk more about their work. I noticed they made made a very big recent announcement about a partnership with Victoria and what they will and an investment of significant capital there to increase the supply of affordable rental housing. Oh, and my understanding of that particular um, initiative is it's over a significant period of time. Yeah, well, m most housing initiatives typically are yeah. um, because they, they do take some time, as you know, to get planning approvals and construction and there's typically a pipeline of at least five years yes. for housing. Yes, so projects. we've got women and children uh, I'm not dishing on the yeah, fact no, that we need more social housing. Yeah. There's a crisis now, and I'm sure you're aware of Anglicare's housing snapshot that shows there's basically zero yes. to a handful, literally, of houses that are affordable for rental for single mothers. So were you asked to provide, or did you provide any other advice on what could be done now to relieve poverty of single mothers? besides the housing guarantee and what you've just articulated, which is a longer term, very worthwhile, but longer term initiative. Senator, I think it goes to the kind of um, discussion that we were having with um, one of your colleagues in the committee before, and uh, I think Minister Payne came in on that, that um, you're, you're asking is a different kind of question than a, did we advise on something that is in the budget? Did we advise on that, yes or no? Well, ha um, have you done because any there are work so, on there are, there are a range of, there's, there's, there's so many different things that uh, you can focus on at any given time. Like we, we appreciate the significance of the issues that you are raising. Um, and uh, there, there are a range of discussions that happen across the budget about, uh, about, different, uh, about different things that can happen. Uh, and beyond that, I think I would have to just take on notice to, to go back and have a, have a closer look at in, in order to be able to, to think about responding to your question. Like that there's, there's so much so work on on what we actually do and what is actually in the budget, um, that, that that is the focus of what we have been doing, like this very large package of the $3.4 billion. That, that's been the focus of, of what we have been have doing. Have you done any work on poverty for single mothers? Not, na not just necessarily now, but over the life of the office, have you done any work or provided uh, Advice. I won't do the provided advice. Have yeah. you done any work on that issue? So, Senator, what, what I'd say is that the Office for Women, we, we are supporting the government in terms of, of, the kind of, of the range of things that they are doing. So we are not so much doing a range of research that we might self-initiate, like we, in the discussion that I was, that we were having before about um, our role when I was being asked, I was describing to you how the mm. resources of the Office for Women are utilised, and so that's the, that's, that's the range of work that we, we are doing. Um, I would have to look and see if there has been, like, particular work at, at any point in time on the, on the issue that you are raising, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that on notice for you, Senator. Okay, thank, thank you. Just quickly, Senator, see yeah. we are quickly running out of time. I appreciate that. I'll yeah. hand over to Chair. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, yes, Senator Payne. Chair, can I just say to, to Senator Seawit uh, as well, and again, I apologise, it's not an ideal communication situation, but um, also through the Women's Leadership and Development uh, Program um, Competitive Grants mm. Round, yeah. a number of the initiatives uh, that uh, will receive funding in the uh, Grants Round from the Women's Economic Security Statement 2020 uh, are initiatives to organisations around the country uh, that uh, have as absolutely their focus um, supporting um, women in a range of difficult circumstances and uh, the challenges that you've identified uh, are included in that uh, in terms of their ability to, to get into work, their ability to support their families, their ability to engage uh, more broadly uh, in society. So um, um, we would be happy to take on notice some advice, some advice to you in relation to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payne. Very quickly, Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Um, hello again. When will the National Women's Fund, uh, women's Networks that are funded under the National Plan find out about their funding? And is it still the intention to maintain the six networks requiring uh, two of them to merge? 
rather than expand the number of networks to seven to include a women with disability network. Yeah, thanks, Senator. So um, I think we did have a talk about that at last estimates, and I can confirm the evidence I gave in the last estimates that it will be the six national women's okay. alliances. Uh, and as we discussed before, uh, that is so that one of the six can actually represent women with disabilities mm -hmm. uh, and that um, there, that, uh, so, so yes, that, that is okay. the answer. And yeah. when, when do they find out about their ongoing funding? What's so Senator, uh, we in the department have, as, as I have been discussing in terms of what one of our roles are, is actually managing the Women's Leadership and Development Program and we've had a panel that has gone through uh, all the applications mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are in the process of, well, we in the department are in the process of considering uh, considering those. So, okay. um, And so when do they find out? So I couldn't put a time frame on it, uh, uh, Senator. It will be shortly because uh, we are... Yeah, it runs out pretty soon. It does run out and uh, fairly soon and so we are working, um, we, we are expediting that process so that uh, it can be done and it can be worked it can be worked in line with the current funding uh, profile and deadlines for the current uh, women's alliance okay Senator. so are you saying that the 60 organizations that you referred to earlier is that funding being considered along with the um Two separate processes, yes, Senator. Yes, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah, no, two separate processes. So the, the process that we were talking about before that I was saying was announced on um, over the weekend for yes. those 60 organisations, yes. that's that's one line of funding. So it's yes. all under the yes. um, no, Women's Leadership. Covered that, so I've covered that, that, one. that one. And then the six National Women's Alliances, yes. it's a separate, it was a separate round. Yes. So that was an, a separate open process like okay. for those six, yes. six National Women's Alliances. And as I say, there has and been... And it's been taking a long time to make the decision. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that this, I, I wouldn't characterise this one as a, as a long time senator in terms of actually just okay. don't have the dates in front of me and, um, but my, I, we have moved quickly on this one senator in okay. terms of when it was opened. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I secured additional resources to have a, a very experienced person actually come in to actually boost our resources so that they could do it. So, um, so I, I, I wouldn't external. say that this particular process has, okay. has taken an external a long person, time. external to the department, uh, so, someone within government. So, okay. yes. in yes. PM and C or a different department, uh, so, someone who is in a in a different department. So, okay, yes. with expertise, with expertise, in... Senator. Yes, absolutely. Okay, which with department? Expertise. Which department were they from? Uh, Senator, they're from the Department of Social Services. Okay, yeah. um, I'll ask some more questions on that. You notice uh, on notice rather, and just in relation to implementing the respect at work recommendations, there's money in the budget for Wajia to work with the Respect at Work Council um, to do various awareness increasing primary prevention education and develop and distribute resources. Is this work that the Office for Women has previously been funded to do? Um, and w what role will the Office for Women play in implementing those Respect at Work recs? Uh, so in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the money that the Wajia has got for those Respect at Work recommendations. Uh, there's a, there, are, there are two uh, things there. So one is that uh, the government accepted the uh, Respect at Work recommendation about the Australian government reporting um, to Wajia. So in part, uh, Wajia has got funding for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then also for Wajia to be working closely uh, with the Respect at Work Council. So that's that's in the ballywick of our colleagues in, in Wajia. That's where that funding is going for, for them to do that work. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. so my question was, what role will your office have, if any, in implementing those recs? Are you saying none because Wajia have been tasked with that? So I would say that the primary responsibility for it is definitely with Wajia, like the, the recommendations okay. in Commissioner Jenkins' report were directed at Wajia in, in that instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, we in the Office of Women are looking forward to, uh, to working with Wajia with their new director who's just started last week and there was mm. a another measure in the Women's Budget Statement, uh, Senator, about a review of the Wajia legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, Ms Mary Wooldridge, the new director of Wajia, and I have had a, an initial preliminary conversation about that, and, and we're looking forward to, to working with each other on, on that. OK. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Waters, and thank you very much to the Office for Women for appearing here today. I will now call the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And if they could assemble as quickly as possible, that would be great.
Tell me, Claire. Between the two of you, can we get this done in 10 minutes? Oh, between in the total. two of us. Mm -hmm. In total. Mm -hmm. I'll do my best. Thank you. Appreciate that. It will certainly be faster than the last one. Thank you very much. I welcome the head of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, Ms Mary Wooldridge, and other officers. Ms Wooldridge, we're somewhat pressed for time, so if you do wish to make an opening statement, I might ask if you could table it rather than give it verbally. Okay. No, happy to do that, as uh, understanding it's got some handwritten notes as well. Ah, uh, right. Um, if it has hand handwritten notes, is it possible for you to email the Secretariat and non-handwritten noted version Certainly. of your opening statement. That would be fantastic. Uh, I will hand the call to Senator McAllister for questions. Great, okay. Um, look, I wanted to ask questions about two things. Uh, firstly, welcome Ms Rawdridge. I wanted to ask the minister about the recruitment process. Uh, is the minister still on the line? She will be. Yes, Senator. Great, okay. Um, uh, minister, how was the recruitment process run for Ms Wardridge's position? Uh, Senator, it was run through um, the Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet. I will just um, grab a note on that for you. Um, it was... Uh, Uh, they conducted a recruitment process in accordance with the government's merit and transparency policy. Uh, the position was advertised on the 21st of January through APS jobs, through SEEK, through LinkedIn uh, and the current opportunities page of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, the advertisement was shared by the Prime Minister and Cabinet Twitter account and LinkedIn page and the Office for Women Twitter account. Uh, the applications closed on the 2nd of February. Uh, a competitive field was established from the application process. The panel was chaired by the Secretary of the Department of PM&C, uh, Secretary Gaitchens. Uh, the other panel members were uh, the Deputy Secretary Skills and Training of DESI, uh, Nadine Williams, who was the representative of the APSC, uh, and the Deputy Secretary Social Policy of PM&C, Alison Frame. Uh, the panel received 28 applications, six candidates were interviewed. Uh, as per the government's merit and transparency policy, the secretary provided a report uh, to me as minister, recommending a short list of suitable candidates. Uh, Ms Wardridge was selected, cabinet and the executive council confirmed the appointment of the new director uh, in accordance with the government's merit and transparency policy and the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. How many um, recommendations were provided to you and ultimately to Cabinet, um, by the sounds of it, in relation, uh, in, in relation to this position? Uh, Senator, I will check my recollection, but my recollection is three. Right, so three recommended to you and uh, Cabinet selected, Cabinet endorsed Ms Wardridge? Correct. Um, Ms Wardridge, and I apologise for being so brief, but I literally had five minutes to ask you a question, so I don't mean to be short, but you're recently a, a Liberal Member of Parliament. Do you remain a member of the Liberal Party? I am currently a member of the Liberal Party. Right. And do you see that that presents any conflict at all in exercising your role as in as the director of Wajaya? Not in the slightest. And as Mr Stone said in earlier part of the hearing, it's actually an upside. Not uh, attending branch members, I have no intention of being actively involved, but I am a member. Right, so you've taken some steps to manage a conflict. When you say you've got no intention of being actively involved, what do you mean? I, I won't be uh, attending branch meetings or involved uh, with party activities. Right, so there is some conflict that you're managing. Can you describe what you think it is? 
Um, I actually uh, don't see there's a conflict there um, in terms of my leadership of the, of the agency. I intend to fulfil that entirely consistent with uh, the responsibilities within the public service and uh, I'll do that in every action that I undertake. The office is responsible for um, maintaining momentum around pay equity, is perhaps a broad way of describing it. Um, and the women's budget statement talks about the gender pay gap and says that continuing to improve women's economic security will require an ongoing effort, which will involve cultural change, change to gender norms, and this will include addressing biases in decisions around pay across and within ind industries. When you were Minister for Community Services in the Victorian Government, your government submitted to the Fair Work Commission that uh, the gender was not a feature in the undervaluation of work in the community services sector and argued against the Equal Remuneration Order. Do you think that government does have a role to play in supporting pay equity for low paid women? Well, I think, Senator, what you're missing is, is the fact that actually what happened um, when I was a minister, which was that we fully funded the equal remuneration order, and in fact, we funded that at 80% of the overall funding attributed to salaries, which on a subsequent change of government, that was immediately reduced to 70%. So I think you'll find um, my position as a minister with responsibilities in these areas was very strongly in favour of uh, addressing issues such as the gender, gender pay gap and fully fulfilling our requirements under the equal remuneration order. Mm. I have an extract before me of the submission that your government made to, the, to Fair Work Australia at that time. And it reads, for the reasons outlined above, the Minister submits that neither of these determinants and parameters of the wages gap reflects gender factors. There is no evidence before Fair Work Australia which could support a finding to the contrary. It's a pretty unequivocal opposition to using gender in that case. Perhaps it's a one-off example. Do you broadly accept that gender is a feature uh, in driving low pay in female-dominated sectors? So uh, let's be clear, that wasn't uh, my, when you said the minister's submission, that wasn't my submission. Uh, and yes, I, I do think that gender is, uh, is a part of the issues in relation to some of the low paid workforces. And I think the evidence and the research shows that. Uh, and I'm certainly of the view that um, my practices in the past um, have gone to support to address those issues. We'll probably have more to do with one another, Ms Waldridge, but I don't have any further time Thank you. and I'll cede the call to Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Senator McAllister. Hi, folks. Congrats on your new appointment. Um, the budget commits to extending um, Wujia's remit to include the public sector, which is a call that many, including myself, have made for many years, so I'm pleased to hear that. What's the work plan for that review and when will it start and when will it conclude? Sorry, the review? Uh, Just in extending terms of the review your of the jurisdiction to cover the public sector. So, uh, thank you, Senator. We've already had uh, commenced discussions uh, with the um, Office for Women in relation to undertaking the review and, and further discussions um, are, are scheduled in the next couple of weeks. Um, I've also had conversations with the Public Sector Commissioner um, in relation to uh, our work um, to make sure that uh, that is already underway, uh, that's already been happening, to have voluntary reporting of public sector um, staff for some agencies this year um, and being completely ready uh, when um, there's a change in the Act and when that is mandated. Um, I should also say, and I, I know you're familiar with the investment that's gone in in our um, data systems. Yes. Um, our data systems are now in a position to be able to um, support mm. public sector sector reporting. Mm. Um, so a lot of work has happened to date. The review of the Act will happen this year is, is my understanding from the government. Okay. And um, I must have missed something. I didn't realise the Office of Women were kind of the interim port of call before 
um, just legislation. So could you just run me through what that process entails? So the review of the Act, um, my advice is, will be led by the Office for Women, but ah. in close consultation with Wajir. I see, I um, understand. Uh, but so the they... commitment's already been made to expand your jurisdiction, yeah. right? So and what's the review to cover, pardon my ignorance? So one of the government's um, budget commitments um, was to review our Act um, and have a look at not only the, the mandating of public sector reporting, but other aspects in relation to enhancing our capacity oh, I see. to I see. Um, drive gender equality okay, in workplaces. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in that broader review then, um, I understand, and perhaps the figures have changed since we last checked, but 45% of employers who report a pay gap don't then take action to address it. Will the review look at more options for enforcement powers, whether they be naming and shaming or restricted access to government grants or contracts? Will that sort of what to do if you find a pay gap and then do nothing, will that be in scope for the review? So the terms of reference for the review haven't yet been drafted. Uh, they're the conversations we're about to commence. Mm -hmm. um, but very clearly the government has articulated um, the review looks at how we can enhance further gender equality measures and uh, gender equality generally in mm -hmm. workplaces. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be having a broad range of discussions uh, in terms of uh, what that looks like. Okay. Will it, um, freelancing a bit here, but will it go back and consider those draft amendments that were proposed to expand the scope of Wajia back in, might have been 2013, and then um, when the change of government occurred, many of those sort of second stage commitments were then pared back. Will, will there be a re-examination of some of those more detailed reporting obligations and policy uh, policy uh, requirements to take action? Will that be in scope? I've got to say, I, I can't say if they'll be in scope uh, yet or not. Okay. We have to draft the terms of reference. Um, but uh, as some advice in terms of perhaps looking at that in detail and understand that was the, the report that was done yeah, mm -hmm. back in 2013, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll certainly be taking it on myself to understand okay. uh, further history um, and as we work towards how, how best to, after 10 years, to... Um, uh, have an act that, that fulfils the objective. Yes, okay, great. Um, and lastly, would it be considered uh, whether or not uh, employer of choices, sorry, can't speak, need more coffee, in the scope of the review, will you look at other ways of incentivising taking action on an identified gender pay gap, for example, uh, favourable treatment for government contracts or, you know, priority whatever it is when government wants to give money to organisations? Well, obviously, we've got uh, measures in relation to procurement um, Thank you. already. Thank you. Um, and excluding um, uh, people from contracts who, who aren't um, mm. submitting reports mm. un, uh, in their requirements mm. under the Act. Um, so, you know, the conversations are, are broad, sorry to say, still. again. Um, but uh, one of the clear objectives is to enha further enhance yeah. gender equality. OK, thank you. Um, has any additional funding been allocated to support the expansion to the public sector? Yes, so How this year that? in the budget, we're very pleased to receive $4.35 million. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some additional funding for the Public Sector Service Commissioner, which I'm yep. sure you'll have an yep. opportunity to talk to, to him in relation to that. Um, but that will enable us to do two things, um, expand the public sector reporting mm -hmm. and, and have uh, both the, the mechanism to do it, but also the analysis of the data and the education of public sector agencies in relation to gender mm -hmm. equality. Um, and then also, secondly, to work with the Respect at Work Council. So the funding yes. achieves those two objectives. Okay, well, I wanted to ask about that and I'm conscious of the yep. time, so Thank I'll be very so quick. Um, so there's four million over four years to do the implementation of the Respect at Work recs. Which ones will Wajia be responsible for and what's your time frame on those? So recommendations 42 and 43 mm -hmm. are the, uh, from the Respect at Work report, are the two that are covered by the funding that we've been provided okay. in the budget. And time frame for implementation? So once again, I've already had a, a conversation with the Sex Discrimination Commissioner in relation to uh, the Respect at Work Council's work, and we've agreed to meet shortly in the next couple of weeks to um, sit down and, and work that through. Okay. Um, 
And uh, just one, I'll put, I'll put some other questions on notice, but just one final question. There's a um, projected increase in what's called land and buildings expenses for Wajia for 22 to 23 and 23, 24. Um, are you moving or what, what's that about? Uh, let me, so um, perhaps that's one to take on notice terms of that level of detail, yes, okay. um, we're not moving. Uh, we, we don't, well, let, let me say we have no intention to move yes, at okay. this stage. Um, and I'll get you some detail. It yes, could be the conclusion you. of a lease or, or, or something along those lines. Okay, great. Um, uh, all right, yes, I do have some more questions, but I'm testing the chair's patience. I'll pop them on notice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, it was remiss of me not to ask the minister if she wanted to say anything when I brought Wajia on. Um, Senator Payne, was there anything you wanted to add to the testimony we've just had? Uh, thank you very much, Senator Chandler. Just very briefly, I wanted to, uh, to welcome the new director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, uh, Mary Baldridge, and uh, uh, thank her for uh, taking up the role. I'm sure the committee looks forward to working with her. I also wanted to uh, put on the formal record uh, my thanks and that of the government uh, to the agency's outgoing director, Libby Lyons, mm. particularly wanted to acknowledge her strong leadership of Wajia and her invaluable contribution to gender equality in Australian workplaces. She's a passionate advocate. I'm certain that she will remain so, and I wish her all the best for her future endeavours. And I particularly wanted to thank her uh, for stepping up through COVID-19 and extending her term. I am very grateful for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Payne. Any other senators quickly. seeking the call? Yes, quickly. Quickly, Senator Chair, Payne. very quickly. Um, uh, I just had some questions about your data explorer, which is very, very useful. Very questions, I hope. Um, well, first of all, just, just quickly, could, could you provide all the data for it to the committee? Like, it's presumably a database that drives this. So on notice, mm -hmm. could you provide, like, the CSV file or whatever you use for that? For the data explorer? Yep. Just be easier sure. for me to analyse. That'd be great. Thank you. And on this, um, it only obviously looks at, I think, paid work at work. Do you do any work to look at the unpaid work? Uh, uh, largely women do, by the stats, largely women do, it at the, in the home to look after their own children? No, so our uh, remit is for employers over 100, uh, right. with over 100 employees, uh, and analysis, uh, the data collection and analysis around that cohort. Right, so your workplace and your total doesn't extend to the home where obviously women do a lot of work in the home and look after children, no, don't do any analysis. So there's no analysis done on the different tax rates that are paid by households, single income households, compared to no. double income households? No, no there's not. Thank you, Chair. Cheers. Thank you very much, Senator quick. Canavan, and thank you very much to Wajia for appearing here today. I'll now call um, representatives from the National Australia Day Council. He is on. I have alerted him that he needs to be ready to come back in. So hopefully he knows the file last. Yeah. I welcome back Senator the Honourable Jonathan Dunham, Assistant Minister for Industry Development, Ms Carly Brand, Chief Executive Officer, and Ms Karen Wilson, Chief Operating Officer at the National Australia Day Council. Um, I might ask Ms Brand or Ms Wilson, if you have opening statements, would you be able to provide them to the committee table rather than reading them out, as we are trying to catch up on some time? There is no opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Senator Ayres, you, you have the call. Thanks very much. Um, Ms Brand, I've got some questions uh, that relate to um, the, there's a publication in the Saturday paper, which I'm sure you're aware of, um, an article written by Karen Middleton that's titled, Exclusive Government Review Follows Tame Appointment. Um, when, when did the council become aware of the review? Um, we received a letter from uh, the minister informing us of that. I can take that on notice with the exact date. We do have that here and can provide that in a couple of minutes. So you, you can 
tell me later. I can. We just find that date for you. I just don't have it to hand. Was it before the article? Uh, yes, it was. When when did that review commence? Um, just bear with me, and I'll bring up those that information. The review essentially has taken place over April and May. My understanding was it was uh, commissioned in early April. Um, the letter, that's, um, that's consistent with what the article. That's right, and I thank you. Um, I do have the the date of the letter here. Not dated. 30th of March was the date that Minister Morton wrote to the National Australia Day Council and the directors informing them of the review. So it was a letter in 30th of March. That's right. And a letter from Minister Morton. That's right. Is that right? That's correct. Has the review concluded? My understanding is the review has not concluded. Have you been provided with the review's terms of reference? Uh, the terms of reference or the scope of the work has been outlined in the letter from the Minister to the Directors. Can you provide that uh, letter to the committee? Yes, I can. can and can you um, tell me what the terms of reference were in the letter? Essentially, it's looking at the... Um, to conduct a review into the operations dynamics and composition of the board. This will ensure the board is equipped with relevant skills, expertise and robust governance to continue to lead and build on the work undertaken by the NADC board and staff for Australia Day 2020 and 2021. Again, consistent with um, the article by Ms Middleton. Did the council have any input into the terms of reference? not into the terms of reference. And it's been conducted by Glenys Beauchamp. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. How is, um, how is she engaged with the council? Um, she has undertaken individual meetings with directors, as well as um, my colleague, Karen Wilson, and myself. Do you think the council needs to change the way that it works? I don't, I think the review is looking at the operations to can enable us to set up for future success, to work on what we have uh, been able to deliver in 2020 and 2021. It's not quite what I asked though, is it, Ms Brand? It's, I'm referring you, to this. Do you, do you think there need to be changes in the way that the council works? No, I think the council is working very well. I. Uh, bring to the committee's attention the success of um, recent campaigns, Australia Day events and grant programs that showcases that the uh, organisation is uh, functioning very well. The Saturday paper links the review to concern within the government about Ms Thames' appointment as Australian of the Year, with government sources saying to that journalist that Brendan Murphy would have been a safer choice. Has that view been put to you by people within, within government? Absolutely not. You're not aware of that view? Honestly, absolutely not. It'd be pretty extraordinary if the government launched a review on that basis, wouldn't it? There has been absolutely no comments from me, to me, um, or my understanding to any directors uh, on such matters. Ms Foster from Prime Minister and Cabinet is a member of the Council, isn't she? She's a director, that's right. Um, has she expressed any concern to you about the selection of Ms Tame? Absolutely not, no. The board stand by the selection of Ms Tame. What about um, Mr Morton? Has he expressed any concerns to you about Ms Tame's appointment? He's very supportive of Ms Tame. So he has expressed that view to you, that he's very supportive of Ms Tame's appointment, has he? He has expressed support for the National Australia Day Council and the Australian of the Year. Grace Tame is the awardee of the Australian of the Year and he is supportive of her in this role or in this award. Um, it's odd, isn't it, that a journalist hears these stories about misgivings inside the government but no one tells the council you've just got a review, haven't you? 
Um, I, I can't comment on why a journalist chooses to write the articles that they choose. You, you attended the, um, the award to Ms Tame and listened to her speech, I, I assume? Yes. It was quite an extraordinary speech. She's wonderful. It's a pretty extraordinary comment from the Prime Minister that's been reported today, isn't it? Um, I'll get you to explain which comment, Senator. Was well, the only one that I've heard. Apparently, he said to Ms. Tame, "Well, gee, I bet I bet it felt good to get that out." You don't think that reflects a a lack of respect for Ms. Tame's appointment? I, Just Senator, uh, is, I'm not sure it's quite the role of Ms. Brand to be um, running a commentary on what the PM may or may not have said. The Prime well, I'll move on. Apologies, I'll move on. What, what can you tell the committee about suspicious betting activity that happened ahead of the announcement of the 2021 Australian of the Year? Uh, yes. So on the 25th of January, uh, it was referred suspicious betting or anticipation or some consideration of suspicious betting was referred to the ACIC. Um, that was then uh, my understanding. They uh, undertook some investigation and then referred it to the Australian Federal Police. It is an ongoing matter there with the AFP. How many people uh, knew the names of the recipients announced at the presentation ceremony? I think it's 191. Uh, but that's not, that's actually, to clarify that comment, it's 191 people signed the non-disclosure agreement, which I would like to point out has a non-betting clause in it. That doesn't mean 191 uh, were informed of um, the national awardee. So 191 is the outer limits of who might that's become right. aware? That's right. That's it. It may be less than you... It's definitely less. You, yes, and you hope that there's not others who have become aware. Uh, that's what the non-disclosure agreement is uh, requiring people to abide by. Are, are you happy that there's a betting market on the Australian, uh, the Australian of the Year awards? No, I would uh, be very supportive of the removal of that market. Have you had any discussions with the government about how to achieve that? We're working through that process. My understanding is it's um, a, actually a consideration for the Northern Territory government. I see, because the... Um, That's right. It's... Um, be, because it's a... It's it, forgive me, I'll use the wrong term. term licensed in yeah, the Northern a, Territory. That's right. It's in that jurisdiction. So have you had specific discussions with the government about that? Uh, we're working through it. When you say working through it, what does that mean? Well, I understand that they too would be supportive of this, but we haven't you finished You haven't had the any letters. direct discussions no. with them at this stage? It's no. OK, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Oh, sorry, one, one last question. The, 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 um, the review that Ms Beauchamp's conducting, when is that going to conclude? Uh, the review was actually commissioned by Prime Minister and Cabinet, so I... You don't I get would, told? I, you don't know? I'm sure I'll be told when it's finished. But, but you, haven't been, you haven't been given a timetable? Uh, no, it's their review. Um, we understand, sorry, okay. we understand that it will be completed uh, by the end of this month. By the end of May. Yes. Thanks, Ms Wilson. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres. A couple of questions, Senator Waters. Yes. Thank you. Chair, hello, folks. And I too think she's wonderful, so it's an excellent uh, choice for Australian of the Year. Um, but I'm interested in whether the Council received complaints uh, regarding the decision to award Grace Tame as Australian of the Year, and was that more complaints than you normally receive uh, based on the selection that was made? No. Uh, no, not more complaints than okay. usual. OK, that's, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, I'm also interested in what support or training or resources are provided to the Australian of the Year to assist them to keep up with um, their public demands, to deal with um, public commentary Absolutely. that might be adverse. Well, we definitely do make them a, a household name overnight. Mm. So the support that we do provide um, is uh, to assist them to, to get through the year as that national face. We provide um, in joint um, collaboration with the Department of Premier and Cabinet in Tasmania um, an, 
an EA. We mm -hmm. support her through uh, travel and logistics, getting to and from her many uh, speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. And we also provide mentoring and coaching um, assistance to help her through this year. Okay. Anyone to help deal with online trolls? I'm sure she gets quite a few. <laughs> We yeah, all do, uh, so. <laughs> not specifically. That said, um, we are in um, very close um, support of her, and if okay. there was a specific request for that, we would um, do what we could it. for that, yes. Okay, great. Um, now, just hearkening back to the review which Senator Ayres has covered, um, were you given any information about what prompted that? Uh, sorry, in regards to the review? In, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, as board directors' terms do change, there, were, uh, there are two directors' positions that um, enable an opportunity to make sure that we continue to have the correct people on the board um, so that we can continue to grow. So on the 31st of March, uh, the term ended for one director and another um, director chose um, to, to step down after a very long term on the, on the board. Okay. Okay. Um, and what are the terms of reference for the review? Um, the, the terms of reference are laid yes. out in the letter that was okay. um, given from the Minister to the Directors. The, that was the statement that I just read before. Okay. I was paying close attention Sorry. at the time. <laughs> my apologies. Um, and my last question was when it will be completed, but you've answered that it yes. will be end of the month. Do you know what steps will be taken following that? Um, time frame, what's next in the process? Uh, we look forward to working closely with Prime Minister and Cabinet. I think it would probably depend on the recommendations by um, Ms Bosham. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Waters. No other senators seeking the call for these witnesses, in which case we will thank them for their testimony today and welcome uh, representatives from the Digital Transformation Agency. Uh, yes. Yes, that is the part of the day we are up to. Yes. We can get back onto the schedule by dinner time. I reckon. Yeah. I reckon I just did the express version of that. That was wonderful. I have a question for the um, DTA. Yep. I welcome Mr. Randall Brugo. Is, was that the correct pronunciation? Very close, Brugeau. Great, Brugeau. Thank you and apologies. Uh, Chief Executive Officer at the Digital Transformation Agency and other officers. Mr. Brugeau, do you wish to make an opening statement? I have a short opening statement. I'm happy to table it if uh, the That would, would be prefer. wonderful if you could table it. Thank you very much. And I will give the call to Senator Ayres. Thanks, Chair. Welcome, Mr. Brugeau. It doesn't seem like that long since I was asking your questions, I think in video format, I think. Um, I want to ask some questions about the COVID Safe app um, at the outset. Um, what's the app cost so far? Um, and what are the hosting and other ongoing costs of the app? Uh, Randall Brugeau, Chief Executive Officer, DTA. Um, uh, Senator, the overall cost of uh, build and operate for COVID safe as at 30 April 2021 is $7,753,863.38 inclusive of GST. Are there any other additional costs, ongoing costs in relation to hosting the app? The, or the ongoing costs yeah. of hosting are included in that amount. Um, and What's the monthly cost as this app continues to... I mean, I get reminders from time to time. 
as the... It, it's, it, something is still happening. I assume somebody's still sitting at the centre of this operation yes, running it. What's the, what's the monthly cost? I'd estimated $100,000 per month to uh, host COVID safe at the last hearing. Uh, that has um, ended up at $75,094.98 per month. And we've made a number of performance improvements to the app over the last couple of months, which should see that sitting at about $60,000 per month from the 1st of July. So what, what, imp what performance improvements are they? Uh, there's been a, a range of tuning um, uh, efforts that we've applied, quite considerable um, uh, improvements on the back end, which is the um, uh, COVID safe national data store and how the data is stored as the app is um, in operation. Is there an update on the number of unique detections across Australia? Uh, we have um, uh, numbers, I will just get to them, Senator, one moment. Uh, so the updated numbers as at 19th of May 2021 uh, is that COVID safe has been used to identify 567 close contacts not found through manual contact tracing. And there have been 779 uploads to the National COVID Safe data store. So 567 over what period? Uh, so that's since implementation in April 2020, Senator. So most of that 567 over the course of the last three or four months? Uh, no, Senator, I would need to, um, uh, probably unless Mr Alexander has the breakdown by month, need to take on notice the, the breakdown by month. Scarcely value for money, though, is it? Uh, Senator, it's uh, a capability that has been built, as we've talked about in previous hearings, as an additional part in the toolkit for contact tracing and the health effort. It is a capability which is world leading. It is um, uh, an application that would provide support in the event of large scale um, outbreaks and uh, the Department of Health has requested that we continue sustaining that for the foreseeable future. So is that 567 unique detections, that is detections that, that, that would not have occurred um, without the existence of the COVID Safe app? That's correct, Senator. They would not have been identified. So the last advice you gave, I think, was that there were 17. The last time this question was asked, I assume, in the COVID committee? Uh, so, Senator, there were um, uh, a set of uh, statistics reported based on, I think, uh, and I'll get Mr Alexander to help me um, on the, uh, the details of the 17. Mr Alexander? Uh, Peter Alexander, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the DTA. Uh, so, Senator, as the... The challenge with the COVID Safe app has been, uh, in terms of reporting, has been we've been very constrained on what we can report. We've had agreements with the Department of Health and the state and territories about reporting on the app, and we've been able to report as jurisdictions have allowed us to um, and have agreed to the presentation of that data. The number that we're dis that, that we're reporting now has been agreed with health and the jurisdictions, uh, and, and so the, that 567 that uh, Mr Brugeau has mentioned has been the number that we've, has now been agreed uh, between the federal and state and territory governments to report. Um, so that is 567 contacts. So how's that agreement being? Through the reached? AHPPC, um, has pri the primary mechanism for engagement with the states and territories on the app and reporting. And that's been a... How's, it, how's that agreement being communicated to you? Is that something that the, D, the DTA has sought agreement to improve the numbers that have been reported or...? Uh, so, Senator, the Department of Health, uh, the business and policy owner, 
for the application. They manage the relationship with the states and territories and it is the Department of Health that coordinates uh, the agreements on the number of contacts which are reported. So yes, it is through the Department of Health and it is a regular engagement we have with the Department of Health on um, the performance reporting of COVID Safe. Are you happy with the performance of the COVID Safe app? Uh, we are very happy with the performance and it's been independently assessed um, in a global context as uh, being uh, world leading when it comes to privacy and performance. So and 567 unique detections and, and your, that's a good performance as far as the government's concerned? So Senator, each of those close contacts could have many transmissions that result from that individual well, that's the case for the states who are doing tens of thousands of these. Do, do, do you think that shortening the 15-minute parameter for the digital handshake to, to occur would result in more detections? Um, I'm not a health professional, Senator. What I can say is that we have built the app in such a way that we're able to configure that to whatever settings are identified by Department of Health and the AHPPC. If for example, it was decided that 15 minutes was too long and we'd set it to 10 minutes, or 1.5 metres was too far away and we set it to one metre, we're able to adjust the filtering for the contact traces and that would immediately display the revised data. So highly configurable. And so there have been requests from departments or ministers to make changes to the app? There have been requests through Department of Health to make changes to the app. We've done uh, 17 releases, I believe, Senator. Um, I'll get that corrected if I'm uh, uh, not right. Uh, but for... Uh, 17 re releases, you mean 17 updates to the app? Correct. As, as, a, as a consequence of making that, those kinds of changes? That's correct. So for functional changes, uh, New Zealand travel bubble, uh, improvements to information that we would display in relation to state and territory level information. These are features that have been requested by the Department of Health and as a consequence we make updates to the app and the back end uh, which is used by the contact tracers in states and territories. What's, um, are there any, are there any plans to um, end the app? Uh, we're having conversations on a, on a regular basis, as I said, Senator. So you, you have considered health. terminating the COVID safe application? Uh, so it's not our decision to make, but we are able to do that and there are provisions in place for us to be able to um, do the necessary deletion uh, of data to ensure that people's privacy... So has, uh, there, has, there have been discussions about terminating the COVID safe app? Uh, there's ongoing discussions about the, I bet there are. Um, the, the use of the app, but Senator, it what's is... The cost of, what's the cost of marketing the COVID safe app? Uh, that's not a question for uh, the DTA, I'm sorry, Senator. Who would ask that question of? Uh, that would be the Department of Health. The Department of Health. So... so what, what, um, what, what I can say, Senator, is mm. in a global context and... Uh, did it yeah. sorry, did it, did, do you know whether it costs more to market it than to produce it? Uh, that's not a question for us to, to answer, mm. Senator. What I can say, though, is in a global context, when we look at publicly available information on other uh, contact tracing capabilities that have been developed globally, the UK, for example, spent $20 million on their um, uh, contact tracing app. Germany spent $35 million on theirs, and they spent $4 million a month to maintain it. Um, so in the, in the global context for the capability that we have that does support that very specialist um, uh, situation where there are widespread outbreaks that may not be well supported with QR codes. Um, the COVID Safe app is a, a capability that could provide a useful tool in the toolkit. So $8 million thereabouts in expenditure so far, somewhere between $165,000 a month somewhere between those figures, depending on that. More costs coming in terms of app updates. 567 unique detections. When, when, when do you reach the conclusion that it's a dud? 
Uh, it's not our conclusion to reach, Senator. Our, our objective, and um, I've been consistent in my evidence, is to ensure that we have a technical capability that satisfies the health need. It is highly configurable. It performs as well as any contact tracing app in the world. Do you and think? Um, do you think that your agency is being blamed within government for the poor performance of the app? Uh, not at all, Senator. You haven't had that feedback. Not it's not. It's not why the agency's funding has been slashed by ninety million dollars. Uh, that is uh, an overstatement, and I'm happy to step you through the reasoning for the change in budget. Yes. Yes. So, as far as the uh, ninety million dollars that was reported um, as a reduction in our budget in our portfolio budget statements, uh, it mixes. Uh, our special account with our departmental appropriation. And just as with any organisation, we have a series of measures that lapse and a series of measures that are created depending on uh, proposals that are being put forward. So the overall uh, reduction of $89.409 million uh, is made up of $39.388 million in departmental appropriation reduction, but of that, $62.2 million relates to lapsing measures, 300000 to uh, reductions through indexation and efficiency dividends, and an addition of $23.1 million in new measures. So the overall uh, reduction is 39.388 uh, for departmental appropriation. And then we have a reduction of $55.619 million in the special account that relates to two key drivers. One is direct um, uh, pass-through of costs to agencies for telecommunications panels, and there is a, uh, a cessation of our current whole of government agreement with SAP that was not signed and has not yet been signed uh, at the time of budget and that would need to be considered for funding as part of the special account once that's decided. So there's a big contract with SAP that's not been proceeded with? Uh, there is a contract with SAP, a whole of government agreement that lapses... It's sat on your books, basically. So the DTA coordinates whole of government mm. agreements with a number of large suppliers. SAP is one of them and we're currently working through a renegotiation with SAP to determine uh, the extensions. That has not been included, uh, the provision for that in our special account. So, not $90 million, you say, but still a very significant cut? Uh, so, Senator, it is um, uh, a, uh, a large um, reduction in overall budget, but it's also a large reduction in what we're being asked to do. And as part of our transition into the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio, there are a number of delivery functions, particularly uh, MyGov and digital identity, that will transfer out into delivery agencies. So of that um, uh, total quantum of 30, 39.388 reduction um, uh, net, we have uh, $32.5 million uh, being reallocated to Services Australia um, to allow them to continue to uh, work on MyGov and digital identity. When, when did you first learn of the move into, uh, back into Prime Minister and Cabinet? Uh, so the placement and uh, the, the function and role of agencies is considered on a very regular basis. We've been having discussions about um, uh, our um, role with government for some time. Hmm. But when did you first learn of the move? When, when, when did you first learn the decision had been made? Uh, so when we saw the administrative order, Senator. So when the administrative order was issued was the first you knew of it? That is the point at which we are certain of the move, yes, Senator. Uh, there have been discussions about the DTA role uh, and mandate for um, a number of months um, and as a consequence of reviews that have been conducted, the appropriate placement for the DTA has been considered uh, and discussed, yes. But the head of service didn't call you and say, by the way, you'll be moved through machinery of government changes or whatever? 
Uh, so we were time. having ongoing discussions that I won't particularise when it comes to the placement of the DTA, but um, we weren't in any way, shape or form blindsided, blindsided by it. As you would well know, the DTA was originally situated in the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, a return into the portfolio which reinforces our role at the whole of government strategy and policy um, uh, table. I, so get, I bet you can't tell us if you enjoyed your time out of it now that you've gone back to it. Um, th there are <laughs> pros and cons in placement. Um, uh, as, you'd, as you'd know, and, oh, and, and, and I know it, there is a, a degree of mischievous in there, <laughs> but, but um, to, to um, be very close to uh, service delivery is a very good thing. I mean, our, our reason for being is to improve services to people and businesses. Um, having that close proximity to service delivery was a very positive thing. Um, and uh, as with any agency, you um, uh, make the very most of the um, uh, the hand that you've been dealt, and we will make the most of the hand that we've been dealt with PNC. Yeah. Uh, Senator, Th how much longer do you have on these questions? Because I know Senator Roberts has a couple of <coughs> questions for DTA as well, and Senator Seawatt, sorry. I have just one short bracket of questions left after, uh, just a, one more question okay. on the move. Do you, do you think it makes sense that Minister Robert remains the minister in charge, despite now being the minister for employment? skills, small and family business and no longer been responsible for government services? Um, it's not really a decision for me, Senator. What I, what I can say is Minister Robert has been uh, enthusiastically pursuing the um, digital program and um, has been um, a, a strong advocate of service delivery improvement across government using digital as an enabler. I was um, I've been provided with a contract notice view on the Australian Government Tenders website that says that you've hired an executive coach for $187,308 for a six month period. Is that, that's right is it? Uh, I'm not sure Senator, um, I'll just look around. Pretty big number, does it sound officials. right? Uh, so I'm not aware of the specifics either Senator. Um, you know, dis we, we do have a number of contractors and a number of roles in the DTA doing a range of work, but I'm not, I'm not aware of anything specific. I'm just looking at Some, Somebody must know if you've em CFA. employed an executive coach for six months for $187,000, somebody... Someone's getting the coaching, you would presume. Yeah. Oh, so, so, we're, so, we're happy to take that yeah, on we'll notice. Yeah, we'll take it on notice, Senator, but, but I'm not aware of any uh, particular executive coaching activities happening in DTA, and particularly not that... Uh, not at that price. Well, I'm, you're entitled to take questions on notice, of course. I am searching for the right word to describe my surprise that a tender of that size can be awarded. We're chasing it. Too big a word for me, Senator Roberts. <laughs> the, um, yeah, we know that's not true. You don't know what this executive coach is doing? You, you haven't been coached, Mr Brugeau? I have not, Senator. Well, I notice, at, or, or I'd prefer, um, by the end of questions uh, this evening, I'd, I'd like to know um, whether that's correct um, and what services this uh, executive coach is providing. Senator, I've got any answers Thank coming you. through. I'll get... I'll Ask some more questions and I'll, I'll answer it shortly. Well, well, I don't have any more questions. We might Senator maybe come Seward back to this after Senator Seward. So and we others. might go to her next, if that's all Thank right. Thank you. Yep. Um, I wanted to go back to the issue of what's been transferred over to Services Australia and get a bit of an understanding about what you're now doing with the uh, moving on the digitisation process and what Services Australia will be responsible for and why it's gone back to them. Um, so I might ask Mr Thorpe uh, to join us to um, provide a bit of an insight, but to, um, uh, just as he's uh, getting settled, the primary focus that the DTA um, will have moving forward is in the strategy, policy and the whole of government elements of MyGov, the delivery, the architecture, um, the the production of content that sits on websites, apps and so on, 
will move to Services Australia, but Mr Thorpe has okay. um, details of the specific functions, if that's helpful. Okay, I might, can I come go to Mr Thorpe in a minute? Yep. I just wanted to then, before we go there, go to the strategy and policy. What does that mean when it comes to Services Australia? And Did, so what does... The, so, as I understood what you just said, is that DTA will still maintain the, I've written down, strategy and policy. Yes. What does that mean for Services Australia in so terms of strategy and policy? Yeah. So, if we look at um, MyGov uh, specifically, mm. it is a service which provides access to more than a dozen linked services. The government's vision is to expand that to become a single front door for government. And so as a consequence, the DTA has a role where it can look across all of government and determine what services might be provided next, what additional features might be uh, prioritised based on what we know people need to do. And so our role in relation to strategy and policy is looking at the whole of government level to support that transition from MyGov being more focused on the social services uh, portfolio and tax to a much broader set of services and we provide that uh, advice uh, to government and then Services Australia becomes what you might call a big systems integrator that brings all of these services together. They still have a technical role to play and they are a delivery powerhouse. They are many thousands of people who are very skilled at delivery. They still need to do the design work and implementation work and make decisions about platforms and implementation that um, will not sit with the DTA. Right, okay. Does so that make sense? Yes. Yes, yes. So, yeah, they take care of their bit of what eventually will become a mega site by the, from what, in my lay person's yep. terms, my gov will become a single front door. A single front door. Yeah. And they'll take. Sorry, I don't mean to point at Mr. Thorpe as, <laughs> um, but Services Australia will then become. They'll do the NDIS. They'll do do the payments and things like that. But my gov may be a site for other um, services or departments. Is that correct? Yes, and it, okay. and it already is. And so when we look at. Yeah. Um, the work that we're doing with the MyGov beta, which is looking at how we might compose services in the future, mm. job seekers are in there. And so we'll increasingly broaden the set of services so that people can interact with fewer places than they currently interact with to get something done. Okay. So in terms then of somebody's digital footprint, di somebody's a digital ID, because I think you were, this is about digitising the whole process. So. A job seeker, for example, as you've just articulated, will have a digital ID, will then go with them for this whole site. Is that correct? Uh, Any time so they enter the site, or any government departments enter a site, they'll be able to see someone's digital, they'll be able to access somebody's digital ID, is that, or digital presence, is that correct? Um, as government relates to them. So, um, maybe if I turn it around and um, if you or I, and I have a digital identity, I've connected that into MyGov. Mm -hmm. I then authenticate on my device to log into MyGov yep. using my digital identity, and that gives me access to a set of services. I can see my immunisation yep. okay. records, I can see yes. my inbox. So what we're looking to do is to have it such that we provide a broader range of services that become more personalised so that when you log in to yes. MyGov that you can see more okay. and do more. All right, I'm seeing, I'm, I understand what you're saying from now from an individual, I'm accessing MyGov, if you can ever remember your password and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, moving on. Um, who, then, who else can then access that? Who else can access your identity? Yes. Um, so the digital identity system is operated I mean in government, or what government does with that data and how it's stored? So there's very strict controls and we are um, uh, needing to comply with all legislation, privacy principles and so on, and we have cyber security controls that ensure that people's information is protected. And so if, for example, you use your digital identity or I use my digital identity to access my um, tax payment summary, 
then that is something which is protected in the system in that I might use my digital identity and that information is then passed through a, a, a broker or a connecting piece called an exchange and that gives me access then to uh, my, my tax records. There are very strict rules that are defined within what's called the trusted digital identity framework that describe what information can be shared and how that needs to be protected. And so it's not simply as you access records for uh, welfare payments or um, uh, the other services that you might have for Medicare, for example, there is no free-ranging access that people have to that information. So, I mean, other government agencies, do they have automatically access to all of your digital data? Uh, they do not. They do not. They okay. do not. It, but it is, is the capability is, there? Is the capability there? Um, I would say the capability would actively prevent that from occurring. We would need to enable that with the technology, not to mention the policy and the legislation that would sit around that. So um, while it is conceivable that we could provide broader access, that would need to be a conscious decision and then enabled by legislation. One, mm. one really good example is uh, we're working through right now a public consultation process on new digital identity legislation. And what that is intended to do is to ensure that we build the right legislation and controls in place to allow states and territories and the private sector to participate in digital identity. And so this is, um, uh, to your point, ensuring that the right protections are there for people to participate beyond the Commonwealth Government. The controls at the federal government level are very tight um, and very prescriptive. What we're looking to do with the legislation is to ensure that that then extends into states, territories and the private sector should they choose to okay. participate. I, I'm, I'm aware I'm going to get pinged for time in a second. I did want to go to Mr Thorpe. I think yeah. I'll have more questions on... Well, I will definitely have more questions on notice about that, but I did want to go specifically to Services Australia and, and just understand the, how, much, how much has gone back to Services Australia to do and why did you take it on in the first place if it's now gone back to them? Thank you for the question, Senator. So in terms of what's gone to Services Australia to develop the new MyGov, enhanced MyGov is what we mm. often refer it to, uh, deals with new capabilities. So the old MyGov that you've experienced today, the, the green one, um, provides a certain number of functions, allows you to access some member services. The new one provides a whole range of additional features and information. So you do, often don't need to log into MyGov in the new world to find out things that you're eligible for. And some of those functions, so in particular, content development, is something that Services Australia, as the operator of the MyGov platform, will do under this uh, new arrangement. It's not something that MyGov used to do in the past. It was simply yeah. a way to log in. Yeah. So Services Australia, we were talking earlier about MyGov is now going to be much bigger. Mm -hmm. So even though it's going to go outside the remit of Services Australia, they'll still operate it. Is that they'll still operate the platform, Senator, right, okay. um, in concert with other participating agencies. So they'll work with Services Australia on the development of content, uh, particularly around something we call life events. So organising information around people, not around departments, to make sure it's easier to understand. They'll work in concert with other agencies that are involved in the MyGov work. Okay. Um, and I know I'm going to get pinged, so last question. Um, in terms... <laughs> Shh, don't tell secrets. <laughs> um, chair secrets. Um, in terms then of the the policy that we were just talking about governing the digital the the way digital the digital framework. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That still applies and Services Australia now apply that in the work that they're doing in building MyGov. Is that uh, two, two parts of the question, Senator. The first yep. one is digital identity is bound to the rules that Randall described, which is the trusted digital identity framework and has yep. some key principles around enhancing privacy and making sure consent is at every step of the choice that people make around creating a digital identity. The second part is as we join these two systems together to allow people to log into MyGov using digital identity so you don't need to remember passwords, that's one of the benefits it provides, um, they're bound by the, those same rules as well. So they're bound by TDIF as well. Okay. And that applies to, this is, this is a supplementary, that applies mm -hmm. to NDIS, so that capability is built into all the NDIS? Well, by being part of MyGov, 
Yes. NDI is subject to the value and features that MyGov offers, which means MyGov is working to TDF standards, those strict controls around privacy and security. Okay, thank you. Thank Again, you. I'll have more on notice. No problem. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Seawood. Senator Roberts, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for attending today. Um, I'd like to ask questions about the style manual, which is produced under the auspices of the Digital Transformation Agency. It's something very dear to the Chair's heart. I know that she's stated this in the public. Um, language is crucial. And it's a very powerful driver of behaviour and it's been shown to be influential for many hundreds of years now. So our office recently investigated the origin of the style manual and we got this advice. These, quote, the Australian government style manual was produced under authority from the Australian government. It is a government publication, but there does not appear to be any specific regulatory or legislative framework under which it was produced. Is that correct? Uh, I, I would need to take that on notice. Uh, Senator, I'm sorry. So my understanding is there's no specific regulatory or legislative framework. So I noticed that this seventh edition was compiled by a working group with 167 different agencies. There you go, Senator Gallagher. You're always helpful. 167 different agencies. <laughs> Some of whom are organisations, some of whom are individuals, some are voluntary, some are paid part time. How much did edition seven of the Star Manual cost and what is the annual budget of the Star Manual unit? Uh, so I will need to look behind me to see if we have anybody with the numbers for the, uh, the cost of producing the Star Manual. So we'll just um, we'll get the numbers for you um, as soon as we can, Senator. But uh, the, the actual style manual team is very small. Um, it is uh, purely on a, uh, a sustainment footing right now, which means we what are sustainment, sustainment is just uh, minimum support. So we have a digital edition which we have produced, which you would be well aware of. Um, uh, some are very keen still to get um, uh, paper copies, as you would expect, and lots of very enthusiastic uh, participants. Uh, but the, uh, the investment in, in the style manual has largely ceased. Well, someone um, has got to keep going with this because there's a, there's a document at the, on the website that says, help us improve the style manual. So someone collects this feedback and then actions it. So there is an ongoing cost. Um, so have you worked out how much it is going to cost to go through all the federal government business and implement the changes called in this style manual? Uh, so, Senator, we have released the latest edition and beyond that, the feedback that we take will potentially make incremental improvements. The benefit we have, though, with the style manual being digital is that it is much simpler for us to make minor refinements um, than it is where you have a physical um, document. So, uh, it is, as I said, a very small team it's one or two people uh, and they respond to feedback and ensure that the product is maintained with very small sets of changes. So if it's, just, if it's not a refer, uh, referable document that can be referenced, how do you maintain the uh, integrity of the document? How do we make, make sure that no one can just walk in and change it when they want to? Uh, so we put controls around what sort uh, of changes controls? to the document. Um, if it's helpful, we'll provide um, on notice a, sure. a summary of um, the, the team, the level of change, um, and then um, how we're ensuring that the, the actual product is um, change controlled in the way that you would so expect it to correct be. Correct me if I'm wrong, the document only exists on a web page at the moment. There's no printed copy. Uh, so other than uh, copies that we have uh, uh, produced for editing and so on, there are no But, but there's no copy that the minister authorises or anyone has authorised or anybody has authorised? Uh, so we had, as you um, uh, demonstrated, many stakeholders who were participating in the refinement of the uh, style manual in the latest edition. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you with the detail as okay. to how that process was undertaken to the point at which this is the specific person who um, authorised the final copy and then and who's the guardian it? of changes in yes. future and, yes. and what about has anyone in the government done the costing of what it will cost to, to change thousands of web uh, of web pages to make sure that language is complied with thousands of forms has anyone done the costing of that the implementation cost of this uh, I wouldn't have thought so senator okay um, 
At the end of the development process, did the minister approve the final format? And so I'll come back to you on notice. On okay. Uh, I note that the style manual prevents the use of the word junior to describe an adolescent. Have you told all the foot, junior footy clubs around Australia that they have to change their name to adolescents? Uh, I don't believe we have sent Adolescent them. footy clubs. So I'm even told that the word youth, look, I better get this right, the word youth is okay, the word young people is okay, but the word junior or juniors or youths is not okay. So I notice the Star Manual also requires federal government employees to find out the user's preferred pronoun. Now, you didn't follow your own manual because nobody asked me what my preferred pronoun was. So is it more than a recommendation or is that all it is? So, Senator, it's a reference for good writing. And in order for us to um, uh, provide that advice, there is a level of discretion that can still be applied at the individual author level. This is good practice guidance that has been updated to be more contemporary than the last edition. Based upon what a lot of people have inputted, but no reference to the English language or dictionaries or custom and practice of what our language means? Just a lot of opinions going in? I, I You're not familiar with the process, okay. Yeah. My Senate motion number 1055 sought to remove, remove use of gender neutral language from federal government business. I asked the Office of Digital Transformation to update the style manual accordingly and advised it wasn't necessary as the specific language expressions in my motion were not contained in the style manual. Is that still your position? Uh, I will come back to you, Senator. Okay. Now your web pages are not numbered for reference. In the section on language, your web pages, uh, your web page advises use gender language, use gender neutral language. Now federal programs are being changed to gender neutral language and your style manual is given as the reason, but apparently the department refuses to remove or qualify this gender neutral requirement. Is that correct? Senator, I'm, I'm um, uh, going to need to come back to you okay. with. So I've got a few final terms, Chair, that I'd just like to check. Very quickly, Senator Roberts. Which is recommended by the Office of Digital Transformation for these common terms, breastfeeding or chest feeding? Senator, I um, have not. Breast milk or chest milk? Oh. Father or non-birthing parent? Mother or gestational parent? My motion has the effect of, of preventing this language and now you are proposing use of this language. Does that mean you're defying the will of the Senate? It did pass. I think it did. It was a, wasn't the best day for the government. Thank you, Chair. That's all I have. Thank you very much, so Senator think, Roberts. Uh, Senator. You might have allowed other voices. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Patrick, I understand, has a couple of questions. I will keep him on a tight leash because so we do need go. to there's move the, on. There's the uh, challenge. Um, I understand that you look after a cross government. Um, guidance in relation to procurement of cloud services, uh, or certainly it's moving that way, is that correct? Uh, so we have a whole of government sourcing policy and we have recently released uh, a set of guidance when it comes to certification of hosting providers. Okay, Do you, is it you that keeps a, a um, record of who's contracting to whom? Um, so I've talked to, to Home Affairs, they've given me a little bit of an idea about how they've approached cloud services and how they're moving cloud services back to, for example, facilities that are, um, that are located here in Australia with particular controls around them. Um, do you have a view across government as to which departments are using services that are not housed uh, here in Australia? Uh, so, Senator, we are responsible for um, uh, capturing information as uh, we provided evidence um, at a previous hearing for digital and ICT spend, and that uh, will include information on where um, data is housed and broader supply chains. Can you, on notice then, this will be my last question, please provide uh, to the committee a list of agencies who are using services, cloud services that are located physically overseas? Um, 
I think we should be able to do that, Senator. Sure. Um, the, the, um, the, the reason for my hesitation is in um, some cases with more contemporary infrastructure models, we don't necessarily have visibility of where physical infrastructure is situated. And so sure. where you look at some of the big hyperscale providers, uh, where it's not um, classified caseloads, we don't need to discover where the data is stored. For the caseloads which require some higher level of protection, we are making it our business to know exactly where data is stored and the full You're supply talking chain. about classifications like um, protected confidential secret, are you? Is that yes. Legal? What about just also, uh, privacy? Senator, we're also talking about, uh, I guess, uh, what we would classify sensitive data, uh, data about Australian individuals and businesses. Um, we would seek to have that. The, the, the hosting certification framework seeks to have that stored onshore. Even if you just give Senator me... Senator Patrick, I thought that was your last question. You sure. Well, that, well they, asked, they asked for some clarification. Okay. So yeah. ju just... Quickly just clarify. OK, so I'm, I'm actually happy for you to simply provide the department and the number of cloud services that they have engaged that have overseas locations. To the best of your knowledge, I'm not, I don't want to burden you. I just want to get a feel for who's using what over, for, uh, that is housed overseas. Yes, sir, we'll do our best Thank to you. get that information. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Chair, I have the answer to uh, Senator Ayer's question. Oh, great. Please provide that, uh, Mr. So the, that arrangement is a company called Talent International, DTA Lab, 18921 is the procurement. Um, the contract value is 187,000. It is uh, a training program for over 50 staff, SES, EL staff and APS um, across one of our divisions. Um, it covers a range of um, uplift of those staff for their training and development needs, um, which they haven't had uh, a, a lot of um, program development activity in the last couple of years. So for that team, it is a number of activities for them. So it's spread across 50 staff. Um, is the answer. We, on notice, I can give you uh, the, the detail of exactly what that yes, covers. Yes, thank you. That'd be good. And what, while I've got you on notice, would you be able to... So in March it was, this, you said, Mr Brujo, that the New South Wales figures were 81 close contacts identified. 17 of those would not otherwise have been identified through other means. That was in March. I understand that was in relation to New South Wales figures and I heard what you said about other jurisdictions um, providing you with um, some approval to provide those numbers. But when, when you say unique contacts, in, in this case 17 is the unique contact number, is it? Or is there some change in the way that we're describing unique contacts? So the, the number I'd provided, the 500 and... 67. Is that analogous with the 81 or the 17? Uh, it is uh, as with the 17. So it is uh, 567 cl close contacts not found through manual contact tracing. And would you be able to provide that broken up by jurisdiction so we'll seek and, by, and by month? Uh, so we'll seek agreement from health who will coordinate that with states and territories. So we are um, happy to facilitate that, but it will be provided by health. I'm surprised that it requires that kind of permission that it's not just on a dashboard oh, it is. available for It, it is stored, but we are uh, explicitly prevented from providing information for data we don't own. And would you also be able to provide me with the number of close contacts each of the states has identified over that period of time to give us a bit of a sense of perspective? I mean, in one case in New South Wales, Department of Health with one close contact identified 2,000 close contacts. I just want to get a sense of proportion. Sitting alongside that, 567 unique contacts, whether that really does represent value for money or a useful addition to the um, to the uh, contact tracing regime. That's all I have, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, you said you have, you have to, there's a, you're not permitted to give data that you don't own. Um, there's some agreement in place. I presume that agreement does not include giving information to a committee of the Senate. Uh, so, Senator, we are not the owner of No, that. I understand that. You said you have an agreement that says you can't give data away without permission if you don't own it. Correct. I don't think that applies to the Senate. Uh, so, Senator, this is health data. It would be no, provided by... No, I think it's by government health. data, and I think the Senate is entitled to 
ask for any data that is in the possession of the government and the only thing that prevents the provision of that information is a public interest immunity claim from the Minister. If there's an agreement in place that seeks to restrict information flowing to the Senate, I'd like to know about it. Senator Patrick, I think it's actually the privacy legislation that was passed okay. for the particular So our powers come from section 49 of the Constitution, which sits above any privacy legislation passed by this parliament. That's the legal status. So Senator, what, what we're saying is we will work with the Department of Health sure. to be as helpful as we possibly no, can. No, I just heard that you said there's an agreement that prevents you providing information, and I'd be disturbed if there was. Through the Act. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Thank and you. thank you to representatives from the Digital Transformation Agency. We will dismiss you now with our thanks for your testimony and bring on witnesses from the Australian Public Service Commission. I now welcome Mr Peter Woolcott AO, Australian Public Service Commissioner and other officers of the Australian Public Service Commission. Mr Woolcott, in the interest of time, if you have an opening statement, I might ask that you table it. Um, th thank you, Chair. Very happy to, I had a short statement, very happy to table that. I might also just up, uh, table an updated organisational chart. That would be very that much suit, appreciated. Uh, thank you, Mr Woolcott. And can I very briefly mention that I have a new look executive team with me at the table. My Deputy Commissioner, Ms Mary Wiley-Smith, has taken on a role with the industry portfolio. And Mr Patrick Hetherington is now Acting Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Ms Rena Brunsma has joined us as First Assistant Commissioner, has been in that role for just a week. And as you know, Ms Brunsma was most recently in the Bushfire Recovery Agency. And in order to best assist the committee, uh, she appeared at that agency earlier today. She will join the Commission for the next estimates hearing. And since our last appearance, Mr Grant Lovelock has also been confirmed in the First Assistant Commissioner role and head of the APS Academy. So thank, thank you for that thank update, you, Mr Wolfcott. Really appreciate that. Um, Senator Gallagher, you have the call. <coughs> oh, no, I will go to you first. Oh, okay. if, to unless you would like no, no, no. to go first. No, no, no. You can get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> you can we never get... That. You can never get rid of him. <laughs> okay, I will try and be as quick as I can. Thank um, you. Firstly, you've got the portfolio budget um, statements. Can you explain to me what's happening to your departmental appropriation in the final two years of the Ford estimates? Where it appears to me, and there is no footnote to explain it, your appropriation goes down by about 10 million per year. I might ask um, my uh, deputy um, commissioner yep. to answer Thank the you. question. So. Uh, Patrick Hetherington, acting deputy commissioner. Uh, so the, I guess the real driver of the decrease at the end of the Ford estimates is the additional funding that we've received, the main driver for um, uh, the APS reform, which is $15.6 million over the next two years, mm. uh, drops off. So that's the biggest reduction. Yeah, yeah. but that doesn't deal with all of it. I, I looked at that and I saw you. So you got $8 million in the 22-23 financial year, but then in the 20... And so presumably when that runs out, it goes down by about $8 mil. But my looking at it is you've got a reduction of $10 million and you also that continues out into that final Ford Estimates year of 24-25. Which, um, which page are you on there? Sorry, so I'm on 126. Yep. 
just budgeted expenses for outcome one. Um, and so the extra funding which is in this year and 22-23 is built into those figures. Yep. So, so that inflates presumably, but then you go back to below what your 2021. 20, Indeed. So, so as I said, the main driver of the reduction from 22-23 into 23-24 is that $8 million. Mm. There are a couple of other smaller reductions there that I think you can see uh, that are associated with um, MOAD exhibition, which is another budget measure. Uh, we have 1.5 million for that in 22-23. That reduces to 500,000 in 23-24. So that's then another million dollars. Uh, and then um, in another budget measure, uh, the responses to the respect at work, uh, we received an additional 525,000, which reduces to 282. Mm. So the biggest driver of that reduction is really the APS reform money and, uh, and yep. the MOAD exhibition money that drops off. But There'll be some other minor reductions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But my reading is when you look at, so even if you just take it back to 2021, in four years time, you will be operating with less money. So the 2021 uh, figure that you'll have there also includes additional money for APS reform. And I think it's in the order of about $4 million that is included okay. in that year that was anticipated to cease beyond 2021. And so, so when you take that into account, uh, the 24-25 would be a slight increase on that 2021. So you're saying figure. your sort of standard operating budget for departmental appropriation is in that low 30s? Is in, is in that range. Is but with no growth at all so in terms of you know, for wages or anything, presumably that comes through there too. Yeah, yeah, so there will be some growth. Um, there absolutely will be some growth in that figure. So we'd be going from sort of 31 to 32 if you were to take it back to 2021. Um, in order to give you more detail, I'd, I'd have to take that on notice. But okay. they're certainly the key drivers. All right. Um, thank you. The other thing I noticed was your um, performance in information in your targets and your performance criteria. Like your targets aren't really a target of other than 100% of our new Commonwealth workplace agreements are made compliant with the government's policy. Like you don't really set a tar like it's a very kind of general thing, isn't it? Evaluation data is you curate and or share social media accounts. That's your third performance target is monitoring your APS social media platform, which I had a quick look at and there's not a lot going on there in terms of engagement, is there? There's a lot of retweets from people within the own agency, but <laughs> beyond that, is that seriously the third kind of most, third kind of most important way you measure your performance? I think I, I, think I have it as, uh, yeah, it is the third one in 21, mm. 22. Look, I'd say, um, uh, yeah, so 100% of compliance with work, workplace bargaining policy is absolutely a measure that we can that we yeah, can track. Yeah, but other than um, that, evaluation of data from leadership development initiatives. Similarly, that's actually there are some hard measures around that. Um, are there? Where do they exist? Do you just keep that somewhere else? What yep. So so that so that's data that will be retained by the commission. The curate and share social media. I mean, um, mm. the the importance of that is really about sharing stories across the APS, sharing those successes, sharing lessons learned across the APS. So, I mean, I take the point that if you've looked at it and you don't think there's a lot there, actually that is a reasonably important measure for us. Um, and it's certainly an area that's going to But wouldn't it be engagement rather than curating share? Like, anyway, it's, you know, I had a look. Most of your tweets get one re re retweet by another Australian public service account, which seems to be linked to your Facebook account. but. Anyway, anyway, it was just, I just wonder about the tar it targets, but my real focus today, I just wanted to have a look at, talk to you, Commissioner, about um, the ASL cap, um, and we've talked about that before, um, but I'm wondering whether the APS sees, well, firstly, what's your understanding of the a ASL um, cap policy, um, the staffing cap? Is it still in place? And also whether you have done any analysis, and we, we spoke about this last time, I think, about you know the costs and benefits of this staffing cap policy and the kind of the consequences of it, which has led to an increase in labour hire, particularly across the APS. 
Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, budget paper number four is, is obviously single and uplift in ASL resourcing yep. uh, across the core entities. So you would be obviously very familiar with that. Yes. And uh, the case is made there as to why the government has uh, has moved to increase um, increase the ASL cap. The cap is still in place. Okay. Um, but uh, clearly, if you have a strong case to make, as was the as was the situation in the past, you can make that case and look for an increase in your ASL. But uh, obviously, COVID has changed the dynamics around a lot of the way we deliver services and the need for more public servants. Government has recognised that. And, and, and put in place a, a, a new cap level, which is all set out. And the reasons for that is all set out in okay. budget paper number four. But it's really a matter, as you know, uh, Senator, for the Department of Finance to comment on this, not me. Yeah, so I'm, I, I have a series of questions for them as well. I'm, I'm trying to understand what your role, if any, has been in the discussion across government on the staffing cap. So have you provided any advice uh, to the Minister for Finance or other ministers on the cap, how it operates? I mean, because I noticed one of your performance criteria is, you know, um, lifting the capability of the APS, building leadership, up upholding the integrity of the APS and the reputation of the APS. So it seemed to me to fall within your, you know, broad remit. Oh, we're obviously very focused on capability. Yeah. But, uh, in, but in regard to the ASL cap, we have not provided any advice. OK, uh, haven't. To the Department of Finance on OK. That. You'll be aware we are responsible for the SES cap, which is a different a different issue. Yeah, I asked you about yeah. that last time. Like, have you have you looked at that as well? Like, where particularly where we've got SES on labour hire arrangements, and whether um, that's a concern to you? Yeah, we ha we we have have a senator. I was actually going to um, uh, in my statement to refer to the um, to refer to the changes that we have made uh, there in relation to um, SES SES. Um, Labour hire SES contractors. Um, you'll be aware that this is subject to discussions and questions in this in, in this committee on my last occasion, and we've now issued guidance about SES contractors in oh, okay. uh, in response to um, in response to what we saw was actually it was a gap in in terms of our uh, in okay. terms of our guidance. Could so, you have you is that available online? That yes, guidance? it is available. In fact, okay. we can table that. We can okay, table that guidance. Okay, that would be now. excellent. Thank you. I so um, it, it's designed to put some governance around exactly that issue uh, in relation to when you employ SES contractors and what should apply to them, and also it's, in, it's also in relation to the collection of data. So there was a gap there, and we have now looked to plug it. Okay. So, but in terms of any specific work on the cost um, benefit analysis of using external um, you know, private providers, whether it be through contracts or labour hire, you're telling me the APSC hasn't done any analysis of, of that, you know, the cost or benefit, the impact on the APS capability you know, of a changing workforce. You know, some departments we've found out now are 42% labour hire, uh, if you're DVA. Um, Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, 24% of their staff are employed under labour hire arrangements. So, yeah, uh, obviously it's, it's it's a matter for agency heads to decide the composition of their workforce, how how, how they're going to be able to deliver effectively for government. So we don't get into that. So we don't look to second. But you guess don't them. see a role in terms of you know your remit in terms of good governance, you know, capability, uh, <laughs> integrity. That Absolute. workforce is central to that, and Absolute. it's changing. Absolutely, we do, Senator. And so our focus is very much on capability. We understand that uh, we're living in a very fast-moving um, environment where technological and societal changes are significant. We need to be able to keep delivering for government, and obviously capability is completely fundamental to that. So we have, um, mm. since I think we last had the opportunity to talk to this committee, we have, um, we have. Um, issued the, a workforce strategy, which um, goes out for the next five years. And of course, as part of that capability build, there's the workforce strategy which sets out how we look to approach it. Uh, we've also set up a centre for excellence in, in, uh, in um, the APSC, which looks to actually help other agencies develop their own workforce strategies. Um, we're setting up the APS Academy on, mm. uh, on July the 1st, 
And again, that's all about capability and trying to ensure that we, we do have the capability necessary to keep providing the policy advice to government and to okay. deliver for Australians. So I, fundamental. I, I, don't, I haven't read the workforce strategy, but does, does, what I will, does it have a view about configuration of the, work, the workforce? Like, do you have a view that permanent public servants should be the predominant method of employment? Do you have a view about labour hire, or the use of contractors, and, and when those um, employment arrangements are entered into? Is there any guidance Mr. on that? I might ask Mr Grant, Grant Lovelock, who was the, responsible for the strategy, to come to the table. But before, okay. before he speaks and answer that question, we didn't have target numbers around those sort of things you're talking about. But we clearly recognise in the strategy the sort of skills we're going to need for the future around data, around digital, around sort of particular sort of policy mm -hmm. areas. And we also recognise that we had to grow our own. We could not continue to keep buying this in from the outside, that we had to, we had to, had to develop our own skill. So I might let yeah. Mr. Yeah. But are you ambivalent through. about the method of employment? I guess is, is the document ambivalent about it? Can I'm I not, not, not ambivalent about uh, competence and efficiency in delivering for Australians. That's fundamental to what yeah, we're no, trying to do. I understand. But we do leave it to agency heads to manage their own affairs. They're the ones who are accountable okay. for delivering. But, uh, Did you have anything, Mr? Uh, so, Senator Grant Lovelock, uh, mm -hmm. First Assistant Commissioner, APS Academy. The workforce strategy recognises there'll be a continuing need for a mixed approach to workforce for a couple of reasons. That capability continues to change and is pretty dynamic. The strategy specifically calls out uh, a whole of labour market challenge, particularly in the areas of data and digital, and recognises that we have similar challenges as an APS in those areas. Uh, but as the Commissioner has said, ultimately the composition questions are questions for agency heads under the Act, uh, but we are looking at how we can respond to particular gaps that are identified through the APS census and uh, agency surveys uh, to, to be able to position the APS as a whole to uh, have the option for how they can access that capability. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand the Public Service Commission doesn't have a view through its workforce strategy about how the workforce should be employed, more just the skills and the, the, the delivery of the service, a high quality service. But the nature of the employment arrangement uh, you are silent on. Well, if I may say, the Public Service Act sets out uh, what, what is, uh, and I forget the exact words in there, but it refers to what is a normal, normal means of engagement in, in the public service. But it also provides for uh, for, for, as, as, you, as you're well aware, for contractors. So the yeah. preferred method of engagement is, is, is through permanent uh, APS. That's set out in the Act. OK. I mean, I, you've got an interest in the capability of the APS, so presumably you've got an interest in it not being outsourced to the private sector. Uh, couldn't which, agree more. OK. Yep. So you do agree that the public service shouldn't be outsourced, but well, you don't have a view on the level no, we've got a blended workforce, since we don't have a view on what. Well, we've the right got a blend. changing workforce and growing. Yeah, use changing, of labor growing, and, and and the workforce obviously needs to be able to adapt, adjust and adapt and be flexible. Yeah. And there is a proper role for contractors and, and labor hire. <coughs> the actual figures around that, we don't have a view agency per agency, but we have a general view that the public service needs to have the capability to deliver for Australians, okay. and that's what we're focused. So you're on. not and worried. We need to grow it. Okay, so you don't you're not worried that 42 percent of Department of Veterans Affairs staff for labour hire. You don't that, think that? That would be a matter for Department of Veterans Affairs to um, to testify before you as to whether they think that's the right mix. But as the Public I, Service so Commissioner, you don't have a view on that. You no. think it's fair game, it's open, just here's your budget, work out how to deliver your service. It's a matter for the agency head as the accountable, the accountable figure to deliver on behalf of that agency. And if that's the right mix for them, that's the right mix. Okay. And you haven't done, you're not going to do any work on it, on looking at the use of labour hire in particular, across, more broadly across the, the APS? Our, our approach is, as I say, somewhat different. Our approach is to actually focus on capability for the APS itself. And as I mentioned, and as Mr Lovelock also mentioned, we're very focused on growing our own. Why, um, so if, I know you've got a particular um, role in relation to employment of the SES, but if you saw it as a gap and you've, you've set out the criteria, couldn't this, and I'm reading it on my, on, as I'm asking this, but wouldn't there similar guidance 
be applicable to those under SES level. You know, when I quickly read it. No, because it's about the delegation of, of the employment powers uh, to non-APS employees un under Section 78.8 of the Public Service Act. We're looking to address that. And uh, when the committee raised this with me last time, I, I, I recognised there, there, there was a gap which, needed to be, which need, we needed, needed to fill. So the focus is on, is on um, uh, employment powers of, of, of non-APS employees who are in SES, um, who have delegated powers and have SES positions. Okay, I'm conscious others have um, questions too. The um, APS pay classifications review, why have you had to outsource that? Um, Austender has it giving the NAUS group just over $800,000 yeah. for this, and you've got an independent panel. Do you not have any internal capability to do the classification review? Um, we, we do, we do indeed, Senator. But uh, I, I just make the point there that this is an independent review. So it's not something that we can just do ourselves. Um, the head of the Secretariat um, is here, Ali Jenkins, and she's a public servant. She can answer questions on this. Uh, and we have a, but um, we set up an ex a very senior and experienced review panel. Mm. You will be very familiar with yep. Dr. Heather Smith and, and yep. Finn Pratt, who are both secretaries, ex former mm -hmm. secretaries in, in, in the APS, and uh, Ms. Catherine Fagg, who was also chair of Borrell at the moment and former Reserve Bank, um, on the board of the Reserve Bank. Very experienced, um, very experienced sort of review panel. And to support them, we, we, have, we have employed now, as you mentioned. Um, but it's very much to ensure that, that this is not an APS controlled exercise, that this is actually an independent review of classification and hierarchy. And what we're trying to do... That's what the APSC used to be, though. It used to be the independent body of the APS. Like the, back APSC, in the, day, the APSC. Back in the day. Yeah, well, when no, this was core, a core function of, of the yeah, work. When I, when I looked at this, I mean, we've done these reviews in the past. The most recent one was the Beale Review. And it didn't change a lot. Mm. Um, I, I'm concerned that with the speed of technology and what uh, what people who are coming into the public service uh, out of universities are expecting, that we need to, and our ability to deliver, we need to think quite uh, in, 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 in different ways about what is the structure of the public service going forward, what is the hierarchical arrangements, what are the, what are the processes. And so I thought it was important to actually have uh, an independent viewpoint uh, put but you forward. Used to, that's why you're the commissioner, isn't yeah. it? Like you're the independent no, they're commissioner. Well, they're reporting to me. <laughs> and then There's you're, a, I like you're about, outsourcing I, it to someone not, else to Not complete the outsourcing incentive. I, like I like to have lots of different views. $807,000 for 141 days' work. Yeah. Pretty nice. I, nice it's, that you I, can get I it. hope it. I hope it'll be value for money. Now, sort of very reputable you hope. outfit. Well, we very, all do. They're a very reputable outfit, and they've done a lot of work on in this area in the past. Mm. But you, you, so there are people inside your the commission that are working on this as well. Yeah. Is that right? But you've a lot of the work that sort of is external capability from now. I can ask uh, Ms Jenkins to come to the table. She's the Acting First Assistant okay. Commissioner, Head of the Task Force on the Classification. Back in the Honestly, this used to be the APSC's job. It used to set, do a lot of this centrally. And, you know, yeah, it was quite a few years ago, but... But I think major reviews have always been done with... My, my understanding, and I, I can be corrected, um, my understanding is that we've always had outside, outside expertise to balance and assist us in these deliberations in okay. the past. But, uh, Ms Jenkins... Senator Ali Jenkins, Hi. Head of the Task Force for the APS Hierarchy and Classification Review. Um, we have a small team within the APSC that's supporting this from a secretariat perspective. We also do have NAUS um, and we have the panel. Um, so that's, that's the setup that we have. Okay, so you've got NAUS for 141 days according to Tender, from the 25th of March to the 13th of August. Is that right? So it's meant to be done in that time? Um, that would be the initial phase. Um, we're hoping for a a report to the Commissioner in the second half of the year, um, but we're still only two months in, um, so we're not quite sure how long it's going to take. And is that going to be the total cost of the project? Um, that's the total cost that we have now. We do have the option. But uh, this is first go. phase, you just said, did you? Uh, so this, well, that would be uh, to the point where uh, the, um, the panellists are going to be providing their review to the 
their report to the Commissioner. Um, uh, we're only two months in. We don't know exactly how big the task is, um, and, and that's how much we've budgeted. Okay, but it could cost more than that. This is, this is just to get it to the point where a first report is provided to um, the Commissioner. That's to, to get the, the panel's report to the Commissioner. But not to deliver necessarily a new classification structure. Gotcha. So that would happen separate to this? It would have to, yeah. Okay, and is that, has that been scoped yet? No, it hasn't. Okay. But it sounds like it's going to cost us more than $807,000. Is that your understanding, Commissioner? Well, I have to, I'd have to wait and see, but I would just say this is a very big task and will have major implications for the public service should it go, should it, mm. should it go ahead. So it's not something we can do lightly. Okay. And I suspect... You know, that it will that come with additional cost? I suspect it will come with additional cost. And how long do you expect... When do you expect to get a new classification structure from now? This is entirely up to the panel, panel's consideration. Um, but uh, we'd be expecting that they would report in the second half of the year. So they report in the second half of the year, the contract finishes in August. And then when are you counting on having a new classification, like the, the completed work? Not the first report, but a new classification structure? It would really come down to what the panel recommends. We need to we need to understand okay. what the scope of that. Yeah. All right. So and we'll if talk I could say, I would need then to take that to secretary's board, and obviously yeah. secretary's board would have views. I mean, they're being hard, heavily consulted. So it's going to take forever. No, no, it won't take forever. Do um, you have a timeline? I, I, in my own in my own mind, I do, but I, you know. Obviously Can I ask you what that I is? I don't want to set myself up for defeat. Oh. Indicative timeline. I would hope by the end of the year. But the implementation okay. aspects of this are going to be significant as well. So uh, the first step is to sell, to sell it to Secretary's Board to make sure that they're comfortable with this as a practical, uh, as a practical and useful uh, change, whatever, that, whatever the recommendation might be. And then there'll be all the issues around implementation. So we're not going to rush this. It's, uh, it's more important that this is done in a, in a very steady and sensible and practical way. But we are looking very, very closely at hierarchy and the whole question of how and includes, including uh, consulting very widely, including with the CPSU. Mm. Yeah, I would hope so. Um, and finally, the APS Academy, the contracts that you've awarded to manage that externally as well. Is that your area? Sorry for the change in No, uh, it's Mr Lovelock's area. But yeah. uh, um, well, everything's your area, isn't Every, it? Everything is my area. And I, it I, all I, comes back to you. So what's happening? <laughs> Why are we outsourcing the APS Academy? Why don't we have the capability? Well, we, we have, a, we have we're people work, working enormously hard with a great deal of capability. We're trying to do two things at once, if I may say that. One, we're trying to set up something which has never been done before, which is an APS Academy, which actually focuses on the teaching of public sector craft, which is quite different. It's, it's essentially it's about how do, in, how do insiders or ex-insiders teach the inside how to do its business best and best serve government. So, so we've, got, a, we've had to go the private sector no, to teach the public sector no, how no, to no, do no. its craft. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Um, secondly, what we're trying to do is keep running, keep the lights on in terms of the Centre for Leadership and Learning. We're, we, we, we have, we're, so we're trying to do two things. We're With the lights keep, going out? No. But we, we, have all these, we have all these contracts to deliver, we have all these programs to deliver in terms of development up until the end of June and possibly longer with the Centre for Leadership and Learning. So we're trying to do that at the same time as establish, as establish the, um, um, the, the APS Academy. And so when we're looking, in, and uh, Mr Lovelock can talk about this, but in terms of contracts, it's about specialist skills to help develop the Academy's learning program designs and develop new operating and funding model. So I'll let but Mr. Lovelock explain. The structure's been outsourced. Like, don't you even have a view of how you want to run, you know, so shape it? <laughs> it just Sorry. seems to me like you've got this and gone, we don't know what to do with this, let's go to the private sector, and then they can tell us, and then we'll have a look at it. 
Uh, so, Senator, the work that we're uh, doing with uh, consultants here is either time limited, so it's a specific piece of work that is being done in order to ensure that we're ready to deliver from 1 July, while we have people in the current Centre for Leadership and Learning continuing to deliver this year alone 309 courses uh, to public servants. So we are continuing to deliver those courses up until 30 June. From 1 July, we'll then commence delivery as the APS Academy. And the work that we're doing is a new funding and operating model. So working uh, to, to develop the costing tools, for example, uh, for how we will work across the APS to so manage how you charge that cost. for it. And so, yes. Get that right. Absolutely. First. Yes. Because it's not right now, is it? So it's a different uh, operating model, okay, Senator. We have about six or seven minutes left. Senator Patrick has a couple of questions. Senator Waters has a couple of questions. And we don't want to drag and people back And ideally, I would like dinner. to finish these guys So up if we can finish it, nudge it a little bit. I've almost finished. Yep. So I don't want to stand in the way, but I would suggest we just go over five minutes or okay. something if we run out of yep. time. And yep, I don't want to push it much more than that, but OK. In assisting the committee. Sorry, this is my final um, series of questions. I've almost done. Uh, and then, for example, the organisational design work we're doing is to help us understand how we map current state to future state um, and work uh, across the team that is currently busy delivering to understand how we map all of those functions across so as not to distract them from doing the delivery task at the moment. OK, so is the AAPS Academy going to sit under your organisation? Yes. Yes, it is. And at the moment, does the Centre for Leadership and Learning do that? Yes. OK, but you've got... It's, a, it's not a, a model that is sustainable by the sounds of what you're saying, and so you're working out how to price, you, price your learning and teaching? So I th it's ra rather than it not being sustainable, Senator, the, the operation is changing quite a bit. So okay. the Academy will deliver some services uh, likely through a sponsorship model with other agencies, and then there'll continue to be a fee-for-service cost recovery element okay. for course delivery. And so we're just developing that new model in order to understand how we've got sufficient costs for a sustainable base for the core operation, and then what it is that we attract through fee-for-service for course delivery. I and the new model is very much a partnership with the rest of the Australian Public Service, and the new funding model will be highly transparent and work to get worked up with the Department okay. of Finance and the Coup Committee. Okay. And so those contracts that I've got, I've looked at, I've found four contracts totalling around $474,000 to develop and establish the APS Academy. Are that, is that all the contracts that have been entered into on this APS Academy, or are there more...? Uh, that's all at this stage, Senator, whether we require any additional assistance between now and then for one to meet the 1 July delivery deadline, you know, we may... So there may into... be more, need to do further procurement activities. Do you know of any now? No. OK. All right, we'll keep an eye on that one too. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. You. Senator Patrick, very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, there, there was an article in um, the news on the 28th of July 2020, uh, Finance Minister Matthias Cormann did not pursue a direct pitch from billionaire financier Lex Greenshill to roll out his wages on demand to 150,000 Commonwealth public servants after the Department of Finance said it was economically similar to payday lending. So there was a proposition clearly put forward that uh, instead of people having to wait till the fortnight's over or the month's over to get their pay, they could actually have pay on demand. Uh, but I've, that came at a cost. Just wondering, um, how, did you have any involvement in uh, the consideration and then the knocking back of that proposal? Uh, no, Senator. So you have no it. knowledge of it at all? No knowledge of it. Can I just all. ask, um, uh, were you ever approached by Miss Bishop, um, noting that she was the person that approached um, Minister Cormann in relation to this activity? Uh, no, Senator. No emails, no phone no. calls, no meetings? Nothing. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Hello there. Um, I've got some questions about the APS commissioned uh, census of 2020, which I think was published about two months or ago. Um, I'm interested particularly in the figures around uh, staff members' perception or experience of discrimination, harassment and corruption. And some of the figures for various agencies are 
uh, quite alarming. Um, in particular, Ackley, for example, um, there's a uh, perception by 12% of staff that there is a issue with corruption um, within Ackley. Uh, so there's, there's, that's just one example. There's a number of other agencies that also have, in my view, concerning uh, staff reporting of issues. So my questions are whether or not you will be providing that census to the Jenkins review about uh, workplace uh, safety and harassment. Um, I, I must say I've met with um, Commissioner Jenkins on two mm -hmm. occasions now. Mm -hmm. um, we've not discussed those census findings, um, but they're public. Uh, the, the, uh, they've all been, um, the great majority of census um, outcomes by agency have actually been released, apart from the aggregated data which we release. So I'm very happy to make it available to okay. Commissioner Jenkins in, in, uh, in my next conversation with her. But okay. I might ask, uh, um, Commissioner Purcell, who's in charge of the census, to join us on at the table if you have any more right, detailed thank questions. You. Um, I'm under strict instructions to keep it short, but okay, thank you for making sorry. yourself available. Uh, what will be done about this, and whose role is it to address the concerns that staff hold? Is that your role? Or Are we talking sexual partner? harassment or corruption here? Now? All of them. Or, discrimination, or, or harassment and corruption, the three parameters that were measured that, that I have in front of me. Um, whose responsibility is it to address those? What are the actions that will well, be taken? Well, um, it's, it's um, there are a number of different aspects to it. In terms of the system, it's, it's the APSC. Uh, in terms of the individual agency, it's the agency head. Mm. So, for example, um, on, on something like um, if, if, there's a, if there's a complaint against an agency head, that would come to me to be determined or evaluated. Mm -hmm. if, there's a, if there's a complaint against people within the agency, that's a matter for the agency head to, um, to manage. Okay, I understand what happens if complaints are made, but is there any action that will be taken as a result of this census that shows such high levels of either actual or perceived well, corruption, discrimination and harassment? Well, the actual, as I recall, and, and Commissioner, uh, Assistant Commissioner Purcell will correct me, the uh, Corruption figures, and it's quite a broad definition of corruption, so mm. it includes things like ne allegations of nepotism mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and those sort of things. It's actually from the previous census where it was 4.5% that had reserved corruption, then it's actually fallen to, I think, was it 3.5%? Uh, 3.5%. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a declining trend mm -hmm. uh, in, terms of, of, in terms of corruption. In terms of, of sexual harassment and appropriate work, workplace behaviour, again, we have zero tolerance for that within yes. the APS, as we, do for, as we do for corruption, and it's all about ensuring it's a safe and ethical workplace. The figures are there again, but I might I don't have them quite the top of my head, but you, I might hand it over to you. So, Katrina Purcell, Assistant Commissioner. Um, so, the proportion of census respondents who indicated experiencing sexual harassment over the 12 months prior to the census um, was 0.4 per cent of, the, of respondents. Uh, and that represented 425 uh, respondents from the 108,000 staff who responded to the survey. Okay, thank you. Um, but my question still is, what, what happens now that we know this information, what actions are taken as a result of knowing these figures and by whom? Well, the agency head obviously, the agencies obviously get their own results. Um, agency heads, if they're like the APSC, they will talk about their, their, their census results with their staff. They'll mm -hmm. look to address issues and concerns. And you would expect that they would be managed in that way. And certainly in my own case, for example, with the APSC, I've made it very clear that should there be any concerns, whether they be about corruption or bullying or sexual harassment, that I, I, my door was open always open and there were processes which are set out, mm. uh, which are very clear and, I, uh, and, and set out again okay. various So you'll be reactive or responsive to complaints. Will there be any um, proactive raising uh, by you or any of the other commissioners with some of the worst performing agencies? Um, again, that, that's really a matter for the, um, for the, aid, for the agency head. Okay. For the minister, so you won't for take the that proactive step, but you hope that they will do the right thing? I, I don't see, I have to, with all due respect, Senator, I don't see a systemic issue with, in the public service with corruption, and nor do I see one with sexual harassment as a systemic issue. I think the system is working in terms of the APS, and, mm -hmm. uh, that, and uh, that, 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 is, that, uh, that is my view. 
Okay, so it's not your role to um, take to task some if, of those if I saw If I agencies. saw there was a systemic problem, I would. Th there are powers under the Public Service Act where I could do a systemic review. Okay. Uh, if I, uh, if, if, if should the Prime Minister or the min um, or, or, or the Secretary want me to do such a thing, but I don't see the need at this point uh, to raise that. I don't see the issue in okay. a systemic way. Um, and lastly, will you be raising these? Uh, issues, whether they be systemic or otherwise, the, the reality of these figures, will you be raising those with either the Workplace uh, Gender Equality Agency and or the Office of Women? Um, they, as a, they should have access to these results. Um, I can obviously, I can obviously bring, bring them to their attention, uh, should yes. you wish. But, okay. Senator, I, I, think you, sorry, I think you had uh, evidence earlier on today. We are working with WGIA around improving our reporting so we can report public service data in line with the, the existing Wajia reporting as well. So there's are a, you one of the agencies that already does that voluntarily? Or yeah, are you there, are, there are a number that do it voluntarily, but we're looking at doing it from a whole of system, a whole of service perspective. So in the budget, we received additional funding so that we can work closely with, with Wajia on that and yes. implement that respect at work piece. Yes, yes, that's a long overdue reform that we support. Thank you, Chair. Thank Thanks. you so much, Senator Waters. Uh, we will now dismiss the uh, Australian Public Service Commission with our thanks and break for dinner and reconvene at eight o'clock. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll resume the estimates hearing and welcome the office of the official Se secretary to the Governor General. Uh, I welcome Mr. Paul Singer, official secretary to the Governor General, and officers of the office of the official secretary to the Governor General. Mr. Singer, do you wish to make an opening statement? I do, Chair. Just a brief Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Paul Singer, official secretary to the Governor General. In my brief opening, I'd like to highlight a few ongoing priorities for the Governor-General and Mrs Hurley, and therefore my office. On the 13th of May, Their Excellencies hosted a presentation ceremony for the National Emergency Medal, during which the Governor-General presented the medal to the loved ones or representatives of those who lost their lives serving the community during the 2019 and 20 bushfires. As the committee would be aware, the National Emergency Medal is awarded to persons who rendered sustained or significant service during the nationally significant emergencies in Australia. In coming months, many tens of thousands who served during the devastating 2019-20 bushfires will be recognised with the National Emergency Medal. As the Governor-General said during that ceremony, it will become a very visible reminder of the devastation of the fires and of the scale of the response. Those who wear it will identify with each other for having been there and be identified by grateful communities for what they did. The rollout of the National Emergency Medal to an estimated 130,000 Australians for their service during the bushfires is a priority for my office. We are working closely with state agencies to gather nominations and anticipate tens of thousands of medals being presented in coming months. That work is both on budget and on track. It goes to one of the Governor-General's priorities recognising members of the Australian community who give and serve selflessly. As he's often remarked, these people don't do what they do for recognition, and in fact, they often shy away from it. But it is important that we do celebrate them and the richness of spirit that they represent. The Governor-General Mrs Hurley recently hosted investiture ceremonies at Government House for recipients of other honours and awards, including the Order of Australia. These ceremonies are a celebration of individuals' achievement, commitment and dedication. At any ceremony, a remarkable breadth of service is recognised. They are an opportunity for the Governor-General on behalf of all Australians to say thank you and recognise the selfless service of people in our community. The Governor-General has publicly recognised the need to increase the number of nominations for individuals from parts of our community that have historically been underrepresented in the Order of Australia. We are working with community leaders to encourage more nominations for women and raise awareness of and access to the honours system in multicultural and Indigenous communities. It reflects the Governor-General's view, which we share, 
that the honours and awards system, and indeed all of our operations, have a significant role in celebrating the good in our community. This important work is being underpinned by concurrent upgrades to our information technology systems. This modernisation project will address critical risks, migrate our ICT services to the cloud, and modernise the office's ageing ICT infrastructure. Chair, I also note this committee's ongoing interest in the Kirribilli Point Precinct Restabilisation Project. The project is proceeding well. Reconstruction of the stone retaining wall is nearing completion, and whilst it has been complex, the project will be successfully completed in the coming months, and critically, the marine barracks, barracks will have been preserved. Finally, I wish to provide advice to the committee with regard to the Senate order for production of documents related to unanswered questions on notice. There were five questions taken on notice by the office during the additional estimates, and 57 written questions on notice were received after the last hearing. Responses to all questions were sent to the Senate committee by the nominated due date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Singer. Mr. Ayer, uh, Senator Ayres, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Mr Singer. I have a few questions. Um, thank you for your opening statement. So the Prime Minister announced the National Emergency Medal in, uh, in January of last year. Um, so the only, the only awards have been to the group that you've just referred to at this stage. What's the, I heard you say a figure about the number of awards that are proposed to be made. Can, can you just take me again through that? How many awards you believe will be made and what's the timetable for making those awards? So to date, Senator, the, those that have been physically presented include the 10 at the ceremony hosted by the Governor-General on the 13th of May, and yes. they were for those that lost their lives fighting the fires in 2019-20. Um, I'll be corrected if, I, if I've got this wrong, but I understand there may have been one additional that was uh, approved um, a, in an exceptional schedule because that person uh, was having a, a terminal illness. Yes. And we're expecting over the coming months that there may be up to uh, 70,000 uh, nominations received from state and territory agencies, which will all be processed and dispatched quickly. And over the entirety of this um, period, uh, two year period, we're expecting as, as many as 130,000 Australians may be eligible for the medal. So two years, 130,000. That's correct, Senator. How was the date of the uh, first presentation ceremony on the 13th of May determined? On the 14th of May, the families of those deceased and the um, a, a number of members of the firefighting community came together for a national commemorative service here in Canberra. And we felt that it was an appropriate, uh, dignified and timely opportunity to acknowledge those firefighters that had lost their lives by having a ceremony for those families and loved ones the, the day prior at Government House. Was the Prime Minister's office consulted on the day? The Prime Minister was invited to attend the ceremony and, and in fact did attend the ceremony, as did um, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Richard Miles, who was representing the Leader of the Opposition, uh, and both the Prime Minister and Mr Miles spoke at that ceremony. But, but was the Prime Minister's office consulted on setting the date? Uh, not on setting the date, no, Senator. But... So 24th of January this year, the Prime Minister announced he said that individuals recognised for their contribution, service or achievement relating to COVID-19 will feature on a dedicated COVID-19 honours roll as well as the official Australian Honours database from the Queen's birthday in June. Could you explain how that honours roll will work? Yes, Senator. So um, those that have demonstrated and displayed exceptional and outstanding service in response to the pandemic may be entitled for recognition either through the Order of Australia uh, or existing meritorious awards such as the Public Service Medal, the Australian Police Medal, uh, the Emergency Service Medal, uh, the Ambulance Service Medal and the Australian Corrections Medal based on the uh, recommending authority. And in terms of the specific honour roll that was referred to in the Prime Minister and the Governor General statement in January, that will bring together those that have been recognised for COVID-related service 
and that honour roll um, will capture all of those that have been recognised for that service in th through either the Order of Australia or those meritorious awards in a separate list which will be um, housed on the Governor-General's website. So, so if you're given one of those awards, you end up on that list, not on the other list, is that So right? it will be in addition to. So each of those awards would generally come out in either the Queen's Birthday or the Australia Day list. Um, and in addition to being in those routine lists, there'll be a separate and dedicated honour roll for COVID-related service. And how many people do you anticipate will receive those awards? Uh, it's very difficult to say, Senator, um, because service could extend to those on the front line, it could extend to those that have been involved in so research. So what's the, what's the plan? Is it um, what, what aged I, care workers? or um, nurses, um, doctors, who, who...? Well, it may well be any of those, Senator, including those that have been on the, the front line or involved in the logistics effort or the research effort. Um, but to give a sense of the scale, to date we've received 106 nominations that relate to COVID-related service. One hundred and six. OK. Um, so, the council, I'll just ask a few questions about the council for the Order of Australia, um, made up of 19 members, so state and territory representatives, public office holders and community representatives. When was uh, Mr Stone appointed to the council? Um, for memory, and, and my staff will correct me if I've got this wrong, but I believe it was in 2014 as a community member. So he was a community member. And he's the former, we had Mr Stone in here before, um, larger than life. Um, he's the former country Liberal Party Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, isn't he? Well, that's a, a role he's previously held, yes, Senator. Former federal president of the Liberal Party? I believe so. President of the CLP as recently as 2017. I, I understand that to be correct, Senator. So, so appointed in 2014, was president of the CLP for two or three years during that period. How can how can he be seen as playing an independent role? Um, well, I think it's important to note that all members of the, the council, regardless of what roles they hold uh, in their day jobs, bring a breadth and diversity of experience to that council, uh, regardless of their political uh, persuasion or associations. You'd expect community members to be, or community representatives to be just that, wouldn't you? There's a notion of independence attached to that idea? It's not a partisan appointment, is it? No, in, in fact, everything but, Senator. The, the in, independence of the Council is a, a critical hallmark of the Australian Honours and Awards system. So how can somebody who's president of a political party be a non-partisan appointment? Well, I'd, I'd, the, ultimately, these appointments of community members are a matter for Prime Minister and Cabinet, but I don't think someone's uh, political membership necessarily disqualifies them. So their political membership doesn't have an impact on whether they're partisan or not? Well, my observations of the Council is it absolutely hasn't, Senator. So you're aware, I, I suppose, as well, that Mr Stone is an agency head? Yes. So how, how can the head of an agency, someone whose job is within the gift of the Prime Minister, possibly be an appropriate person to chair an independent body that makes recommendations to the Governor-General? How does that work? Uh, I, I think, ultimately, that's a question best referred to Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, as the recommendation for both the community members and the chair uh, come from a Prime Minister. 
So you defended the non-partisanship or independence up until that point, and now it's a question for the Prime Minister whether or not that's an appropriate appointment. Uh, well, what, I would, what, what I would say, Senator, is the um, independence of the council is, is critical. Yeah. And each of the council members, whether they be uh, recommended from the various jurisdictions on the advice of the Premier or Chief Minister, or the community representatives on the advice of the Prime Minister, bring a breadth and depth of experience which ultimately benefits the council. On another matter, has, has your office sought or received any advice about the status of communications with um, Buckingham Palace following the Palace Letters case? Sorry, can you just repeat the question? The, the, the High Court matter around yes. the Palace yes. Letters, has, yes. has your office received uh, any advice about the status of communications with Buckingham Palace following the determination of that matter? Uh, my office, as you might understand and appreciate, Senator, um, has uh, communicated with the Palace um, on a, a number of occasions, um, updating them on the outcome of that High Court decision. Um, they have all been what I would characterise as routine updates. Um, I'm not aware of other agencies or departments or individuals uh, within Australia providing updates directly to Buckingham But have you sought or received any advice about the implications about that decision? Well, I, I would note that uh, the release of those papers and the decision of the High Court last year uh, was a matter for the National Archives, mm. uh, and the Director-General has uh, been in, in contact with me about uh, the implication of that decision um, for the release of the papers, uh, which I note were released last year in full. But does it have implications for, uh, for document management or the kind of correspondence that the Governor-General or your office has with Buckingham Palace is what I'm trying to... Have you sort of... Uh, uh, sorry, Senator, I, I misunderstood. Um, it's had no impact on our contemporary communications with Buckingham Palace. So the Governor-General's in regular communication with the Palace? Um, Senator, I, I think it's a matter of... Um, public commentary that the Governor-General himself has said on a number of occasions that he's only written less than a handful of occasions. Um, what we have seen in the Palace papers that were released last year is far more regular correspondence than is currently and contemporarily the case. What about you, Mr Singer? Do you communicate with the Palace regularly? Uh, on an as-needs basis, uh, there are naturally items that require correspondence between me and the Palace. Um, but again, there's, there's, uh, it would be infrequent. Infrequent, okay. Um, so just to clarify, you, you have sought legal advice about the status of communications? No, no, I didn't say that I'd sought legal advice. So what I so said... So, sorry to persist with this. You haven't sought legal advice following the High Court decision? That's correct. Um, your answer to question 1148 from the budget estimates round shows that it cost um, in 2019-20 it cost taxpayers more than $1,700 every time the key was turned on the office Rolls Royce. $17,611.66 to keep the roller on the road in 2019-20 um, and the car was used just 10 times. Can, can you tell the committee how that expenditure is justified? Uh, well, what I would note initially, Senator, to put this into some context, that the Rolls-Royce has been used on 17 separate occasions in, in um, this financial year to date, 2021. Um, so, so, se so seven more times than when you provided that answer, seven times since, is it? So a total of 17 occasions for 2021 financial year to date. Um, and that's used for ceremonial occasions such as credentials, as, as was answered in the question on notice response. And I'd observe here, Senator, that the use of a Rolls-Royce is a key feature of the ceremonial occasions where, particularly for credentials, uh, visiting heads of mission, presenting their credentials to the Governor-General, it's a significant moment for them. 
And I think, uh, as Australians, we should all be rightfully proud about how we uh, host an incoming head of mission and in a very dignified, appropriate and uniquely Australian way uh, host a ceremony that is commensurate uh, and appropriate for the circumstances. And what's the cost of maintaining the Rolls-Royce in the current financial year? Uh, so this year it's been a total of uh, 8,300 senator or thereabouts, which includes a registration of uh, $1,429. So 8,300 so far? Correct. How's it uniquely Australian to do it in a Rolls Royce? I, I, I sort of, I, um, I was with you while, uh, bouncing along the, your, your uh, justification for it. I was sort of following it, but uniquely Australian Rolls Royce is there? Yeah, I, I accept your point, Senator. Um, but what I what I have um, seen and heard, it's a fancy, but not uniquely Australian the Rolls Royce. It's a no. Well, what British car? I think. Without wishing to take my comments out of context, I think I was observing that, as on a whole, um, the ceremony is a uniquely Australian experience, and the Rolls-Royce adds to that experience. Um, it, it provides a degree of dignity uh, and ceremony to a very important occasion. OK, thank you. The, the Governor-General and uh, Mrs Hurley received their AstraZeneca vaccination um, on the 26th of March. Were, were, were any of your staff vaccinated alongside the Governor-General? No, Senator. Has your office arranged any COVID-19 vaccinations for staff? Not specifically or directly for staff. Those that, of course, that are entitled as part of the rollout may have elected to take up that, sure. that opportunity. So that, they're making their own arrangements, but there's not a There's um, not been anything organised specifically for staff. In our previous estimates, I think you and I have um, have gone backwards and forwards about people who have received an award um, in the Order of Australia, um, and there are a series of examples of people who had received an award and subsequently there was a, I think it's, a, T tell me if this is wrong, but I think where we got to was that they were the subject of adverse findings in royal commissions, um, particularly the ones that were highlighted that were the source of community concern had been the subject of uh, adverse findings in the um, Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission, mm -hmm. um, you know, findings that they were pedophiles or had abused their position in in um, schools or in religious organisations, and there was, I think, a legitimate amount of community concern that, despite those findings, that there were no um, there were no cancellations or terminations of their awards, and that was, I think, not just a source of concern, but was a source of um, additional trauma for the people who were the victims of that abuse. I think you said um, the last time that we met there is a body of work going into how cancellations and terminations can not only meet the requirements of the ordinance but also meet contemporary community expectations. Can you let me know where that's up to? So that's the ordinance around terminations and cancellations um, and importantly contemporary issues around anyone that might be being considered for termination or cancellation is an agenda item for each council meeting. Um, I think, if I'm correct, Senator, the conversation we had last time was around a very specific set of circumstances around a, a previous member who was subsequently deceased and that um, you and I were discussing whether there were provisions within the constitution of the Order of Australia to terminate someone's award after they became deceased. Um, and in my subsequent response to the question on notice, I informed you that section 25.2a of the Constitution makes it quite clear that the order is an order of living people and that um, a person ceases to be a member or honorary member of the order upon the death of a person. 
So is there any work, so it's a standing agenda item, is it, at the council meetings, but is there any, that, is there work being undertaken to review the constitution uh, or the policy around the constitution? As, as you'd indicated, is there a body of work? Not, not specifically in relation to terminations and cancellations. Naturally, when these questions arise, um, either the Secretariat or the Council turn their minds to them to determine whether any further work is required. And uh, at the moment, there is no additional uh, work in relation to terminations and cancellations. I think you also said if there were to be grounds to revisit the termination and cancellations ordinance, I'm sure my office would be well prepared to support the council in that process. No, no work been undertaken there? No, the, no such request um, or um, re request for support from a council has been received. So when you said body of work, was there work being undertaken at the time? Senator, um, when, when those questions were being raised, it was in a period of time where uh, I was turning my mind to what other opportunities might be available to the Council uh, and indeed to the Secretariat and of course to the Governor-General about uh, whether the terminations and cancellations ordinance remained fit for purpose. And with the benefit of um, some, some thought and some advice on exactly those questions. Uh, it's been determined that there's no further work required on the terminations and cancellation ordinance. So, the, so when, you say, when you said body of work, um, before it had even begun, the, the, the body of work stopped? Uh, no, Senator, there was work being undertaken within the Secretariat um, to determine what other options might be available and available to the Council. And what did that determine? Um, it determined, based on uh, long-standing legal advice, that the terminations and cancellations ordinance remains fit for purpose. Senator Rares, you've been going for about 20 minutes. I have, um, I, have I think, one more question. Thank you. We, we also talked about the removal of honours from people who are still living. Uh, and I think we had a debate about you answered some questions that made it clear that that the governor general may terminate an appointment or cancel an award if in the position if in the opinion of the governor general the holder of the appointment or award has behaved or acted in a manner that has brought disrepute on the order uh, and in your view adverse findings by a royal commission um, were not sufficient the the, the ground that you and the council believe was the threshold was a criminal conviction. Are there any changes being contemplated to fix that problem? No, and, and if I may, Senator, I'll just refer you to the chairman's statement of the 4th of September last year, where it says, naturally, disrepute is a very subjective term. And I think that's something that the council has been grappling with for some time, but that, statement says that as a general principle, for the order to be brought into disrepute, a conviction, penalty or adverse finding must have occurred. In essence, the Council recognises that a finding under the law prescribes the behaviours and expressions which are abhorrent in society and therefore uses such findings as a threshold for termination and cancellation. And one of the key aspects of that principle is that the legal process must have been exhausted. An adverse finding in a Royal Commission in and of itself uh, is not the end of a legal process. Well, I, 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 I can't imagine that there would be too many people in the community who would agree with that. There have been findings made by Royal Commissions about historic cases of child abuse. There, without commenting on the particularities of any of those cases, the threshold for those findings uh, and the difficulty of securing prosecutions for historic child, se you know, the sexual abuse of children is very high indeed, very difficult. In some, in some cases, the prospects are remote. 
but there is no doubt that these things happened. Uh, and yet you say there is no proposal. I mean, how, how, how out of step could one be to listen to the pleas of those people and not be prepared to contemplate change to the ordinance or to the constitution? You do recognise it's out of step with where the community would be. Well, I think the other thing I'd observe here, Senator, is that um, I, I'm not aware that this actually applies to many individuals that have been awarded or recognised through the honours system. There was the specific example that you referred me to during our last hearing, um, and that was a very specific set of circumstances. But in terms of others that may have had adverse findings through the Royal Commission, um, I'm not aware how many of them have actually been recognised through the order. Thanks, um, Mr Singer. I have no further questions, Chair. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, the Governor-General uh, um, was sworn in on the 1st of July 2019. How long is his commission? Uh, well, there is no fixed date, Senator, but notionally by convention it's a five-year term. Okay, so around 2020, June 2024. That, that's correct. Okay. Um, which state governors ho uh, presently hold dormant commissions to act as administrator, administrator of the Commonwealth in the event that the Governor-General is overseas were absent from duty owing to illness or other reasons? Um, I, I would happy, happily be corrected on this, Senator, but um, I believe all state governors currently may act as administrator if called upon. OK, so does that require a commission issued by Her Majesty or...? No, it's, a, it's something that's issued by the Governor-General. OK. Um, is that something that can be tabled at all? Uh, I'd like to just take that on advice, yeah. Senator, because it may be a matter of royal prerogative, sure. and I wouldn't wish to. Uh, I understand. I just uh, come across it might also difficult be administrative in some sense. Yes. So, um, okay. Uh, and if indeed um, uh, those that commission or that order has an expiry date, could you provide that as well? Uh, I can say definitively that it doesn't. Doesn't have. Okay. No. Thank you. Um, it's, it's it's for the term of the. Governor-General's term, so okay. it's tied to that. Okay, fantastic. Um, now, you might have been aware there's been a number of articles in the in the UK following uh, the, the death of um, Prince Philip uh, about, uh, noting Her Majesty's 95, about perhaps uh, a regency being declared in the event that Her Majesty became incapacitated, incapacitated in some way, uh, having not um, abdicated the throne, and uh, there may not be a necessity to do that. Um, firstly, um, I presume in those circumstances, um, well, well, I understand that Prince Charles would become the regent as a, a matter of default declared by, I think there's four or five officers in the UK who can who can declare that. Is that, is that correct? Um, Senator, I... I wouldn't wish to mislead you or the committee. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's as black and white as that, nor mm -hmm. is it as definitive as that. That may be one outcome, but I suspect that there may be other outcomes. That Isn't it other. defined in the Regency Act of uh, 1937, the UK Act? Well, it's, it would be a hypothetical, Senator, on the basis that um, given the prevailing circumstances of the day, it may require them to consider not only that option, but potentially other options. OK. Um, is there a provision in the Australian Constitution that relates to uh, an Australian Regency in the event that the Queen of Australia is unable to fulfil her constitutional duties? I'd have to take that on notice. No, I don't think there is. I know that, I'm just looking at the New, the New Zealand uh, Constitution, which says, says where under the laws of the United Kingdom the royal functions are being performed in the name and beyond, on behalf of the sovereign by a regent, and it, it goes on to explain that. Um, so my understanding is that the UK Regency Act is not a law of Australia um, and there are no provisions in our constitution that deal with the circumstance where a regent has been, been appointed. Um, has, are you aware of any correspondence that might have taken place between um, 
uh, Australia and the UK in relation to, the, to this? No, I'm not, Senator. I'm not a, uh, aware of any specific uh, such correspondence. Um, and, and matters in relation to this particular issue, we would take advice from Prime Minister and Cabinet on. OK. Um, I understand uh, back in 06, 07, there was the thought that the UK Prime Minister might be someone who could declare someone as a regent, because currently that's not the case. I think it is the Lord Chancellor, the Speaker of the House, uh, uh, that might be a, a way of uh, um, ensuring there's at least some separations uh, in the event of something ill happening to the to Her Majesty. Um, uh, I understand that when that was considered, there was correspondence between uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the UK government about about uh, uh, that particular proposed change, mm -hmm. which didn't which didn't go ahead. Are you able to confirm that at all? No, I wouldn't be able to confirm that, Senator, nor would have I have necessarily expected my office at that time to have mm. been directly involved. Can you uh, perhaps come back to the committee and advise? No, I don't think. Look, I don't wish. Of the host, I don't wish any will on Her Majesty, but there is a, a prospect uh, that um, uh, that that a regent might be appointed in the, in the UK, noting. Um, uh, Her Majesty is 95, and I think when she was 21, she said that she would not um, a, um, abdicate, that she would serve as Queen until her death. Um, what the implications are uh, in respect of us without a recognition of a regent? Mm -hmm. uh, so in those circumstances, we have we would have a monarch that is not able to fulfil those uh, the, the constitutional role that is uh, placed upon her. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Senator would be happy to take those on notice, but I would preface that these questions are better directed to Prime Minister and Cabinet, who have responsibility for the continuity and transitional yeah. arrangements. I'll probably ask them as well. So, I'll sort of appreciate the heads up, Senator. <laughs> test to see what you, you, what, you know, what you might have known about. But thank you. That's uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Uh, there being no other questions for the Office of the Official Secretary to the Governor-General, we will dismiss you with our thanks and call the Office of National Intelligence. You are correct. It was six minutes. It was. Thank you. I welcome Mr Andrew Shearer, Director-General, National Intelligence and Officers of the Office of National Intelligence. Mr Shearer, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to make some brief opening remarks at this, my first appearance before the committee since commencing as Director-General of National Intelligence on 18 December 2020. My association with ONI, and formerly ONA, goes back several decades. And over that period, I've engaged with ONI and the intelligence it produces from a number of perspectives. As a young current intelligence officer throughout my career as a foreign policy and national security professional, as Deputy Director General of ONI, and now as Director General. I can't think of any other time over that period when our mission has been as important as it is now. And the demands on our intelligence community 
and our people have never been greater. Strategic trends are running increasingly against Australia's interests. The world was already complex, but is becoming even more so as a result of COVID-19, the introduction of game-changing technologies like 5G and artificial intelligence, the impact of social media, the weaponisation of cyber and information as a regular tool of statecraft, great power competition and the changing world order. The list goes on. Our job at ONI is to help government make sense of that complexity by analysing matters of political, strategic or economic significance to Australia. And I'm mindful, as Director General, that our success is measured by the quality, rigour and integrity of that analysis. The universal feedback during my introductory meetings, whether with ONI's stakeholders and customers, across government, business leaders or our international partners, was respect and often growing demand for our insights. This is testimony to the commitment and hard work of all of ONI's staff right across the organisation. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them, including for the way they've risen to the additional challenges imposed by the pandemic. ONI's response to COVID-19 demonstrated resilience and adaptability. We were able to quickly pivot to new ways of working and collaborating to deliver for our customers while also looking after our people. It also reflects the enduring strength of ONI's culture. At its core is contestability, an openness to different ideas which depends on a diverse and inquiring workforce and the mutual respect needed to con contemplate divergent opinions. But in a world where threats and adversaries move quickly, we cannot afford to stand still. I'm committed to further improving ONI's capabilities and ensuring we remain a world-class all-source analytical organisation. Model best practice and lead the national intelligence community by example are forward-leaning in our use of technology, leverage our unique strengths, the credibility of our assessments, our visibility across the entire national intelligence community as an enterprise, our convening power and our position as a trusted source of advice to government, and carry out ONI's NIC leadership responsibility in a manner that provides maximum value to other agencies and ensures that what we do as a national intelligence community is greater than the sum of our parts. We have to update our business model to cope with the exponential growth in open source information, big data and classified reporting and ensure our intelligence remains relevant, timely and easily absorbed by our customers who themselves are already often dealing with information overload. This will require new analytical and dissemination tools and new approaches to recruitment, training and tradecraft. It will also require increased collaboration with an increasing span of departments and agencies beyond the traditional national security realm, with the private sector, academia and think tanks, with states and territories and with our international partners. Above all, it also entails working even more closely and constructively with my counterparts leading the other nine agencies and the more than 7,000 dedicated professionals who comprise our national intelligence community to keep Australia and Australians safe and protect our national interests in an increasingly contested world. Government makes a significant investment in our intelligence enterprise and there's a legitimate expectation that we keep delivering tangible results. In concluding, I'd like to thank my predecessor, Nick Warner, for his leadership of ONI and the NIC and the significant work done to establish the new architecture of our national intelligence community. A great deal has been achieved in the last two and a half years since ONI was established, but there's much more to be done. I look forward to working with the committee to ensure ONI and the national intelligence community continue to deliver world-class intelligence and a world-class intelligence community. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Shearer.
Oh, yes. M Mr Shearer, would you be happy to table a written version of Can I um, <laughs> email you a clean copy that doesn't have my Absolutely. scribbling all Absolutely. We've over had it? that issue a few times today. Um, Senator Ayres, I'm giving you the call. I would like us to endeavour to be done with this witness by 9 o'clock. Thank you. Um, Mr Shearer, of course, this is your first estimates, I think, since your appointment. So I'd like to acknowledge that and welcome you to... Um, the estimates process. I do have a, a few questions for you that go to really giving you an opportunity to give your views about the role of intelligence in policy making. Mm -hmm. um, ONI has a critical role at, um, as the agency responsible for enter enterprise management, I suppose you'd call it, the yes. national intelligence community, and in the production of intelligence assessments for government. Um, in the last uh, Last estimates with ONI that I recall, Mr Warner gave very impressive evidence, I think, about the importance of um, non-partisanship and the, having the confidence of government that it's receiving advice that's um, not partisan. Um, uh, wh what would you say about the role of independence uh, or the importance of independence for ONI and the kind of advice that it provides for government? Well, I think, um, Deputy Chair, that the independence of our, uh, our assessments is absolutely critical. And as I said in my opening statement, uh, that independence is key to the integrity of our, our work and our assessments. And our, um, our assessments and our work, in my, my strong view, only carry that integrity uh, if they're properly independent. So, uh, Deputy Chair, I would say that, you know, over my 30-year career, I've established a, um, a record as a national security professional that I think is respected on, on both sides of politics here in Australia and, and internationally. Um, I take my statutory responsibility for the independence of ONI's assessments very, very seriously indeed and um, uh, you know on this score perhaps I can do no better than quote my, my counterpart and friend the US Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines who says to be effective the DNI must never shy away from speaking truth to power even especially when doing so may be inconvenient or difficult to safeguard the integrity of our intelligence community the DNI must insist that when it comes to intelligence, there is simply no place for politics ever. And Deputy Chair, that's exactly the approach I intend to take in my leadership of ONI and of the national intelligence community. Thank you. And to shorten up the process um, for the Chair, uh, it, I might get you to on notice provide these dates, but you have of course served as Prime Minister Morrison's Cabinet Secretary, Prime Minister Abbott's National Security Advisor, Prime Minister Howard's international advisor and an advisor to former Howard Government Defence Minister Robert Hill. That's the case, isn't it? That is the case. I'm privileged to have served in those roles, Deputy Chair. The, the, the 2017 Independent Intelligence Review referred to the importance of contestability of intelligence assessments. What, what structures are in place to ensure that there's adequate contestability for ONI assessments? Contestability is right at the core of our culture and also our mission, mm. Deputy Chair. So we have a very uh, rigorous, uh, multifaceted approach to contestability in all of our analytical work. Uh, to start with, in our internal processes, we have very vigorous uh, mechanisms for ensuring that drafts of assessments under preparation are widely shared around the office for comment and contestation. We use uh, uh, analytical tradecraft like structured analytical techniques to make sure that uh, different perspectives are being brought to bear in our, uh, in our assessment products. Uh, sometimes we use other techniques like red teaming to make sure that we've thought about all the, all the angles and all the possibilities. What, what, what does that mean, Mr Shearer? A red, to, team to deputy, yep. a, a red team deputy chair is a process where you deliberately take a group of analysts 
um, and you, um, you give them a role in, in contesting the assumptions of the piece that's being drafted. So they'll come in and challenge the assumptions yeah, okay. with the responsible analysts. Um, then for some of our products, the, the larger longer term national assessments, uh, there's a national assessments board which provides contestability uh, of those products um, across a range of departments and agencies. All of our draft assessments are shared with other agencies, so outside ONI uh, for comment and critique. Uh, we have a, a growing external outreach program where, consistent with security requirements, we will, uh, we will engage outside experts, perhaps think tankers or, um, or uh, academics. We share drafts of our product with our international partners on a, on a regular basis. Uh, as an office, we do a, a review of our key judgments on a rolling six-monthly basis. We go back and look at our key judgments and check that they have tracked well uh, with current developments. And then finally, the um, Office of the Inspector General of uh, Intelligence and Security regularly reviews our, um, anal the analytic integrity of uh, all of ONI's work. So there's a, there's a pretty um, well-developed set of, uh, if you like, checks and balances, contestability built in at every stage of, of, um, of our work, Deputy Chair. Thanks, um, Mr Shearer. The, there are still some um, unimplemented recommendations of the 2017 uh, Independent Intelligence Review. Um, to, in terms of the oversight provisions over the 10 NIC agencies, I think the recommendation was four under the oversight of the Inspector General of Intelligence Security, so Home Affairs, AFP, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission and uh, Austrac. Um, what's your um, what's your view about where that um, the progress of implementing that recommendation? Uh, Deputy Chair, the first thing I'd say is that that it's very important we have a a robust uh, oversight framework. I think that's incredibly important to the credibility of our work that we operate in a robust legal and ethical framework. Um, uh, the, the 2017 review had things to say about the, the details of that framework. Uh, the Richardson review, which, um, which was finalised um, in, the, in the last year or so, um, uh, was an even more detailed study of the national security legal framework, probably the most comprehensive review mm in several decades, and that, that took some different positions on some of the details of the oversight. Um, so uh, Home Affairs in particular, uh, the Richardson Review took the view that the oversight provisions were sufficient. Um, that's the, correct. The, the, um, the Independent Intelligence Review um, had quite a, reached quite a different conclusion. Yes. Where are you on that question? Uh, it's not really a question for me, Deputy Chair. It's a policy question for the government, and, and the government's announced its its uh, its view on that. It it, um, it it accepted many of the recommendations of the Richards. I thought I'd very generously give you an opportunity to say what you thought, <laughs> uh, and I did, Deputy Chair. <laughs> um, so there were the. Previous appearances, there were two, I think uh, Mr Warner said, very experienced and fine ONI officers acting in the, pre in the position of your deputy. Um, is that still the case? Have those positions been advertised? What's the state? Uh, they have not there? yet, but they will very shortly, Deputy Chair, and one of the very fine uh, occupants is here uh, in the form of Dr Wainwright this evening. But I, um, I don't want to embarrass her, but and so is there a timeline? Uh, I, I'll be advertising the position very shortly. Um, finally, Mr Shearer, has the agency organised COVID-19 vaccinations for any of its staff? Um, I might defer to Dr Toloni, but I don't think so, Deputy Chair, because that we're following the APS-wide um, rules and protocols about COVID vaccination. But that is correct. There's been um, two instances, I believe, um, where 
Um, vaccinations have been organised and arranged for those travelling um, internationally, but that's only occurred, obviously, that's, that's in correct. minimal numbers and only very recently. What about you, Mr Shearer? Sorry. Were you, were you one of those chair? who was arranged vaccinations for? I have been vaccinated. OK, thank you. Um, that's to all facilitate I have. my travel two weeks ago to the United States. Thank you, yes. Chair, I'm done, thank you. Senator Patrick. Oh, I have no questions. Oh, no, I did know that, sorry. Uh, Senator Kitchen, did you have any questions for O&I? Oh. Senator Patterson. Just very quickly, um, Mr Shearer, I don't know if you've seen the reporting in the United States today, um, first in the Wall Street Journal, but then picked up by other publications um, speculating about the origins of COVID-19. Um, it attributes uh, to US intelligence sources some doubt about it being of a natural origin, um, and the evidence it provides for that is that um, employees of the Wuhan Institute of Virology were struck down and hospitalised by an illness in November 2019. Um, does Owen and I have an assessment uh, on this issue that you can share in this forum? Uh, Senator, I'm aware of those public reports and some of the uh, information released by Secretary Pompeo uh, towards the end of the Trump administration, but I can't in this forum really go into details of our assessments, but we could, we could brief uh, more appropriately in a different, different forum. Understood. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Patterson, there being no further questions, uh, we will dismiss the ONI with our thanks and I never thought I'd say this today. Break early for uh, tea yeah, break. Yeah. And <laughs> I just, we always yeah. deliver. Yes, just had to have faith. Um, we will. Can get the in at ten past nine, or we yeah. will break and reconvene at ten past nine um, with the ANAO. I kept thinking I must have missed someone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> And I well, I'm, I'm recommending for the purpose of inviting the witnesses in, if we could uh, have the officials from the ANAO please join us. I now welcome Mr Granter here, Auditor General of Australia and Officers of the Australian National Audit Office. Mr Herhir, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Senator Patrick, okay. you have the call. Thank you. So uh, my line of questioning tonight just goes to the water audit, the strategic water purchases, and I note, and um, perhaps I'm um, mixing committees here, but we had a discussion in the JCPAA uh, where, in circumstances where there was a valuation in relation to the water for the Kiora and Clyde um, uh, properties uh, with a minimum value of, uh, I think it was eighteen hundred dollars per, sorry, eleven hundred dollars per megalitre uh, to twenty three hundred dollars per megalitre. The Commonwealth paid twenty seven uh, four forty five per megalitre, so above the uh, valuation. Uh, you uh, contacted the valuer who said that there was no intention f or it wasn't his intention to guide the Commonwealth to go above 2300 and I'm just reading your comment where you said we're looking at what we can do to assure readers of our report that they have um, that subsequent information available to them. So I'm just wondering where you are up to in, in respect of uh, backwards and forwards between the department and what, what uh, your final resolution might be in relation to that um, issue? Um, I've put a, a document on our <coughs> website and um, referenced it in the performance audit, which sets out what 
the valuer had told us after the event. So I've made the reader, when they see those, when they read that relevant section, there's a direction or a, on, online, it's a, a pop-up thing, hyperlink, where they can go and see what the uh, valuer subsequently told us. Okay. Now, th this just goes to the concern that, you know, had, had the department run the valuer themselves, we might have saved $12.9 million. Um, uh, would there be any recommendations flowing from what subsequently occurred to make sure that officials um, better understand how to read evaluation? Um, I think there's a there's a lesson in there for the importance of talking to people who provide you with advice to make sure that you understand the advice correctly, particularly when it was of the nature of this one, which had um, multiple moving parts and was asked for moving for a number of mm. different things. And um, as we've said in the past, we believed that how the department interpreted the um, valuation was a reasonable reading of the valuation. Now, subsequently, the valuer said that's not what they intended. Um, I think the lesson out of that is when you get some a document like that, which had had uh, referenced a number of different moving parts to uh, what was happening in the water market, and then having a conversation with the value would, probably would have been a useful thing to do. Okay, and so in your addendum, do you make any recommendations? I, I'm just mindful that the secretary of the department said he would rely on what it was that the Auditor General said? No, um, because we haven't audited it. Um, oh. We've got a, an ex post statement by the valuer saying that at the point in time when we contacted him, that's not what he had in mind at the point of time when he did the valuation, but we haven't gone in and tested that assertion from the valuer either. So we haven't gone and looked at his working papers to get a view from that because that's effectively reopening the audit, which we haven't done. What we've tried to do is make sure that um, the reader of the audit gets an understanding of the point yeah. about what the value was said, bearing in mind that the audit conclusion was quite <coughs> negative with respect to achieving the value for money in the procurement. Um, um, so it it doesn't it doesn't change the nature of the conclusion to the audit, which was that the processes they set up weren't robust in terms of achieving value for money. Right, I'll go and spend this evening reading your addendum and I reserve all my rights. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Senator Patrick, particularly for being so efficient with your time. Senator yeah. Rennick. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, look, my first question is regarding paragraph 4.77 of the Leppington Triangle purchase, the review you did there. Uh, in that, you've uh, implied that the Leppington Triangle was placed um, as a part of the land use and infrastructure impl implementation plan for the Western Sydney, that the Leppington Triangle was placed in the agriculture and agribusiness precinct, uh, when in actual fact it was placed in the uh, airport plan, in the airport zone. So is it fair to say that that 4.77, that paragraph 4.77 is a misstatement of fact? So I've got the plan here, and you can clearly see the triangles within the airport plan and not actually in the agricultural zone. Um, unfortunately, Senator, I don't have with me today the experts who dealt with that, the, the people who did that report, so I'll, I'll just have to look it up for you. And I may have to take that on notice. Okay, fine. Um, I'll then go to another part of the report, uh, paragraph 3.41. Uh, where you've stated uh, that the basically the definition of the highest and best use of land is what's effectively legally permissible. Uh, and if you actually go in and read AASB 13, Fair Value Measurement, uh, and look at paragraph 29, which follows paragraph 28, which you've quoted, highest and best use is determined from the perspective of market participants, even if the entity intends a different use. And I'll just read you paragraph 30. 
and nevertheless the entity shall measure the fair value of a non-financial asset assuming its highest and best use by market participants. So ultimately, end of the day, it's all in the eyes of the beholder and not what necessarily is legally permissible, even though given the fact that it's in the airport plan, it would therefore come once purchased, come under the Commonwealth Airports Act anyway, which is then makes it available to be zoned for 20 uses. So is that something that you should reconsider as well? That paragraph? I didn't say we were going to reconsider your first question. I said I'd look at that because I don't have the information in front of me. Yep. Um, with respect to our audit work in this area, I think most of what our audit work uh, was based on was the lack of due diligence by the department in establishing a procurement process and the work that we uh, drew upon in coming to a conclusion on that was the valuation work that the departments and others had undertaken in underpinning their procurement process. So, um, by, almost by definition, the, uh, the price that willing participants come to um, in an open market, in an open competitive market, is going to be fair, best fair value. We weren't in an open competitive market here. We're in a negotiation between the government and a seller. And what we were looking for from the department was a robust process for them to come draw the conclusion that the amount that they paid for that uh, piece of land was uh, consistent with um, the valuations processes that they'd put in place. Okay, so, so did you interview any of the uh, staff members who conducted that <coughs> due diligence? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that's Are you sure about that? Um, as I said, I don't have the auditors with us today. Um, so I can't say I'm sure. I just I believe that that's the case. OK, because they, they, they may have also uh, gained access or, or spoke to other people as well. Um, so that and they had every opportunity to provide us with that information. They had drafts of the report on a number of occasions to provide us with information about what other sources they drew upon to get to get that. The evidence that we had is what's set out in that audit report about the work that the department did in order to get to the price that they paid. Right, okay. Did you, uh, have you looked at any legal cases of this in regards to this? So other purchases of land around airports? Um, in, for what context? In, in terms of compulsory acquisition or, or, or buying land. I know it wasn't, but it's wasn't similar, similar conditions or buying land. No, it's not similar, because if it was a not, compulsory acquisition, they would have had to go on down a different path. And part of what But effectively, you still have to pay best in commercial use. Because I'll, I'll give you a couple of legal cases. First of all, we've got Sydney uh, Gould and Rootsy versus Commonwealth in 1992. And that was basically uh, the first uh, compensation claim to come out of the Lands Acquisition Act. And the ruling in that was the federal court ruled that rather than residential sales of property with commercial or industrial attributes provided a fair value comparison, Sunshine Coast Airport new run rate, run rate, runway, apologies, the court found it was correct to view the land as capable of development for industrial purposes, completely independent of what was incurring at the airport. Uh, valuing the Southern Cross Station in Melbourne, uh, the Victorian Civil and Administration Tribunal uh, determined that a valuation based on a mix of commercial and industrial comparison sales was appropriate. Um, so that's another example. Uh, and then finally, with a white road widening purchase in Mascot, uh, Sydney, the New South Wales <coughs> Land Environment Court also summarised that the land must be valued at the relevant date in its existing condition with all its potentialities. And as a general principle in determining compensation, doubts should be resolved in favour of a more liberal estimate. I think in all of those cases that you're quoting from how you've described it, and I don't know any of those yep. casings, they were all compulsory acquisitions. Well, no, you don't know. No, they weren't all compulsory. Some no, of these I, were I'm on the edge. I'm not certain how they so, end up so in court. So, Senator, I don't know how they end up in court if they're not compulsory acquisitions, but I'm not a property... No, it's yet. because it's where pe people felt they were dudded, so they went and took it to the court, right? So... so you're going down a rabbit hole here. Ultimately, you have to pay the best land value, right, as per WASB 13, because that's what you've put here in an audit snapshot. You've put in big, bold writing down the bottom here, 22 times higher price per hectare, uh, 
Uh, 26.7 million was the difference between purchase price and the fair value reported in the department's financial statements. That's a statement of fact. Well, well, well that's because but that's not that's because of the rules of the accounting standards, which is different to the valuation standards. But I've just went through the accounting standards actually, and they said you can value it at best value and what the market participants are willing to pay for it. But what's interesting is in 1995. $132 million had been spent on the Leppington Triangle, and it was valued in the accounts back then at $26.7 million, and that was when the Keating government had uh, was basically organised in uh, buying that land. So, you know, there's, this, there's a precedent for this before. It's a technicality, but you haven't really highlighted that technicality, so this precedent has all been set before. Furthermore, when they've done a special uh, state government of New South Wales and the federal government, did a um, cost review into not building this airport. They found that $60 billion in lost GDP would occur, uh, sorry, in lost revenue would occur, $30 billion in lost GDP, and 60 to 80,000 jobs would be foregone if they didn't get the airport built. So there's an opportunity cost there of $500 million a year. Um, and finally, in the last, um, if you look at the land values, that have gone up considerably in the last five years since this land has been zoned and, and works have been undertaken for the Sydney airport. So that land now, if you want to buy five acres industrial land now, is already well worth much more than what was paid for it a couple of years ago. So do you accept all that? Um, yes, this wasn't industrial land. Uh, it had potential to be zoned for industrial land and it was a part, no, no, I shall correct you on that because it was a part of the airport plan, and because it was a part of the airport plan, it comes under the Commonwealth Act, and that made it available to be rezoned as industrial land. So to say that it wasn't, it was in agricultural land is a misstatement of fact. I raised that point in the first point. It was a part of the airport plan, and therefore it was zoned as industrial. Wasn't it? So, so are you prepared to go back and look at paragraph 4.77, and go back and look at the original uh, report, the land use purpose, and acknowledge that that land was available, was actually industrial use and a part of the airport plan because it was a part of it. I'm happy to take the point on notice. Yep. Okay. But I don't, that doesn't mean I, I accept your proposition. I'd have to go back and look at the evidence. So, so if you look at the evidence and you accept, because I've got the plan right here in front of me, I can see the Leppington Triangle which is on the eastern side of the Northern Road, fits well within the airport plan. That's, I'm not disputing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Ayres. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Hare, uh, welcome. <laughs> Could you, um, just, uh, I'll take a deep breath after all that. Can you provide an update into the audit of the, safe, of the Safer Communities uh, grant program for me. So this is into the Home Affairs? Yes. Uh, so uh, we've written back uh, to the correspondent, the um, Member of Parliament from memory, um, with a view to looking to start that um, within our planning. So it was first raised with the ANAO when you say you we had wrote correspondence. back to the... We had correspondence. Um, and there were media reports on ABC 7.30 that Minister Dutton was, or at least Senator Keneally's allegation was that Minister Dutton was rorting the Safer Communities Fund for electoral advantage. What was the basis, though, of the audit officer's decision to investigate the grant, pro the grant program? Can, to do that? Can you just bear with me while I get the correspondence? Yes, of course. Sorry. Of course. So, um, we had correspondence from Senator Keneally. Um, we responded on the 10th of March. I think the overwhelming decision to proceed with this audit is a grants audit in Home Affairs. A lot of the work that we do in Home Affairs is uh, visa processing. Obviously, we've done procurement. Um, we haven't done grants in this space. Uh, so, that's the, the sort of thinking behind if uh, proceeding with this one. In a brief that was released under a Freedom of Information application, 
the department advises Minister Dutton, they say, should you decide to make funding decisions that do not reflect the order of merit, you may be criticised either in the media or by the ANAO. Unsuccessful applicants are invited to seek feedback from the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science about how to improve their application. This may highlight where a high scoring applicant does not receive funding. Is it regular for departments to express concern to ministers about the possibility of criticism from the audit office? I can't say that we see it very often, um, but certainly um, in an area like grants where there are a set of guidelines and rules, um, drawing attention to ministers about the guidelines and rules um, and the work of the ANAO could well come up. Because I think I've been around long enough in these proceedings to remember a very similar warning being issued to the minister in the sports rorts matter. That's right, isn't it? Mm. Couldn't answer without a pile of documents in front I won't, of us. But I won't certainly, ask you to. Uh, it isn't ha, ha. unusual. It's not unusual for departments briefing their ministers on grants or procurements, for example, to say this. This is the sort of rules framework that the ANAO looks at. So, how many staff have been allocated to the audit team? An audit of this kind, uh, sort of a base group of three, and then yes. people come in and go depending on the nature of the work. Sort of on the basis of their expertise yes. or or the workflow. Have you started collecting material? We have. We have started this audit. Um, we've opened contributions to the audit on the website. Um, I, think, I can't remember the tabling time, but it's definitely on its way. And so February 22... That, that sounds about right. ...timetable for completion. A process has been put in place given that Minister Dutton has now shifted to defence. Will de access to departmental emails for his former ministerial office be available for you? So um, we look for the records in the department and if we need to look further, we'll discuss that um, if there's a gap in the records. Have you made any requests to ensure that there's no destruction of relevant evidence in light of the change in ministers? Uh, no, um, we, we are able to Because go back your evidence. material is the departmental material. That's correct. I have some questions about um, Leppington Triangle, which um, won't touch the sides of the questions that you just heard. Um, so the, um, that matter famously saw the government pay $30 million for land that was worth $3 million. Um, is Mr Boyd here? No. He, he, uh, he would normally be available for these? Um, we have about... 10 people at Mr Boyd's level um, and unless we can take a pretty good guess that yes. one of the things are coming, we don't ask them all to come. So, um. Well, I might ask you, Mr Hare, in, in March, Mr Boyd told the, the Western Sydney Airport inquiry that the ANO had concerns about two officers involved, two officers of the department who are involved in the Leppington Triangle purchase. Um, when the audit office found out that the code of conduct investigations only covered one of those officers, not both of them, I think there was some engagement with the Department of Infrastructure about that. When, when, did, when did that occur? Um, I, I spoke with the Secretary on a number of occasions. Um, around this audit and the, the things that they were doing. Um, Just bear with me. <laughs> yes, of course. Take um, your time. Look, but I, I certainly spoke with the Secretary about it, yes. I think I, the last time you spoke to him was in March uh, this year. And was that about, um, Mr Boyd told us that the um, the Code of Conduct investigations only covered one of the officers involved. Um, I don't have that information with me, but... But I, that's something you have discussed with I, the Secretary? I have discussed that with but the Secretary. But you can't tell me tonight whether that was in March or... No, I can't tell you ...prior to March? No. On notice, would you be able to...? Should be able to do that, yes. Um, what, what, what concerns the ANEO about, uh, 
about the scope of the departmental investigation, the code of conduct investigation? Um, nothing really. The, um, I had a conversation with the secretary about how he was proposing to deal with the issues that we had raised in the audit. He set out the process that he um, was proposing to undertook, undertake. Um, that is really a matter for the secretary to determine and I didn't have any concerns with what, how he was proposing to undertake things. So concerns about two officers, the department's only proceeding with an investigation of one, you've got no concerns about that? I've got no concerns about, the department's undertaking a range of work um, based on, a, on a, a, a strategy of how to deal with the issues. Um, the secretary explained to me why they were doing it in that way. It sounded a reasonable approach to me, but I'm, uh, I don't see it as the role of the ANAO to tell um, agencies how they should or shouldn't undertake investigations and deal with matters within their agency. The, the Secretary of the Department will get asked this question of him, himself, but do you know if both the officers still work for the Department of Infrastructure? No, I don't know. You don't know that? Um, and you wrote to the AFP Commissioner about possible fraud involved in the Leppington Triangle purchase on the 10th of July last year. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the letter was on the 13th of July. On the 13th of July. Thank you. I, I spoke to the Commissioner on the 10th. I rang him and talked about it, talked about the general issue and said that I was going to send him some... So you spoke to him on the 10th and, and yeah, corresponded on the 13th? Because... I was providing information as I can do under our Act and I was explaining to him why I was doing it and the provisions of the Act that I was acting under and then I sent the letter a couple of days later. I think it was a Friday and a Monday or yes. something like yeah, that. Okay. In March, Mr Boyd told the committee that there was follow-up from the AFP on a handful of occasions last year but no contact since before Christmas. Is that still the case? Um, I haven't heard of anything since then. Has, at the time, um, I think you said that the Lappington transaction was the only one that had caused you to contact police in connection with an audit. Does that remain the case? Uh, yes. It's not, I think at the time I also said it's not the only time I've raised issues with, um, with relevant investigatory bodies with respect to matters. So the police aren't the only investigatory body across the Commonwealth. But it's the only time we've raised anything with the AFP. With the AFP. Yep. Um, has the department in informed you of any of the outcomes of any of the reviews it's announced? So we received a draft report of one of the reviews on the 10th of May, um, which was a review by uh, a company, a reviewer by the name of Mark Harrison. It was in draft, um, wasn't provided for comment. It was just a heads up, we're getting close to finalising this. It wasn't seeking anything other than uh, good manners, I believe. And that was 10th of May, I, yeah. th I think you said. It was, it's fair to say that one of the reasons that you ordered the purchase is because the Department of Infrastructure's Audit and Risk Committee simply noted the ANAO's closing letter. Um, it's, it's fair to say one of them was that. It started from um, when we identified that the valuation had written it down from 30 million to 3 million, roughly speaking, and then we asked questions and we didn't feel that we were getting satisfactory answers to the mm. questions. We asked for a review. We saw the process, internal processes, one of which was how the audit committee dealt with it, the other was the nature of the review it was undertaken and um, through that, that sort of process I decided to, that an audit was desirable. Did, did it surprise you that the Audit and Risk Committee took no action in response to your concerns about the purchase? Um, yes. Have they, has the Audit and Risk Committee sought any um, advice from you or the office about how it could better perform its functions? Um, 
I'm, I don't, I'm not aware. I, I'm not aware of anything. But we um, engage with audit committees pretty regularly. Like we attend audit committee meetings. I, staff from our office and I don't know whether they've had conversations in the audit committee about those matters. Mr Nucky was chair of the audit committee when it took no action in um, August 2019. Are you surprised that he's been reappointed as chair? Um, he's a well-established member of audit committees within the Commonwealth. Um, well, he's well-established, but the audit committee uh, when, when he was the chair, took no action after a red flag from the ANAO that that um, I think that identified it as a significant and unu an, an unusual transaction. It requires a a real disengagement or lack of a sense of urgency to wave that through, doesn't it? Can I just get one piece of information? Before yes, of course. Um, in retrospect, um, one of the things that there's a couple of occasions in the last 12 months where within our, um, our uh, closing letter to agencies we've raised issues but haven't included them in the formal findings list. So our formal findings tend to go to matters directly related to the financial statements and the likelihood of material misstatement and other um, observations, views or recommendations tend to have been in a separate, we've put them in a separate place and a one response back to us I think we've had from the department uh, was that they didn't, th they picked up all of the recommendations that were coming out but didn't see that as one of those and I think one of the lessons that we've taken from that is we have to be very clear that everything that we're recommending we see as a formal recommendation, not just those that are allocated within the, the list of financial recommendations. Now, um, I still would have expected them to pick that up as, as part of the, the key issues that we found because we thought it was a significant yeah. issue. But I'm, I'm, I'm also saying that I think we, we've learnt from that that we have to be much clearer about um, how we're listing things in our reports to make sure that uh, they don't get missed. Because your role, <coughs> there's a, I'm not sure I'm putting this correctly, but there's a, there's a formal role to do investigations and to make findings and recommendations, mm -hmm. but presumably there is a softer role, an educative and engagement role, but that does rely upon the agency or department that's the subject of the investigation yep. looking lively when issues like that, that are raised with them, doesn't it? That's right. And, and, I've, and generally that's what we find with entities. We probably generally don't find people purchasing $3 million properties for $30 million, that is... Well, I don't think anywhere in the report we've said it's $3 million property, that that was the price they should have paid. That's the valuation that That's the valuation, through. yes. Um, the price that they would have paid would have, um, may have been significantly more yes. than that, but we didn't see a process. But the gap between three and $30 million is impossible to rationalise. You would like to see a rationalisation yeah. for yeah. it. And I think that's the key point in the audit report is... Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have some questions <coughs> about um, Canstruct International uh, and this um, the, the procurement. I think it's ordered the general report number 37, 2019-20, in relation to the procurement of garrison support and welfare services, and I'm particularly interested in the Nauru contract. So you will of course seen reports in um, media outlets this morning that Canstruct International, a major donor to the Liberal National Party, uh, a lot of interest in how it is that it came to be awarded this $1.4 billion contract. Um, I just want to make sure I've got some of the key facts 
right here. In mid-2017, the department decided to conduct a limited tender process in relation to the Nauru contract, the, the Nauru contract and approach Canstruct International directly. Do, do I have that right? Um, again, Senator, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware that this was an audit that was going to be discussed today, and I, I'm sorry, I haven't caught the news that you're referring to either. Um, I, I was aware that there were issues around it, but I, I wasn't aware that it was So take your time if you need to review material um, in front of you. They, uh, they sole sourced the contract, was that? Yes. So in a, a limited tender was the way it was yeah. described to me. So in the audit report at paragraph 1.14, um, we note that on the 31st of July 2017, the department obtained approval from the minister pro to procure garrison support and welfare services for both Nauru and Manus Island. Um, and subsequently entered into four contracts that are listed in the, the table below. So they got approvement, they, they, they got approval from the minister in mid-2017? Correct, and then the table below demonstrates that there was a contract period with Canstruct uh, of 28 September 2017 to 30 June 2020. And there, you, were, and there were three other contracts. Can you tell me, I, I have some other questions in deeper detail, but just a very simple question. What, why did Canstruct International get this massive contract? Um, at the time, the contract value was uh, 1.1 billion. I'm not sure that the audit answers the question. We go into the processes of the engagement. There were four contracts at the time, uh, JDA, Walkman, NKW Holdings and Paladin were the other three for the variety of services to be offered in the, the two locations. So I think at paragraph 226 of your report, um, you indicate that the department had commenced preparations for an open tender process in January 2017. How advanced were those preparations before the department decided not to proceed? There's another paragraph in the audit that explains that, uh, Senator, in 1.12, um, that the department between November 2016 and March 2017 had commenced negotiations with the PNG government. Um, That's... Oh, so you're talking Nauru? But, yes. But they had, they had actually started a process um, which fell, if you like, fell over because of uh, events in Papua New Guinea. I'm not sure that we... So, so they began an open tender process in January 2017. Mm. On, on what date did the department decide not to proceed? Um, it's in relation take, to Nauru? We'd have to take that on oh, no. notice. I don't think we've got that in front of us. Well, if you, if you, if you need to take that on notice, it, are you able to tell me who made the decision not to proceed? We'd have to take that on notice. You can tell, was it was it within the department or was it in the minister's office? Um, so the report does set out um, events within the department, and then the later event mentioned earlier about seeking the minister's approval uh, to proceed without. Um, without the tender process? Yes, well, that, that's the decision. The minister deciding to proceed with a limited tender is a slightly separate point, isn't it? What, 
who made the decision not to proceed with the open tender process that had begun in I January think we'd have to go year. back into the evidence behind the report um, and, and take that on notice, Senator. And how was that decision and the reasons for that decision documented? I think um, I'm looking at a report I haven't looked at for, for a long time. A long time. Mm. I think we go into that further down in 230 and 231, talking about the process um, that went through. Um, on 231, it talks about a minute to the Deputy Commissioner seeking agreement to a limited tender by way of RFQ to Canstruct. So that that would be the decision point. According to that <coughs> paragraph, I think 226 again, the open tender process didn't proceed due to concerns that it could prejudice discussions then underway with Nauru. What, what discussions were underway according to the documentation provided to the ANAO? Um, I'm sorry, Senator, I, I can't recall that again. We went through this evidence. Um, I went through this evidence some um, a long time ago. I'd, I'd have to take it on notice. Um, it's probably something to ask the department, really. Yes, the, um, I'm certain that the department's going to get asked these questions, but is, as is... Um, it's not the first time that uh, the Auditor General has been asked about the basis upon which yeah. Yeah. you've made findings about about these questions. Um, do you, are you able to say what the basis for the department's concern that conducting an open tender process would prejudice discussions with Nauru? Were you provided I, I, I can't material? I can't recall the information precisely. So um, as I said, I. I'll take so you'll take that. that on notice. Yeah. What material the department provided to the ANAO to substantiate those concerns? Um, I'm trying to understand: is was there material provided to you that substantiated that, or did the department simply assert that? That it looks like an assertion to me. Um, the wording of it says that the department stated that this process did not proceed. So that sound, that, that's the language you usually use when we're saying that's an assertion. That's what we've been told. That's what we've been told rather than having an evidence base for it. So. And is that unusual? Um, the, so this is a contract in another jurisdiction. Would you take on face value for a domestic contract an assertion like that, you would normally re require some <coughs> evidence or substantiation of an assertion that had I, such I, a material I, impact on the decision-making process. Only if there is such evidence. And if there isn't any evidence, what you'll find is a sentence like that sitting in the report saying that yeah. this is what they told us. So um, yes. uh, we normally don't, we normally use that language and don't go on and say, and there wasn't any other documents which would support it. It's, it's sort of the, the, the language that we use usually in that context. But again, um, I'd have to test that. I'm saying that that's, what it, that's how we would normally write that sentence. If it was written like that, it's usually an assertion. But I'd have to go back and check whether that's correct. Yeah, thank you. So if you could check that, that yeah. would be... Um very helpful. I think that you ultimately concluded that the department had satisfied the Commonwealth procurement rules which allow an agency to conduct a limited tender process uh, in circumstances where an approach to market uh, doesn't result in a submission that represents value for money. That's right, isn't it? With respect to Nauru, yes. Because it wouldn't be possible to, to conclude that it represented value for money. Um, the, the procurement rules and guidelines are there to set up a framework for 
achieving value for money. Mm. Um, a, um, a starting premise is if you follow all of the rules, then you're on the path to achieving value for money. Um, yes. Then we look to then we would look to see how sort of well those rules were followed, whether it's sort of in uh, fulsomely or, or not. So, um, and in this case, we we've we concluded that value for money was achieved for the Nauru procurement because they followed the rules and. and and undertook other actions, I think. That's in the conclusion to Chapter 2. Yes, the open tender process that the Department did conduct was the subject of an earlier audit, I think, wasn't it? ANEO Report 16 or 2016, 17? That's right, isn't it? I think that was limited as well. Yeah. But I'm, again... It's a long time ago. It's a long, that's six years ago, five years ago. Yes. Um, and that was that audit covered both. Well, there was, that audit covered, or well, two audits covered the the two contracts as well. Yes, that's right. Nara and Manus <coughs> Island. Yeah, uh, you're right. Limited tender process. It did conclude that that had been seriously deficient in numerous respects and actually inconsistent with the Commonwealth procurement rules. That's correct. In my recollection. <coughs> Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm so, in, in, in fact, we can reconcile these two, um, my, my proposition and your proposition. I think the department described it as an open tender process, but the audit office reached the conclusion that it wasn't, in fact, an open tender process at all. Turns out we're both right, Mr. Heffy. OK. How, how do you reconcile that view that what the department described as an open tender process in 2016 was inconsistent with the Commonwealth procurement rules on one hand, with the conclusion in the more recent report that at least the paragraph 10.3a1 of the Commonwealth procurement rules were satisfied because no submissions to the 2016 open, so-called open tender process represented value for money. How do you reconcile those two conclusions in successive reports? I'm sorry, I don't quite follow the question. Well, your, your report in 2016 concluded that the process that the department described as an open tender was in fact a limited tender and identified some inconsistencies <coughs> with the Commonwealth procurement rules. How then did you reach a conclusion that the more recent um, limited tender satisfied the Commonwealth procurement rules? You can undertake a limited tender under the procurement rules and um, if in undertaking that process the department follows all of the rules then they're consistent with it. Um, it was a separate procurement process. See, in, in the report number 16, the Audit Office says that the Department's 2016 open tender process wasn't really an open tender process at all. You might be in a position, um, Mr... Um, I have forgotten your um. surname. You probably have a... <laughs> take your time. <laughs> the, you may have said it. Take um, your time. So, uh, Tommy Wainu, Group Executive Director, Performance Order Group. Um, <coughs> one of the issues I think we have is that um, um, different teams did the, did the three audits uh, in this space. Um, um, the, the earlier audit that you describe... Mm. I'm sorry, I'm dredging memory now. Um, um, there, 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 they, there, there was a, um, f uh, 
strictly from memory, um, and, and we'd, we'd have to check this, I think. The, the department set out to conduct a competitive tender in the, in the first audit, um, and through a, through a variety of processes, again from recollection, ended <coughs> up in a limited tender situation. Um, now I'm just trying to catch the thread of your well, earlier question. You, yes. you used, as you've just said, <coughs> the report, the 2016, the report on the 2016-17. Sorry, I'll start that again. The, the report number 16 in 2016-17. The ANEO says that the department's 2016 open tender process wasn't really an open tender process at all, but in effect. A limited tender, because through this, um, again, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm dredging the depths of my memory now. The, again, through a series of processes, the. What what, what was described as one what thing was described as an open yep. tender ended up being a limited tender, and and I'd, I'd really have to go back into and the and and that too. was without going back through it in any detail, mm. and you'll correct th this in the uh, l later if it's wrong, but mm. that was um, the basis of the criticism. Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, the basis of the cri criticism was that how could you set out to do one thing mm. uh, and then and end, end with up another. with a different animal, yes. Uh, but then in the more recent report, number 37 in 2019-20, the the Auditor General report says that awarding the contract to Canstruct International under a limited tender process satisfied paragraph 10.3a Roman numeral 1 of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules because the department had <coughs> conducted an open tender process in 2016. How, how can those, uh, except different teams doing the report, but how can those two conclusions be reconciled? I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't think I can offer an opinion there because I wasn't directly involved in the second audit. Mr so. Hare, where are you quoting from again? Sorry. Uh, I'm sure somebody will provide me with the page number, but in the report, that the basis for uh, reaching the conclusion that the limited tender process satisfied paragraph 10.3a.1 was because the department, it was one of the reasons that the ANEO was satisfied was because the department had conducted an open tender process in 2016. Take me a moment to find that page. So yes, I'm, me too. I think in two, in the section, um, did the department demonstrate achievement of value for money in Nauru, which we're going to the the value for money. Um, we're looking at a, a limited tender, um, and what we looked at was um, in that context, what did they do to the department do to assure themselves that they were getting value for money. And the, t and the report sets out in 247 and 246 and 247 that the things that we looked at were um, whether they did any benchmarking and whether they negotiated. Um, because if you go to a limited tender and just take the, the first offer that someone gives you, then it's hard to say that that's a, a value for money um, procurement. And, I think we've done a number of audits where we've concluded that. Um, in this case, we looked at whether they'd done any benchmarking um, of the costs and whether they negotiated on the basis of that, um, of, the, of the work that they'd done on benchmarking and, and negotiations. We um, said that they'd done enough to demonstrate that they were getting value for money in a limited 
tender procurement, which is also always a lower bar than if you're in a fully um, competitive process. But the in this particular procurement, the department used the flexibilities under the procurement guidelines to undertake a limited procurement, in this case a sole source. Yes, but it's a bit circular, isn't it? The, 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 in order to satisfy that benchmarking requirement, there needed to be an, a, an open tender process um, that preceded, that preceded yeah. this limited so, tender. Senator, uh, uh, again, um, some of this is drip, drifting up from deep memory. There was a, in the first audit, I'm sure that we, and again, we'd have to check, and obviously we'll have to take this on notice so that we can help you navigate yeah. through, through this. From memory, there was a pause. In, in the first audit that we did, we reported on a pause um, in the course of the audit, and we reported on that towards the end of the, towards the, end of the audit. And I think that they must have um, they must have opened up the process again following the pause, and then in some way relied on the on the previous open tendering process. But we, we'll just but, I think we'll, th th this is the point, isn't it? Yes. The, yeah. the, uh, as you say, at two forty six and two forty seven and two forty eight on page thirty seven of this report, it, it does. It does approach those issues. Mm. It says, you know, entities may undertake to increase the likelihood of achieving value for money in such situations by <coughs> benchmarking costs for similar services mm. procured previously. Mm. That is a preceding open tender process. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. And negotiating strongly for discounted pricing or additional I, services rather than accepting initial quotes provided. So no, the point is, there wasn't an initial open tender process. Okay, you, you've I, identified that it wasn't, in fact. I, I think. Can I just try yes, and distill your question and then maybe take it on notice? Mm. I think the essence of your question is that in looking at the benchmarking they undertook, the benchmarking that the department did was based against the cost structure that they were facing from the existing provider. And your question is, how can we say that that's appropriate benchmarking if there wasn't a competitive process for the yes. original current provider? Yes, so that's the essence. That's of right, and in order to satisfy the, yeah. the CPR rules, particularly the one that I keep drawing your attention, that's a prerequisite, isn't it? I mean, how else would you how would, how else would you achieve that objective of value for money? Mm. Um, Value for money is... There has to be some benchmarking exercise. There has to be previous. some process to for what we look for in auditing of um, procurement processes is that there is something in the procurement process which allows you to identify that the, how the department has assured itself that they've got value for money. Because um, there isn't a single answer of value for money outside of a competitive process. And um, the essence of your question is how can we conclude that it was value for money based upon benchmarking against the existing but contract if the existing contract didn't have a, a basis to determine it was value for money? I'll take that on notice and come back to you with an answer to it. Yes. Um, um, yeah, it was... Yeah, that's, um, that's the best I can do it this particular point in time, I think. Uh, understanding that the what we're looking at in this procurement is what they did in this procurement to uh, to demonstrate value for money, um, which to some extent you can isolate from what they did in the previous procurement. Because all they all we can expect them to do... Yeah, and you'd is, reached a conclusion about the previous procurement that was... Yeah, but in, in the context of this procurement, all we can expect them to do is use to the best of their ability, if, they're, if they've decided to go down, under, as they could under the, the procurement rules, mm. a single source procurement, the best that we can expect them to do is use what um, tools are available and information which is available to them to get the best possible price. So one error compounds another? Well, it doesn't necessarily compound another, but it might be the only information base that you've got. Now, well, I'm not trying to answer the question yes. 
at the moment. I'll, I'll take it on notice, but it's it's um, I think it's a, a very a very difficult situation for us to be in as auditors when a department makes a decision to go to a sole source tender. Um, if the only information they have is flawed information, mm -hmm. then, um, but they utilise it to the best of their ability, can you then, is that, um, is that something that, uh, I suppose the, the issue for us is how do we point that out and um, are we, do we say it's not, it's definitely not value for money because they've done the best that they can in the situation? Well, you're talking to a brick wall with these guys. I mean, they have they have um, been. There's been a sharp criticism I was from the talking in the abstract then, rather than with this. Yeah, I'm talking in the particular. Case. Obviously, the yeah. to, you know 2016, 17 sharp criticism mm. um, of the, of the process for a very you know very substantial contracts. Yes. Um, a particular responsibility for Australia, given we're operating in an overseas jurisdiction, uh, and they've just done it again. Um, you know, it's not surprising that it's a subject of public controversy when that happens for a big donor, big Liberal Party donor, um, and it happens, and, and then subsequently, two years later, it happens again. It, the the critique from the Auditor General is, falls on deaf ears, doesn't it? Has there been any change in their processes because of the reports that you've written? Um, I think we identified some significant changes in their contract management and procurement processes after the first audits, particularly with respect to contract management is my recollection. During your most recent audit, <coughs> did, did the department tell you that the government of Nauru had objected to the department pursuing a sole tender arrangement in the strongest possible terms? I can't recall that. I'd have, you can I tell us on notice whether whether the department provided you with that information. Um, I was provided with a um, email from um, Barina Walker, who's a senior Nauruan official, and Ms. Newton, a senior Home Affairs official. Um, I'll. I'll I'll table this if it assists, but um, Mr Walker, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, says I'd like to formally record the Republic of Nauru's objection to the information you provided me last Friday, specifically that DIBP will be pursuing a sole tender arrangement with Canstruck to take over the garrison service production. I also wish to record that we're not consulted on this plan and that any oversight to the decision was removed with the sudden and surprising decision <coughs> to disband the Procurement Steering Committee, which was done with no notice when garrison services still needed to be procured. The government has concerns about being able to work with Canstruct in a, in a constructive way in the future, and it goes on. Might be helpful, perhaps, if I table that. Um, and if you could, um, if you could tell, tell us on notice whether that uh, email was provided to you in, in your work. Um, it's the kind of email that's material for your investigation though, isn't it? You'd expect to be provided with something like that, relevant to the, um, relevant to the decision? I'd be surprised if um, we didn't have access to something like that. I can't recall it in the context of this audit. Um, if you discovered during your audit that the limited tender approach to Canstruct had threatened the Australian government's relationship with the Republic of Nauru, with the government of Nauru, I should say, would would that, or could that have altered any of your findings or conclusions? Um, we were auditing the department's operations, so I'm on the face of it, not necessarily. It depends on the the reason for the concern. Was, was the team, I, I, I suspect, was the team that conducted the audit aware that 
Canstructor can participated in the open tender process for the Nauru contract in 2016 and had made a submission that, according to the department at the time, didn't represent value for money? Um, I, th I think so, yeah. You, you were aware that that was the case? Well, I think that's in the audit report. And when the department's technical evaluation team reviewed Canstruct's submission, it determined that Canstruct hadn't demonstrated sufficient technical understanding to be able to provide the required service? Um, again, um, it's, it's many audits ago, Senator, I can't recall that. Well, can, can you tell me whether you considered those factors, perhaps on notice, relevant to your audit of the Canstruct procurement process? Thank yep. you. Slightly. Did you consider whether the statement of requirements and the commercial terms offered to construct as part of the limited tender process in 2017 were the same or substantially the same as the terms offered to the market in the open tender process the department had conducted in 2016? So uh, you'll take that on notice, but if you discovered that that the terms that the terms that the department had offered Canstruct were much more favourable than it offered to the market in 2016, would that have altered your findings or conclusions? I, I'm I'm not really willing to speculate on that until I look at the information. Well, could you on notice tell me whether, whether comparing the commercial terms and conditions offered to Canstruct as part of the limited tender with the conditions offered to the market in 2016 would have altered, was, was, was material that was provided to yep. the audit office? Um, you note that Serco had withdrawn from the open tender process in 2016 do, do, do you know what the terms and conditions that Serco and the department disagreed about? What was the basis of that withdrawal? Uh, no. You don't know. So you, so, you, so you can't tell me if those, <coughs> um, if those terms were in the contract that was offered to and ultimately agreed with Construct International? On notice, if you can provide any more information about that, you'll be able to. Yes. Um, so Serco had made a submission to the so-called open tender process, which according to the department did represent value for money. That's, that's why they were the reserve tenderer. That's correct, isn't it? Serco indicated it would be interested. It was in a, one of the footnotes. That, that, but that's why they're the reserve tenderer. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you compare Canstruct's submission to the 2016 open tender process to Canstruct's submission to the limited tender process? I'm sorry, Senator. I you, if you're I going to take these on notice. I hadn't I known that you're, this was going to be a, a significant topic of your questioning. I would have had the order to hear. Would have. I'm, I'm, I apologise for that. Well, it's it's um, a matter of some controversy and public reporting today. Canstruct International was awarded the contract now worth one point four billion dollars. Table two point seventy of your report. It says that the value of the Nauru contract was 4.3 times more than the amount of revenue Canstruct International generated in 2016. There was a KPMG report that did a financial strength assessment. Um, the financial statement that Canstruct International filed with ASIC that year said, um, 
said that effectively Canstruct International was a shelf company and not, as KPMG suggested, a company generating tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Did you take any steps to look beyond the KPMG assessment? Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think we would have done that. So the KPMG assessment was essentially what was relied upon by the department. By the department. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of. Relied upon by the audit office to make an assessment for the, as the basis for the department reaching that conclusion? Was that a reasonable conclusion for the department to reach? Um, your question, I think, goes to whether um, the department's due diligence on the capability of Canstruct was appropriate. Um, and our unless there's a good reason, otherwise our normal process would be to rely on the work that was undertaken by the department. Um, circumstances where we don't do that is if we think the work that the department has done isn't um, sufficient to rely on. But I... So if at the time that you conducted the audit, you'd known that the entity awarded this contract via a limited tender process was essentially a shelf company, would that have altered your findings or conclusions? Well, it depends what the nature of the shelf company was, really. Um, I don't, I'm, do you, what, what do you mean by a, a shelf company? Is, was it a, a subsidiary of another company set up for this purpose? Is that? Is well, that I might, um, I might provide uh, to you in the, in the in a question on notice, perhaps the um, uh, the ASIC search uh, on this, but yes, the the in essence, um, I'd assert that it was a shelf company with no record of. And we had one company, I think, famously that was a based in a caravan somewhere. This this company essentially a shelf company, that's not a normal arrangement? Um, I'm, I'm not certain. Um, you'd have to look at the circumstances around it. I, I'm assuming by a shelf company, and that, I don't know precisely what that term means, but I assume it's a, a company which has been set up for a purpose. Mm. And the purpose was to run this for this contract. It depend on what's standing behind the company, and so I'm, and now I'm speculating. And I really don't want to. Okay, well, I might that. go to some slightly higher level questions, and you'll come back to us on notice about some of the questions that we've asked. Did, you didn't actually consider, did you, whether that whether the government and the taxpayer actually got value for money by giving this contract to Canstruct? It was really an assessment, wasn't it? whether the department was satisfied that it got value for money. That's, that's a fair characterisation, isn't it? Um, I'm not asking you to... Uh, I'm asking you what, wh whether you considered whether the government and the taxpayer actually got value for money by giving the contract to Canstruck. That's not... What your, what your report's considered, is it? it? It considers whether or not, a much narrower question, whether the department was satisfied that it got value for money. Is that right? I think our report's a little bit stronger than saying that um, the department thought it was value, that it achieved value for money with respect to um, the Nauru contract. I think we went a bit further to say that the evidence they presented to it supported that proposition. Would that be fair? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that we simply said that that's what they asserted to us. We thought there was an evidence base underpinning that with respect to what they did. Did you consider whether the decision to award the contract was ethical? I, if we had of, um, identified ethical concerns with respect to the process, we would have put them in the report. Do, uh, 
You didn't consider, I think, any of the seven extensions or variations that have been made to the contract since it was awarded to Canstruct in 2017. <coughs> um, I'm not certain that was within the terms of reference for the audit, which... And certainly extensions and variations after you'd reached the, the end of the reporting process, you wouldn't have considered. No, no. You haven't been invited to consider any of those? No. So it was, in terms of the position that this contract's in today, the scope of the audit was limited to a consideration. The procurement and contract management, yes. so reporting and monitoring of performance is what the audit looked at. It's a more of a high level compliance focused audit. And then we looked at the, the extent to which we uh, the department had implemented recommendations from the previous audits and from the JCPAA inquiry into it. That was chapter four of the report. So I, I ask this because the, because the company is getting even more money now, the result of the variations, even more money than it was first awarded the contract. Um, and that's despite the government of Nauru assuming, wel assuming welfare responsibilities in mid-2019. So number of people who the services are being delivered to has fallen, delivering, f fallen by about 80%. The services that are being delivered are smaller. Fewer services for fewer people for more money. Can you offer any justification about why that's the case? I think if in, um Chapter four of the audit, uh, chapter three of the audit, we go into the uh, contract management, uh, performance and reporting, and um, that's quite critical of the processes put in place around uh, around the performance monitoring and. Um, of the of the contracts. Can you, but can you tell the committee whether that go, that report goes whether that section of the report goes to the extensions or variations to the contract, or it just goes to the operations of the, the management of the operations of the contract? Um, it's management of the operations. It's management operations. The it doesn't go to extensions. No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hare. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres. No other questions from committee members? We weren't expecting any other senators to come along? I don't think. I'm, I'm not going to give anyone too many options to, uh, to, to jump up at that um, this evening. If no one else is seeking the call, I will uh, dismiss the ANAO with our thanks for your testimony. And that concludes the committee's examination of agencies for today. The committee will resume tomorrow to examine the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. I'd like to thank the ministers and officers who have given evidence to the committee today, and I'd also like to thank Hans Arden Broadcasting for their assistance. I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee adjourned.